Hello friends. This is Revenger What If. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto had the descent of Malgus, the legacy of Viradun? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. It was raining, as Uchiha Sasuke looked down at his defeated opponent, smirking at his victory over the dead last at the academy, and told himself it was inevitable given his elite status. Sasuke had fought Uzumaki Naruto here at the Valley of the End, each giving it everything they had until their signature moves taught by their respected senseis had clashed violently with the Uchiha coming out victorious in the end, but only due to the fact his blonde foe held back at the end to make a statement, and prove the Sharingan user wrong in scratching his headband himself. Something Sasuke noticed when it fell off seconds later next to Naruto and the blonde regaining consciousness to see the smirk on the Uchiha fade to a scowl. So the dead last is awake. That's a problem. I was hoping you would die at the hands of my Chidori to give me the next level of the Sharingan. Now I have to correct this in yet another manner, said Sasuke going through hand signs while smirking down at the still disoriented blonde. Sasuke said naruto confused while coughing up blood you should have just stayed down loser now burn and give me power my best friend said sasuke before attacking naruto with a fire jutsu and heard the blonde scream out in pain at being burned alive seeing naruto cry out in pain was music to sasuke ears as he began walking away with a grin knowing his ability to match itachi's eyes now with his own was now assured but as the uchiha took another step towards sound to learn from orochimaru a sense of dread had washed over him, and turned to see Naruto stand no floating slightly with his arms crossed while glaring angrily at him. Sasuke could only look in fascinated horror at the near-invisible ripples of energy that was not chakra seemed to converge on Naruto's body while folding into a ball-like shape while the once blonde now bald boy was still on fire. Sasuke. You and I. We are not best friends. We. Are. Forever. Enemies. Said Naruto as he blocked out the pain from the fire jutsu, called upon all his pain, all his anger, and hatred of all things that made his life miserable into this attack he knew was about to be unleashed if only on an instinctual level. What is that power? That's not like the crimson chakra he used before in our fight. I have to get away, thought Sasuke, as he turned to flee, but when the Uchiha tried, Naruto let out a roar, and unleashed his attack of energy with the fire that was burning his body. Uchiha Sasuke was easily consumed in the strange attack that added his fire jutsu to its strength, with the power sending him through several trees upon impact while looking like the Kyubi had just eaten, partially digested, and then puked out from indigestion. As for Naruto, he had fallen onto the ground front first with the water slowly consuming his body, and without some timely rescue would drown. From the shadows of the area around the two boys, a mysterious figure watched with keen interest, and decided now would be the best time to interfere in this affair. The man raised his hand slightly, targeting the former blonde, as he commanded the boy to rise from the water, and like magic, he did. Motioning Naruto's floating form to come to him, the figure watched the boy's body float steadily towards his direction, and soon held the child in his arm. The force runs strong with you young one. Especially the dark side. You will make a great addition to the empire. Assuming the emperor wills it so, said the figure before leaving for his ship with his prize in hand while letting the other child die or be rescued by someone that cared. With the two now gone, Hitaki Kakashi arrived with his summoning dog Pakun, and saw the damage done to the area. Kakashi quickly picked up Sasuke or rather what had once been recognized as Uchiha Sasuke with only Pakun being able to determine that with the boy's scent. Kakashi, something happened here. Something dark, cruel, and very powerful was released said Pakun making the Junin freeze for a second while looking for Naruto. Kayubi, said Kakashi seeing the dog shake his head. No his chakra was used, but not nearly enough to break out of his seal. No there is a smell of fire, burned flesh, and that dark energy with the center of it coming from over there where the other brat's scent was. I think. That Naruto brat was set on fire, said Pakun seeing Kakashi's eye widen in shock before looking at the nearly dead body in his hands. But, dot how is Sasuke so badly injured? He looks like someone used a fire jutsu on him, said Kakashi seeing Pakun shake his head. I don't know, 
But the boy is gone and it's raining so tracking him is impossible at this point. We need to get the Uchiha back now and worry about the Uzumaki kid later, said Pakun while seeing something shiny and green floating nearby before giving it to Kakashi. Naruto. Are you dead? Dying? Or have you survived to become something else? Thought Kakashi, as he quickly pocketed the jewel, and rushed towards Konoha while reflecting on his life regarding his blonde student. With Naruto, Naruto awoke, feeling the echoes of physical pain running through his entire body, even though his body was numb, and tried to will it to sit up. He partially succeeded for a brief second, but collapsed within the second it had risen, and cursed his seemingly crippled state. He hated himself right now. Where was he anyway? Looking around, Naruto saw the area he was in was a room, made entirely out of metal, and was on a bed of some kind with a strange metallic thing over on the side doing something before turning to face him. It looked at him with an almost curious fascination, as it clearly didn't expect Naruto to wake up, and move towards the bed while the Uzumaki in it tensed with what muscles would respond. You need to calm down and rest sir. Your body is still under a lot of stress from your injuries, said the metallic creature, as it pressed some buttons near the boy's bed, and increased the sedative to bring about sleep for Naruto once more. Damn, why isn't the fox healing me? Why do I feel so weak? Thought Naruto, as sleep claimed him once more, and tried to fight it. Only to lose seconds later. Elsewhere moments later, he awoke, said the figure turning to face the medical droid in front of him. Yes master. It was surprising to see him awaken. I had to increase the sedative drip to ensure he continued sleeping until we reached our destination, said the medical droid to its master. Such an act could only be done by using the force to fight off the effects of the sedative, which is indeed impressive even on an instinctual level, and combined with his willpower no less, thought the man thinking of how to approach this. Is there anything else you require master? said the medical droid knowing it could not leave unless commanded to by its master. No, return to your duties, monitor the boy more carefully. Should he should the signs of awakening again, I want to be informed beforehand, and not afterwards. Understand, said the man seeing the medical droid nod its head. I understand master, said the medical droid before leaving to carry on its duties. I must get to Droman cause immediately. The Sith Emperor must see this boy's force potential for himself, thought the man, as he headed to the navigational computer to find out the estimated time the ship would arrive at the Sith capital of the entire empire. Back with Naruto time unknown, Naruto awoke yet again, feeling numb with the echoes of his physical injuries at the very front of his mind, remembering the pain Sasuke had done to his body with that damn fire jutsu, and somehow sensing the boy's joy in it. Naruto remembered the anger he felt then for his so-called best friend, who had done everything to kill him while he, the dead last at the academy had shown restraint, and hoped to reach the spoiled prick with his mercy. If there was one thing Naruto didn't do was make the same mistake twice, as he had done with Sasuke after tapping into that power that had severely crippled the Uchiha, and used the fire from the jutsu on him. I hope he's dead or crippled. The Tem deserves it. Wonder how long it will take them to celebrate me being gone and ordering every hunter nin in the leaf to find me with the orders to kill on sight. At least five minutes, ten minutes tops, thought Naruto, as he saw a piece of the room open, which meant it was a door, and saw a figure enter the room. So you awakened again I see. Impressive, most impressive, said the man seeing the now bald boy glaring at him. Where am I, why am I here, said Naruto trying to move but found his body was not responsive, and again cursed the fox for not doing its job. Now that Naruto thought about it, the fox hadn't done anything at all, and by anything he meant everything short of possessing his weakened body. They didn't talk, he didn't feel the fox in him, yet Naruto knew the fox was there, and yet, it felt like the bridge that connected them both together was broken somehow. You have questions, understandable, you will be given answers shortly. We will be arriving at our destination within the hour. If all goes as I have foreseen, you will take a big step into a much larger world, and become something great, said the man before leaving the room. What the hell did he mean by that? Oh no, that damn metal thing is hitting that button again. No, must, fight, sleep, thought Naruto before he lost the battle yet again. Dromund caused some time later, come child. We are expected by the Sith Emperor and I will not be held back by your struggle to walk like a newborn child, 
said the robed figure, as he walked a steady pace to the emperor's throne room, and Naruto struggling to keep up after they landed. After they had docked, Naruto had been allowed some new clothing, and a mirror to look at himself before the boy realized he wasn't recognizable to anyone if those in the village saw him now. His face was pale, the once spiky blonde hair was gone, and tan of his once smooth torso matched his face. Naruto knew that the fox's chakra had saved him in the past from death before like it had with Sasuke, which was why the scarred boy didn't understand the sudden cut off, but knew it might have something to do with the seal, and the damage done to his torso. Right now though, Naruto had to focus on walking on this strange planet, in these strange surroundings with strange things, people, and buildings, and a whole lot of crazy shit that he couldn't even begin to comprehend. I must be having a hallucination or under a genjutsu. There is no way a fraction of this is real, thought Naruto, as he entered the massive temple-like building, and saw the various beings looking at him in wonder. When we enter the throne room, you will stand by the door, do not come forward unless commanded to by the emperor, and if you are given that honor I expect you to kneel with respect to him. Whatever form of pride you may have has no place before him and he will crush you without a second thought should you show any that he finds offensive said the figure while Naruto just nodded despite the fact his apparent, rescuer, didn't see it. Not like I have much of a choice, thought Naruto, as they soon entered the throne room, and felt a chill run down his spine at the strange feeling that went through him the second he was in it. Greetings Darth Blight, to what do I owe this honor of your visit to my throne room? Is it in regards to this diamond in the rough you wished to show me? said the cool smooth voice of the Sith Emperor that Naruto sensed had hidden malice and wrath behind it in the event of this Darth Blight failing him. My Emperor, as you know from my first report, I sensed a disturbance in the force on the planet I was investigating for potential recruits for the Empire, and went down to the planet to find the source of it. The boy behind me is in fact the source of the disturbance and saw his potential first hand in combat, said Darth Blight as he knelt before the Sith Emperor, and saw the amused look on the man's hooded face. Really, tell me of the battle you witnessed, said the Sith Emperor, but didn't look at his Sith Lord kneeling before him, and kept his eyes on the boy that was looking at his surroundings. The child was indeed strong with the force, of that the Sith Emperor could tell, as he was instantly tense when looking in the direction of where several guards were hiding, and had their weapons ready. The Sith Emperor watched, as he studied this boy's body tense, ready to fight, and seeing this child was no stranger to violence. And that is what happened before our arrival my emperor, said Darth Blight kneeling before the ruler of the Sith Empire. You were right to bring him here Darth Blight, his potential is indeed great, come here child, let me get a better look at you, said the Sith Emperor, as he commanded Naruto to come forward, who did so with semi-reluctance, and kneeled with his body shaking slightly on account of his pain being a small distraction and it once more fueled his anger and hatred. Damn Sasuke, damn village for worshipping him because he's the last of a great clan, while I have to dig my hands to the bone just to get a fraction of what they give him, thought Naruto while trying to focus on the emperor, but the pain kept reminding him of his kami damned home, and it was hard to focus when kneeling only aggravated the pain his body was under. You are indeed strong, a weaker child would have crumbled under the pain you're in, he may stay as one of us. Yes, this child will become a Sith among our ranks, said the Sith Emperor sensing Naruto's entire focus now centered on the ruler of the Sith Empire. Thank you, my Emperor, said Naruto, as he didn't know any other way to address the man, and simply followed Blight's way. However, a new life here in the Empire means your old one is dead, and so is your old name given to you at birth. From this day forward a new name will be yours, given to you by my command, and it shall be. Veridun Malgus, said the Sith Emperor right before sending a surge of Sith lightning into the boy, who cried out in pain, and endured it for a full ten minutes before collapsing on the ground. He will bring greatness to the Sith Empire, said Blight before picking up the boy with the Emperor's approval. Yes he will, he will need a legal guardian before he can become a Sith apprentice to help his education along and ensure the child is sent to the Sith Academy, said the Sith Emperor seeing Blight nod. I have just the individual in mind to be the boy's adopted father. He is in the Imperial Science Corps, and has long since desired a son. Such an act of generosity would help further instill loyalty, said Darth Blight seeing the Sith Emperor approve knowing that all the members of the Science Corps were among the best and brightest in the Empire. 
Make it happen, said the Sith Emperor with a smile on his face knowing the boy would indeed become a key instrument in the war with the Republic and the Jedi. He had foreseen it. Five years later orbit over Geonosis. Darth Malgus stood ready on the bridge of his personal Imperial Capital class ship the Endless Shadow while looking down at the planet below. The man formerly known as Uzumaki Naruto had changed greatly since being brought to Droman cause, then being brought into the service of the Sith Empire, and the Sith Emperor responsible for giving him a new name to go with his new life. Since being adopted by the somewhat wealthy man, who became his adopted father, Veridun Malgus had become a rising prodigy in the ways of the Sith ways, and became a commander at the young age of 15 after he graduated from the Sith Academy with high marks. He spent a year and a half learning from tutors, his adopted father, and even the servants on the ways of galaxy from what they saw of it. After killing one of the Twi'lek servants in anger when picking up some of the more negative thoughts in the alien's head, his adopted father knew it was time to send the boy to the Sith Academy where the young Sith apprentice flourished, and had clearly showed it in the fights started there. Not by Veridun of course, at least not at first, but that soon changed when one of the older students tried to intimidate and force the boy kneel in submission. What happened was Veridun using the dark side to send the stupid older student through three walls and one whole floor before the headmaster had to intervene while deciding punishment. The strange thing was, Veridun couldn't be punished because he didn't start the fight, but like a true Sith had finished it, and used the powers of the dark side to easily dominate his seemingly stronger opponent. His father only encouraged him to show more of his strength, as the man knew his adopted son was destined for great things, and wished to nourish it. Scolding his son would only make Veridun hesitant, unsure of himself, and weaken the young Sith to not use his force powers to their fullest potential. When Veridun graduated, he was given the title of Sith Lord, and clearly sensed the Sith Emperor was pleased by the prodigy's rise to greatness. Like an investment that had paid off and was showing potential in the long run. I think you'll be a great warrior, Veridun. A tremendous asset to the Empire. His adopted father had told him that. Praise in his voice. Praise at having such a strong man for a son, even if only by adoption, and nothing else that tied them together. My lord, the shuttle is ready, said the Imperial officer of Captain Rank approaching the Sith Lord. I want the shuttle to take off the moment I'm on board it, said Malgus, as he turned, and left the bridge for the hangar bay. When on the planet's surface, Darth Malgus found himself listening to the Force, as he had heard it speaking to him the moment he arrived, and saw a female Rudian Twi'lek being abused in the slave pens by her cruel master. Using an Force Pike with a modified tip that shocked the receiver of it tip and the user of such a weapon was using it quite well on the woman. No more, please, I've been good, please master, said the blue-skinned Twi'lek as she whimpered, and cried out in pain from more abuse from her assigned master. You dare beg me for mercy. You, a slave that has no right to ask me for anything, said the cruel slave master, as he struck the woman again, and again with his force pike. Malgus watched the event unfold, as the enslaved Twi'lek suffered, old memories of his own past flooding the Sith Lord's mind, and moved quickly without even thinking before killing the slave master with the red blade of his lightsaber. The blue woman looked up at him in shock at seeing her oppressor now slain before her eyes by this dark figure that looked down at her with those yellow eyes were filled with such intense passion in them. Tell me your name, said Malgus commanded. Alina Daru my lord, I am a slave, said Alina submissively to him. I am Veridun Malgus, dark lord of the Sith and you Alina Daru are now my slave until the day you die. Get off the ground of this filthy planet. I won't have my new slave looking like some desperate street whore. Said Malgus seeing Alina struggle to rise off the ground at his command. I understand. Please accept my apologies my master. Said Alina with her head down submissively before he cupped her chin and made the woman him right in the eyes. Since you have just been made mine slave, I will spare you the much deserved pain of your punishment awaiting you this one time. But should you try to test me again with incompetence, I will not be so merciful and the pain of your previous master will be paradise to the pain I will bring upon you should, said Malgus seeing the woman nod slightly despite his hand gripping her chin tightly. I understand my master, I will do everything I can to live up to your expectations, said Alina seeing him narrow his eyes at her. Good, follow me, said Malgus while seeing his strike team wondering what was going on. My lord, what about the other slaves? 
said an imperial trooper seeing Malgus stop and look at them. Hurry and bring them. They are now servants to the empire, said Malgus knowing this place would soon be swarming with the native populace and could cause problems in the future if spotted. Malgus was not about to cause unwanted problems for the Sith Empire and risk the Sith Emperor's unmerciful wrath. Bridge of the Endless Shadow months later. Do you understand your mission? Said Malgus addressing a Sith Knight on another ship assigned to him and had the man's complete loyalty. Yes my lord, we are to arrive at the designated planet you assigned us and then set up a secret base using the cloaking technology acquired last month while keeping the majority planet's populace unaware of our activities, said the Sith Knight seeing the form of Malgus nod in the transmission. Correct, I have given you specific coordinates on exactly where to land on this specific planet you heading that is the perfect area to set up your base of operations. Prepare your base at that location and follow my instructions on how to get the people in that area to cooperate. You will not make any unnecessary moves without my approval and I want the base fully operational long before my arrival whenever I decide to visit, said Malgus seeing the Sith Knight bow his head. I understand my lord, we will begin at once, said the Sith Knight knowing to disobey his master would result in incredible pain. Good, do not fail me, said Malgus before ending the transmission and soon felt a pair of arms wrap around his torso. What are you planning my master? Another decisive plan to kill Jedi for the glory of the Sith Empire. Said Alina in his ear in a playful manner while knowing potential spies of the Sith Emperor would no doubt try to overhear things and need them to believe Malgus wasn't doing anything without the Imperial ruler's blessing. I'm always planning to kill Jedi. We have a mission of great importance to undertake given by the Sith Emperor himself, said Malgus, as he turned to face his slave, and bedmate of a lover to see her face brimming with excitement of joining him in battle. And what is the mission my master? Said Alina eager to please him by joining the Sith Lord in fighting the enemy to show her strength. The fleet is to launch an all-out attack on Alderaan. We are going to bring its people to their knees and into the service of the Sith Empire. Captain, said Malgus seeing his trusted officer step forward and salute him. Yes my lord, said the captain at full attention and prepared to take orders. Inform the rest of the fleet to prepare for hyperspace and head for Alderaan. Full speed all the way, said Malgus seeing the captain salute and followed orders. Such a bold move my master. With Alderaan under the Empire's control, we can take Coruscant afterwards from that key position, and quickly bring an end to the Republic said Alina seeing the Sith Lord smirk at the idea of doing that though he would wait until the actual victory happened. That's what I want Alina. One more step to ultimate victory, said Malgus, as his ship went into hyperspace, and the dark side of the force with him on this mission. They would win this battle for the Empire. He had foreseen it. Veridun Malgus led his troops against Alderaan's forces and in one decisive hard-fought battle had brought the people of the planet to their knees. The Sith Lord was marching his army out of the burning city, knowing there were a few others that would kneel to him the moment they arrived, and fully accept themselves as being a part of the Sith Empire. At the moment, the army traveling with Malgus was currently marching into He Forest region to make their way to the next city, and was confident the people Alderaan now knew their place after seeing one of their precious cities fall. However, the force was known to throw things out of favor of one side for another, and in the next instant was proof of that when Malgus's army was attacked by Republic troops using guerrilla warfare tactics. One of the Republic troopers had shot several intense blasts of energy from his heavy-duty blaster cannon with one of the shots severely burning the Sith Lord's face and causing the man to feel pain. Dodging two Sith Knights, the valiant Republic trooper charged forward, a knife in hand for a close combat weapon, and was soon repelled by Malgus using Sith lightning before the man was sent flying back. Malgus himself had slain a few more troopers that attacked him, as his Sith Knights did too with the one that caused the Sith Lord facial scarring about to be killed after a pair of Sith dragged the armored man to another Sith Knight. The trooper watched vaguely, as Malgus stabbed a downed a fellow Republic trooper, a smirk on the Sith Lord's face, but it left soon after, and began walking away to continue his march forward to the next city. Until the appearance of the female Jedi changed field of battle and not for the better of the Sith. Malgus turned his head to see the Jedi had freed the Republic trooper from the Sith Knights using the Force and activated her double-bladed lightsaber before charging at him while removing several of his men plus droids in the process. Malgus, 
Despite his anger at seeing this Jedi rally Republic forces was actually happy to get a real fight out of this, and engage the female Jedi in battle. When their blades crossed, it was clear to the Sith Lord this wasn't an average ranked Jedi, who knew a few moves, but a well-trained Jedi Master, and knew how to use her weapon with deadly precision. She's good, I'll give her that, when I return to my ship, my database on all female Jedi will help me in pinpointing who I'm facing, and level of skill, thought Malgus knowing to kill a Jedi Master would earn him praise from the Sith Emperor. Leaping away from a tree his opponent forced in their direction, Malgus continued with their duel before using the force to push the Jedi into a tree, only for her to leap away, and the Sith Lord countered by cutting the double-bladed lightsaber into two. He tried to stab the Jedi Master, but surprisingly the woman used her hand with the force to absorb the strike, and saw his blade cracking under pressure while hissing at the struggle the female Jedi Master was giving him. Victory was in Malgus's grasp, but the same Republic trooper, who had scarred his face had charged forward, and the two struggled for a few seconds before the soldier revealed the explosive device in his hand before it exploded. Malgus slowly rose from the ground soon after, ignoring the fact his armor was badly damaged, and so was his body behind it. He used the pain to call upon the dark side of the Force to rise, but the female Jedi was in no mood to grant him a moment of breathing, as she slammed him into wall of solid rock with Force push, and the Sith Lord fought against it. He was aggravating his wounds more, as he fought the intense pressure of the Jedi's power, using his own strength against her, and slowly winning the battle of power between them. However, the battle was soon lost when the Jedi Master hit him with double to power of the original attack, and sent crashing though the solid rock wall that held his imprinted body form. The last thing Malgus could remember of that moment was the simple fact he had been defeated by the Jedi saw the faint image of a blue-skinned woman looking at him with worry. Her voice was sweet to him, as the figure carried his injured body away from the battlefield, and was soon brought to the shuttle awaiting them with his forces preparing for a full retreat from Alderaan with a Republic fleet on the opposite side of the planet. My lord, you are badly injured, and need to be healed immediately, said the woman's voice, which was Alina's, and stroked his scarred cheek with worry. I'm fine, said Malgus, as he slowly rose from the shuttle's floor, anger burning in his heart, and instantly sensed something. A Jedi, my lord. Please wait, said Alina trying to keep him from cause himself further pain. Pilot, fly over there, said Malgus while ignoring the shocked look of his men seeing him move around with severe injuries. But my lord, we're in retreat, and your injuries are ah. Said the pilot before Malgus grabbed him by the throat and the co-pilot had to take control of the ship. Don't defy me pilot, I want you to land there. Do it now said Malgus with the pilot reluctantly obey once the hand on his throat was removed. Once Darth Malgus made his way down the ramp, he looked around, using the force to pinpoint the Jedi in hiding until he found him, and headed in the direction of his prey. When the Sith Lord saw the Jedi of the Zabrok species in meditating position waiting for him, Malgus grinned while activating his lightsaber, and charged the Jedi in his path. Strangely enough, the Zabrok was acting defensively the whole time, retreating with every step, and never bothering to counter with a chance to go on the defensive. A quick flicker of warning from the Force told Malgus his foe was leading him into a trap and leapt away from a second Jedi of Night class like his Zabrok partner. Striking out with the dark side of the Force, the second Jedi had his neck wrapped around it, and with a quick action by the Sith Lord had snapped the Jedi's neck. The Zabrok Jedi saw this and charged him before Malgus used Sith Lightning on him with the Jedi fighting against it. However, the Jedi couldn't win against such a powerful dark side attack, and soon fell to the ground dead from taking such an intense blast of it. With Malgus finally spent, he deactivated his lightsaber, and retreated back to his shuttle to take him to his ship where the medical team would address his injuries. The Endless Shadow Private Quarters of Darth Malgus Malgus was angry. Even with the death of those two Jedi Knights, it had not been enough to satisfy his rage, as he had been healed by the medical team, and the droids to the best of their ability. Though given his injuries, the medics had to give him a respirator system to combat the damage the female Jedi Master had delivered, and cursed the woman for what she did. During his recovery, Malgus scanned his database using the description of the Jedi in his mind to find out she was none other than Satel Shan but what angered him further was the woman was not a Jedi Master like he thought, and still a knight like the others. She was clearly at Master level, 
which wasn't surprising given how the Jedi had listed her as a direct descendant of Bastilla Shan, and even some notations by the Sith database that she may even be descendant of Revan himself. It was difficult to determine such thing with Jedi bloodlines, as the records were kept secret, within the most sacred Jedi temples, and even then such records could only be accessed by a Jedi Grand Master. I nearly had her, if only that damn soldier hadn't interfered. Not that it matters, I may have lost to her, but those other two Jedi I killed still weakened their ranks considerably, and lessened my failure when the Sith Emperor demands an explanation, thought Malgus, as he touched the side of his cheek where the scars were located, and took a deep breath into his respirator breathing mask. Command me my master and I will have the Jedi's head on a plate within three standard days, said Alina, as she appeared beside him, kneeling down, and looking him in the eyes. You are good my servant, but even your skills cannot kill someone like that woman, as she is indeed the descendant of Bastilla Shan, and already at the level of a master, said Malgus while sensing jealously from his Twi'lek slave at mentioning the female Jedi. She is not that special. She had help in defeating you said Alina while turning away from him and made the Sith Lord chuckle at her actions. Do not act this way my dear Alina. This female Jedi does not interest me that way. I would sooner strike the woman down than her on the lips like I do you, said Malgus seeing his servant smile at him with joy knowing he preferred her over the Jedi woman. Thank you Veridun, my master, said Alina, as she ed him now, and felt one of his hand groping her earning him a pleasing moan from the woman's mouth. My lord, the Emperor has, said the Captain, as he came into the room, but paused at seeing the intimate position Malgus, and Alina were in while in his office chair with his face completely red from embarrassment. It didn't help that Alina was in very revealing lingerie at the waistline while lacking any form of coverings over the upper part of her athletic body. You better have a good reason for interrupting my private time Captain or you will find yourself replaced. Said Malgus, as he glared at the fearful Captain and heard the man's mutterings of apologetic gibberish. M my lord the E-Emperor has D demanded you M make contact with him immediately R regarding the failure at Alderaan, said the captain seeing Malgus becoming angrier at his words. Leave me and you will speak nothing of what is seen here with your eyes, said Malgus seeing the captain bow his head and again mumble apologetic gibberish before leaving the room. Do you have to speak to the Emperor now? You could always delay it and spend time with me said Alina into his ear knowing it would make him go wild with lust. As much as I would like to claim your body in my bed, the Emperor cannot be delayed, nor can he be denied my report on the matter, and do either would only bring about more harm to both of us, said Malgus rising from his chair and seeing his slave pout. He has the worst timing, said Alina sitting on the bed while Malgus went to the door leading to the communications room that allowed the Sith Lord and Emperor to speak at great distances. On the contrary, his timing is perfect since it's clear the Emperor's wishes to punish us, and deny the pleasure of the flesh to soothe our aches, said Malgus before leaving the room knowing the woman was still pouting. Activating the communications system, Malgus kneeled on the symbol of the Sith Empire meant to remind all Sith Lords with such systems that they served the Emperor, and to keep their personal ambitions in check. No sooner had he kneeled did the form of the Sith Emperor appear looking down at Malgus with a scowl on his hooded face with a look similar to disappointment. You have failed your mission Darth Malgus. I am not pleased, said the Sith Emperor seeing the man was wearing a respirator breathing system and realized his Sith Lord had been injured more than rumored. I understand my Emperor. I am unhappy with the situation as well, said Malgus sensing the man was still not happy by his words. Are you? You had one initial battle, Alderaan had surrendered after one of their cities had burned with the army under your command, and yet you still lost soon after. Explain to me how you are unhappy with somehow losing after you had already won. Said the Sith Emperor seeing Malgus collect his thoughts on the matter. We were attacked on our march to the nearest city my Emperor. We repelled them at first with ease, but, said Malgus hesitant to reveal how he was defeated. But, said the Sith Emperor wanting him to continue. A Jedi flanked us and turned the tide of the battle, said Malgus sensing the intense rage from the Emperor. A single Jedi. A single Jedi defeated you and your army, said the Sith Emperor while making sure his voice was ice cold and filled with intense malice. It was not just any Jedi my Emperor. It was Satel Shan. She is a descendant of Bastilla Shan and if the rumors are true. Darth Revan, 
said Malgus sensing the anger the Sith Emperor had for his failure wash away instantly and was replaced by surprise. Satel Shan you say, it's bad enough the woman is descended from Bastilla, but if this Jedi, who defeated you has the blood of Revan in her veins, that would explain how she bested you, and your army, said the Sith Emperor while deep in thought. She rallied the Republic troops we were defeating to victory. Only someone of Revan's bloodline could do that, said Malgus with the Sith Emperor nodding in agreement. Yes, I will have this looked into more closely. The fact you survived is quite astounding when you consider your opponent. I also sense there is more, said the Sith Emperor, as he saw Malgus nod, and take a deep breath into his respirator. As my shuttle departed from my ship, I sensed a Jedi Knight nearby, and wished to gain some measure of revenge against them for my defeat, and pursued the Jedi only to find myself facing two of them in a trap they made to lure me to them said Malgus seeing the Sith Emperor had a smirk on his face. The fact you are here means you were victorious against them, said the Sith Emperor seeing the man nod his head. Yes, I killed them both before heading back to my shuttle and had a medical team heal my injuries, said Malgus seeing the Sith Emperor go deep in thought over the matter. Good, two less Jedi threats to concern ourselves about. Better they died at your hands, then live to becoming Jedi Masters, and prove to be a problem for us in the future said the Sith Emperor while sensing Malgus was pleased at his words. My ship is on my way back with the rest of the fleet as we speak my Emperor. When we return, I wish to prepare for an attack that will allow the Empire to achieve total victory over the Republic, and the Jedi in one swift attack, said Malgus knowing he needed to redeem himself for his failure. Total victory you say, interesting, prepare your plan and then come to the throne room so I can assess such an idea. Do not fail me again Darth Malgus, said the Sith Emperor before the transmission ended. It's finally time, it's finally time to dust off my old habits in being unpredictable to come out of me, said Malgus knowing he was going to have to think of something completely unorthodox and unpredictable it would be unequaled in terms of military victory for years to come. Coruscant weeks later, so this is the center of the galaxy. Not bad, I can definitely see an imperial castle here when the Emperor rules this world said Alina cheerfully beside her lover, as they walked towards the Jedi Temple, and to put their plan into action. Indeed, I foresee an emperor will rule here, but whether it's our emperor, or another I cannot see, said Malgus seeing his lover become interested at his words. So the Sith will win. I knew it, said Alina happily knowing he should be happy too. No, there is no win for the Sith. As long as the way of the Sith exists so will the Jedi. It will be a never-ending struggle for both sides. The Force wills us to fight for all eternity. The Emperor does not see it, but I do, and that is why I have constantly called for reform on several key places within the Empire," said Malgus seeing Alina looking surprised at him. Because without the reform, the Empire will collapse, and the Jedi will win in the end. Said Alina seeing Malgus nod. Correct, said Malgus simply. Then why are we doing this? Why fight if we're going to lose in the long run of the war? Said Alina while Malgus just chuckled at her. Because my dear, the Empire gives me a means to fight. I fight because that is what I was made to do and the Empire is the instrument through which I realize my purpose. The Empire is war made manifest. That is why it is perfect. If only to hone my skills and prepare us for a time should we ever leave the Empire, said Malgus while arriving at the Jedi Temple and seeing the guards there with blasters at the ready. So after this is over, we are leaving the Empire, said Alina seeing Malgus not reply this time, but deep down she knew they were, and it wasn't surprising in the least. Even before the Battle of Alderaan, the Sith Empire had started to lose its appeal to Darth Malgus in certain aspects, as he had seen something the others could not, and wished to have reform. Sadly, Malgus was denied with no form of standing within the Sith Empire to make such reforms possible, and had several Sith Lords make attempts on his life. All of them failed of course, with each Sith Lord killed losing whatever was on them to Darth Malgus, including their various lightsabers, their knowledge, and anything of value they might possess. The Sith Emperor couldn't punish Malgus either because it would set a bad precedent to all Sith Lords that they could be attacked at any time and punished just for keeping what was theirs. It would be an internal disaster for the Sith Empire as it would cause everyone to turn on each other, and bring everything down from within. At this point, Malgus had become upset with the Empire, and its Emperor while only doing the missions given to increase his own power with this one being the greatest of them all. 
It was why Malgus had secretly ordered Sith Knights, Sith Troops, and Droids to secretly relocate out of the Empire's known space to a special planet of his choosing. Personally, Malgus was surprised his forces had kept things hidden on the assigned planet for so long given how things were progressing there, and swelling of his forces on the planet with a heavily encrypted messages. Each encrypted message was sent periodically to the Sith Lord explaining the progress of the base, the people, and the potential threat of being discovered by the majority of the populace. The most recent report stated they could stay hidden for a few more standard months before not even the cloaking technology and the people working with them could keep things quiet. Not that the time frame mattered since Malgus was going to be arriving to the planet around that time anyway and no one knew about the planet in question. Not even the Sith Emperor. After learning of the planet's location, Malgus had it removed from the Sith archives, every navigational computer using a well-placed virus that transmitted to all ships to remove that planet from the systems except his own, which already had the vaccine in place to remove the virus from his ships, and of course there was the matter of Darth Blight. By all official accounts, the Sith Lord that discovered him had died on the mission with Malgus in the previous campaign prior to Alderaan, and his body was destroyed after being hit by several explosive mines activated by several Jedi. Unofficially, Darth Blight had died at Darth Malgus's hands when the mines activated under the older Sith Lord's feet when the younger one used the force to make it happen a safe distance away. Jedi had been in the area, which made the lie believable, and Malgus had been very careful in using the Force to make sure no one around him knew it was by his hands that Blight met his end. We will see Alina, leave it at that, said Malgus, as he finally reached the tall massive doors leading into the sacred halls of the Jedi Temple, but stopped when the guards had approached him, and drew their weapons. They were instantly struck down. Using the Force to open on of the doors slightly, Malgus entered with Alina right behind him as she looked around to admire the internal structure of the Jedi Temple, and was no doubt mentally comparing it to the different Sith temples scattered through the Empire. Malgus didn't blame her, she always did like to compare things that were opposite of another and study them in that manner to see just how different they were. As they waked, Malgus sensed the Jedi in the temple were converging on him, no doubt sensing the dark stain that was his presence in their light-filled world with the building, and was soon met by Jedi Master Venzalo. The various Jedi behind Master Zalo had drawn and ignited their lightsabers with each one preparing for a fight the Sith Lord while Alina turned around to cover Malgus's back with her fingers near the two blaster pistols on each side of her hip. Malgus just smiled behind his respirator breathing mask, as he stared at Master Zalo standing there directly in front of him, not looking away, not drawing his lightsaber, and just staring at the Sith Lord without fear. It brought a thrill to Malgus as he had found himself facing what was basically the Jedi equivalent of himself, and a fellow warrior of the battlefield. The other Jedi drew their weapons out of fear, but Zalo didn't, as the man knew when to draw a lightsaber, and when not to jump the gun so soon. It was pity in Malgus's opinion that such a warrior among the Jedi had to die today. You are not welcome here Sith Lord. Surrender and face judgment, said Zalo seeing Malgus let out a chuckle. I can't do that Jedi Master. It's against my nature to surrender. All I really know, is how to fight, and I know that is what you know too. The only difference between us, is our beliefs, and why we fight our battles without hesitation. Without fear, we both wish to die a warrior's death you and I. Fear not Jedi Master and those around us. I will grant you all a most honorable death in battle, said Malgus, as he sensed the time was upon them and sensed Shea Vizsla had already taken out several Republic security troops within the Jedi Temple. Behind Darth Malgus, past the door leading to the outside of the Jedi Temple he had just entered, a Republic shuttle was getting closer, and several Jedi took a step back out of fear. But not Ven Zalo, he knew what the shuttle was about to do, knew it was about to crash into the temple, and he also knew it wouldn't hit the Sith Lord in front of him. Like Malgus, the Jedi Master had foreseen what the shuttle would do before it happened, and knew that showing unwanted fear before the Sith Lord was unwise. After the shuttle crashed through the doors of the Jedi Temple, it easily smashed through several pillars, its wings skidding upon landing across the floor, and somehow managed to straighten itself behind Malgus with the ship stopping a few feet behind him. The ramp to the shuttle opening revealing small army of Sith Knights and troops ready for a fight. Alina had already drawn her pistols, waiting for the signal to open fire, 
and got it when Malgus made a hand motion for his forces to attack the Jedi with all the fury of the dark side of the Force. The hall entrance area of the Jedi Temple was soon echoing with sounds of battle, as the different colored lightsabers clashed with red lightsabers, blaster fire flashed, hit, and missed their intended targets. Malgus was loving every second of it, as he tore through the Jedi, and trooper that came at him while Shea flew above them on her jetpack firing rockets from her wrist at more security force-based troops moving to flank the Sith's own. Even Alina was doing well, as he knew she would, but the Jedi Master Ven Zalo had deflected two of her shots back at her blue-skinned body, and threw the Twi'lek woman into a pillar. The end result sent Malgus into a rage, which didn't go unnoticed by Jedi Master Zalo, as he saw the Sith Lord strike down one Jedi with his lightsaber in one hand, and throw another after snapping his neck with his other before turning to face him. The two clashed violently with their blades, Malgus being the aggressor of the fight, as he pushed Zalo back, who used his agility to dodge the strikes from the Sith Lord, and receive a kick to his stomach. After flying back, the Jedi Master was able to take down two Sith Knights before he had to jump into the air just in time to barely dodge the lightsaber Malgus had used, and was thrown violently back via force push through a downed pillar. Using the force to block out the pain, Master Zalo looked up to see Malgus recalled his thrown lightsaber back to him, and was coming down with the intent to spear the Jedi through the floor. He missed. Then Zalo had jumped gracefully behind Malgus, activated his green lightsaber, and charged the now on the defensive Sith Lord. The Jedi's skills were indeed impressive, as he blocked every move Malgus made before elbowing the Sith Lord in the face after two more blocked strikes, followed by a spinning slash that missed, but made Malgus stumble back just a little, and allowed Zalo to thrust the lightsaber forward for the killing blow against the Sith Lord. He missed. Malgus spun at the last moment towards Zalo and stabbed the surprised Jedi Master in the gut while looking the man in the eyes while he slowly died. Pulling his lightsaber out from the Jedi Master, they both watched before Zalo died of his wound, as the droids march up the Jedi Temple steps, and Sith star fighters fly above in the sky while the city was sacked by the Sith fleet above. The battle was over, the Jedi in the temple were all dead, and the Sith. Dot had finally won. Darth Malgus looked up at the partially destroyed Jedi Temple with the remaining Sith forces with him now that the victory over the Republic and the Jedi had been secured. After all the Jedi had been killed, Malgus had praised his Sith Knights, and troops for a job well done in proving their courage in surviving such a suicidal mission. It showed to the Sith Lord that they were among the most fearless warriors of the entire Empire and that no others could match them in battle. He had gained their loyalty, their trust, and Malgus knew they would choose to serve him over the Emperor if given the chance. After assessing the casualties on their side of the battle, Darth Malgus stood before his slave, and Lovelina slumped against the wall she had been thrown into by Jedi Master Zalo. She had looked up at him, called Malgus by his first name in front of the others, which was taboo, and something the Sith Lord knew she knew about it. He had been so angry with her for that, as she no doubt could tell by the clenching of his fists, and then pulling Alina to her feet knowing the pain it would cause. It was her punishment for being so stupid in speaking his name like that in front of everyone and made sure the pain she felt lasted to its maximum potential until the shuttle taking her to the medical ship steadfast where the medics there could heal her injuries. Such a magnificent structure, isn't it? Said Malgus, as he admired the Jedi Temple, and couldn't help but silently praising the architect that designed it. My lord, said a Sith Knight unsure how to respond even though he was sure Malgus had not addressed him in particular. Our enemies fought like warriors. They died like true warriors. Honorably in battle they fought to the very end without submitting in defeat. It is only fitting that these warriors be buried under the ruins of their Jedi Temple and be given a proper burial. Something that we should all wish for when our time comes to die just as bravely said Malgus before turning slightly to sense the Sith Knights were in agreement with him. Activating the detonator, Malgus along with the other Sith Knights used the force to create a shield to protect them from the explosion, and soon boarded an Imperial shuttle that would take them to the Steadfast in orbit above Coruscant. When he arrived, Malgus saw Alina had been patched up, her face now sporting a smile at his appearance, which had always surprised those around her since no one smiled at Malgus, and did their best to not look the Sith Lord in the eyes. You are ready, said Malgus seeing Alina seeing the woman nod with determination in her eyes. Always, said Alina, 
as she ignored the pain of her still healing injuries, and saw how it made Malgus smile in approval at such resolve to endure pain like himself. Come, said Malgus seeing the woman follow him to head back down to the planet to claim specific spoils for themselves. After several days, Alina had aggravated her wounds, and had to be treated in a civilian hospital though the woman's stay didn't last thanks to Malgus. She had been pulled out of there, as punishment for being so stupid to reopen her injuries in the first place, but the anger aimed at Alina passed when the Jedi Knight Aaron Laner had arrived on Coruscant to avenge her former master Venzalo, and targeted the Twi'lek knowing it would draw out the Sith Lord. When the battle was over, Aaron escaped the Sith Lord's wrath, and left Alina alone with Malgus to decide how to handle this. For a moment, neither spoke to the other, and yet the emotions from both of them made the air thick with tension. Never speak my name around the Sith with love in your voice for me. My rivals will think it implies that I love you back in return, said Malgus harshly, but the anger in his voice wasn't there, and Alina knew it. Why do you say such things? I do love you. Why can't you admit your love? Admit you love me. Say it if only to yourself if not to me, said Alina sadly, as she saw his features soften, and caress her cheek while moving gently down across his throat where the scar from previous abuse from her former master had created early on in life. You are right Alina. I do love you, said Malgus, as he saw Alina show joy at hearing him finally admit it, and hugged the man in a loving embrace. But when she looked up at him, her smile faded at seeing tears of all things descending from Malgus's eyes down his face, and wondered what brought such emotions. She wiped away the tears from his face, practically feeling the sorrow when touching him, and now wondered why the man she loved was crying. What is wrong my love? said Alina seeing the sadness in his eyes from some unseen wound. That I love you is what is wrong, Alina, said Malgus, as he put the cool metal of his lightsaber to her chest, and knew she knew this was her end. Malgus, said Alina, as she closed her eyes, and braced herself for the end knowing what was to come. Darth Malgus was put his hand on the button of his lightsaber as one click from it would activate the red blade, and pierce the woman he loved right through the chest. It would be a quick and symbolic death for the two of them since they both knew it had to be done. She was his weakness, she was his moral conscience, she was his love and a Sith cannot have any of these things for they represented weakness. Do you have anyone precious to you? What? thought Malgus his eyes opening wide, as the force consumed his being, and was shown a vision not of the future, dot but of the past. A time when a blonde-haired, blue eyes, and orange-wearing leaf shinobi had awoken to the sight of seeing a young girl named Haku asking him if he had anyone precious in his life. How she had come to believe that when we have someone precious in our lives we become truly strong and then later seeing the vision of that same girl. As the boy's enemy. How that same girl, who had been beaten, defeated, and drained of all her power had in a sudden moment called upon reserves not thought possible to save the person in her life she called precious taking a hand filled with a piercing lightning attack to the chest, a face without regret on Haku's face, as she fulfilled her duty to the man with the large sword, and smiled a bloody smile knowing she had proven herself to be strong for that man. Do not slay her Naruto, it is not in your nature, shinobi or not, Sith Lord or not, you are not capable of killing those you truly call your precious people. Haku, said Malgus, as he saw the girl from the past in this limbo within the force, and saw her smile at him. She is precious to you. That blue-skinned woman. Remember how she was hurt and the power you unleashed upon your enemies? You fought to protect her from further harm. It is not a weakness to love her Naruto. Show mercy. Show mercy to this woman as you did to me all those years ago. Like I showed you all those years ago when we first met said Haku before she faded from his vision and Malgus found himself holding Alina with his lightsaber still not active. Malgus, said Alina wondering why he had yet to end her life. I, I remembered something, a memory from long ago. I, cannot do what I intended to do, said Malgus, as he put away his lightsaber and saw tears running down Alina's face. Because of your love for me, said Alina simply yet filled with hope. Yes, because I, because I love you, said Malgus finding the whole concept of love to be against everything the Sith stood for and yet it felt, right. Alina cried into his armor, as she held on to him, saying how wonderful that news was to hear from his mouth, and swore to forever be with him until the end. As for Malgus, he knew his time with the Sith Empire was at an end, 
as he had learned recently that the Sith Empire was in fact planning on returning Coruscant back to the Republic in exchange for key planets, and some measure of peace afterwards. With such notions of peace, the Sith Empire would look inward, its high-ranked members fighting for power, and the usual backstabbing Sith do that he felt perverted the purity of the Empire's greatness. He could stay within the Empire no longer. So, it is time to leave? said Alina looking up at him and seeing the man nod his head to signify a yes. Yes. Let us go from this place. From the Sith Empire, said Malgus, as the two walked to the nearest shuttle that would take them to the Endless Shadow, and soon, away from this sector of the known galaxy. I will follow you anywhere my love, not out of duty, not because I am your slave. I will follow your command because I love you, said Alina resting her head on his shoulder and sensed warmth from Malgus that had not truly been there before now. By the time anyone realized Malgus, his Twi'lek slave, and his capital-class warship the Endless Shadow were gone, it was too late to track them. Several standard days later, so this is the planet, huh? Not bad given how far off it is from known space from either the Republic or the Empire, said Alina knowing this planet was indeed far off from both sides. Yes, it is my home planet, the place of my birth, a place I will rule over rather than be ruled by another, said Malgus vowing to make it a reality. And I will rule it beside you, as your queen, as your empress, said Alina, as they had made love constantly the last few days despite the respirator breathing mask needing to be used soon afterwards. The Endless Shadow. This is Shadow Base. We have you on screen. Please transmit your authorization code and follow the coordinates of the designated landing zone, said the Shadow Base control tower on the planet's surface to the communications officer. Shadow Base. This is the Endless Shadow. We are transmitting our authorization code now, said the communications officer before sending it to the Shadow Base control tower. The Endless Shadow. We have received your authorization code. You may start your landing, said the Shadow Base control tower. Soon, the capital class warship made its way to the designated landing zone that was in what was considered by the people of the planet would call Wave Country. Compared to the way things were years ago when he was a child, the country had changed drastically and Malgus could see why the reports indicated his forces couldn't keep things contained for much longer. The whole area of Wave Country had become a highly advanced city despite being divided up into multiple islands with bridges connecting them all together, and allowing quick travel to them. The Shadow Base was located in the center island and Wave Country's capital, which was a pyramid-based structure with four towers around it, and was a structural wonder to behold. Sith troops and knight were standing at attention when Malgus came down the ramp with Alina by his side. My lord, it is an honor to be in your presence, said the Sith knight kneeling before the Sith lord who had put him in charge of this installation. Rise, I wish an update on this world and what has happened since you've been stationed here, said Malgus while he continued walking with the Sith knight beside him. As you know, we have been keeping this things quiet from the rest of the world using the cloaking technology in our possession, and with the help of the country's populace. They were hesitant to respond to us, but when we mentioned the specific name, and certain pieces of information in the event of such thing occurring per your instructions they were ready to help us. Since then, we have been re-educating them, making them smarter, healthier, and ensuring their unwavering loyalty to you, said the Sith Knight as he entered the code to open the door to the pyramid, and they walked into it until they reached the heart of the Sith Temple. But something like this cannot stay away from eyes forever, said Malgus seeing the man nod. Yes. The other countries have sent their, shinobi, to investigate Wave Country's sudden advancement and up until now we've been able to handle them. However, with each new failure makes them try harder to get information, and we've been adapting to their tactics accordingly. Some have sent shinobi disguised as emissaries, but we easily sensed their intentions, and after some persuasion learned quite a bit about their villages. We have detailed list of different shinobi villages with their abilities, tactics used, weapons, the different jutsus, and bloodlines that each one has to look out for, said the Sith Knight showing a complete fully three-dimensional projection of the planet and the names of each country listed. When I was a boy, there was an organization called the Akatsuki running around, and the rogue Sanin named Orochimaru. What is the situation with them? said Malgus, as he saw the name of the organization show up in the shinobi village named Aim, while Orochimaru's name came up in rice country with several other bases scattered around the elemental countries. They've tried their hand in infiltrating us as well. 
even attacked us outright with the large beasts they have as summons, but our defensive towers and shields have kept them at bay. Other times, they sent spies like the shinobi villages, but they failed in their tasks and acquired information on them. As it stands Orochimaru of the Sanin is hiding out in rice country, he has been less than sane from what we have learned since your time here in your past life my lord, and has been harassing the shinobi villages for his future bodies to inhabit, said the Sith Knight finding such a way to cheat death to be revolting and trying to hide it from Darth Malgus. Do not hide your revulsion of the man and his ideals in wishing to cheat death like a parasite my Sith Knight. He sickens even me because the man is indeed a parasite and like all parasites. Must be wiped out, said Malgus, as he shifted the view of the planet from Orochimaru to the leaf village, and narrowed his eyes at it. Is something wrong, said Alina seeing Malgus calling upon the force to answer a question she could see was in his mind. What has happened in the leaf village, specifically regarding Wanuchiha Sasuke, said Malgus while sensing the force was trying to tell him something. But what? Our spider droids have been keeping an eye on each village since we deployed them and the leaf has been buzzing with activity for several years now. As for information about Uchiha Sasuke, our information shows he is in their hospital, and in their ICU with his body still being badly damaged a little over five years ago. From what we were able to learn, they have tried to extract his seed to implant into several women, but upon a deeper examination by one Senju Tsunade they learned his seed had become sterile and cannot have any children, said the Sith Knight while sensing Malgus took great joy in that fact. Good. The arrogant fool didn't deserve children in the first place. What about the rest of the village? said Malgus, as he relished the victory against Uchiha Sasuke, and brought a grin to his face that nearly became visible behind his mask. As it stands, the Hokage position is mostly a figurehead position, and the power behind it has been given almost to the councils. They have tried to interfere in the affair of the different clans in the village, but nothing that the laws they have couldn't prevent, and they still remain among the strongest of all five major shinobi villages, said the Sith Knight seeing Malgus frown before zooming out of Konoha and focused on Suna. What of this one? Suna, said Malgus curiously. One Sabaku no Gara is now the case cage of the village, he was once according to our information was the one-tailed Jinchuriki, but the Akatsuki got the creature out of him and was considered dead for several minutes before being brought back by a Suna elder using some kind of jutsu that was known only to her, said the Sith Knight sensing his master was pleased to hear the case cage was alive and well. Good, my old friend may still be my potential ally in the future. What of the other three shinobi villages? said Malgus wanting to know the situation with the others. The Mist villages is only starting to regain its lost strength after their new mazukage, a woman named Mei took over several years ago and Kumo has lost one of their Jinchuriki while still keeping the other. Kumo lost is the two-tailed Jinchuriki named Yugito and the other that is safe in their village is the eight-tailed Jinchuriki going by the name of Killer B. Iwi has also lost their Jinchuriki too at the hands of the Akatsuki and the Sandame Suchikage has not been pleased by this in the slightest, said the Sith Knight seeing his master clench his fists in anger. That counts for five of the nine Jinchuriki this world has. What of the other Jinchuriki? said Malgus seeing the Sith Knight look over his information quickly on the subject. Mist has lost their two Jinchuriki some time ago. The previous Mizukage being won and killed with the three tails being captured by the Akatsuki. The seven-tailed Jinchuriki was in a minor village named Taki and was soon captured by the Akatsuki organization. The people in Taki and Iwa have both shown they care little for their Jinchuriki with our intel showing they are glad this happened to them. We do not know anything about the nine-tailed Jinchuriki since no one will speak of him, even though we know he was in the Leaf Village once, and have yet to track him down, said the Sith Knight before Malgus let out cruel laugh. You need not look far my loyal Sith. I am that Jinchuriki, said Malgus seeing everyone in the room look at him in surprise. Master, said the Sith Knight, as he wasn't sure his ears heard correctly, and it was clear Alina was surprised by this new information. I am the Kayubi Jinchuriki formerly of the Leaf Village, said Malgus simply while he just laughed at the whole situation, and left the room to enter his own personal quarters his men had created for his arrival. Alina was soon beside him when she entered the room, as they were lovers now, and thus shared the bedroom next door to his office. She saw him leaning against the wall, his eyes shut, and the various emotions the blue-skinned woman never thought would be on that scarred pale-skinned face. 
Alina didn't know much about the Sith way of things, but she knew enough that any with a past had long since destroyed whatever past they had, and made sure it never came back to remind them of their failures. Of the weak creatures they had once been before embracing the power of the dark side and thus risk the past memories rising up to remind them of their moral conscience. My love? said Alina seeing him struggle with himself over this. I'm all right Alina, I'm all right, said Malgus, as he straightened before facing her, but it was clear she wasn't convinced, and touched the sides of his face to look him directly in the eyes. The memories of your past and pain hurt you my love, as my own do from time to time whenever I am reminded of the world I was on before you rescued me, said Alina, as she saw him smile, and caress her face in return. How can you love me? Knowing what I am, what my face and body have become in this state, said Malgus, as he saw Alina smile, and remove the breathing mask before she ed him passionately. I did not fall in love with the body. I fell in love with the spirit. Whatever shape or form you take my love will not waver, said Alina speaking from her heart. Even if I wish to regain my lost hair and skin color, said Malgus wishing to test her words. Even if you wanted more arms and tentacles I would not look away said Alina seeing Malgus nod in believing her words to be true. I'm glad to hear that, it is what I want, what I desire, said Malgus hungrily before he needed to put his mask back on and was once more filled with anger at needing it to live. Then we shall fulfill your desire my love. Tell me who or what you need and I will get them for you, said Alina, as she could gather a strike team together, and head out with them to retrieve what her lover required. For now, I need one person, and one person only from the leaf. Someone I know has the knowledge to heal others and someone I can trust to heal if only a small portion of my body, said Malgus, as he knowing the person in question was skilled in the medical arts of this world, and could heal the stomach region where the seal was damaged. What this person's name? said Alina determined to bring this person to their knees before Malgus. She's an old academy student of mine from my time in Konoha. Her name if I recall correctly is. Hayuga Hanada said Malgus seeing images of the girl from his past and wondered how much had changed with her. I'll have a team ready to retrieve her at once, said Alina moving to the door when Malgus stopped her. No, not yet. We must know what is going on around the woman before we take her from the leaf. Her clan is divided in terms of a main family and a branch family. The branch family all have these seals on their foreheads that can be activated at any time by the main family and seal away the eyes of the Hyuga in the event of their death or the event of a possible capture by an enemy. I need to know if she is still a main family member or if she has that cage bird seal on her forehead, said Malgus knowing the Hyuga woman would be of no use to him should that be the case. What is this Hinata girl to you? said Alina curiously knowing this girl could some form of competition for her lover's heart. Feeling jealous already said Malgus knowing how the woman in the Sith Empire had looked at him with lust in their eyes knowing he would make good breeding stock for powerful force-sensitive children. Can you blame me? said Alina hearing her Sith Lord for a lover chuckle. No let's not talk about people from my past. We are in no rush just yet to retrieve the woman to heal me. Let's just rest from our long trip here, said Malgus seeing his lover nod in agreement before they went to the bedroom to rest. Sometime later. Malgus let his twi'lek woman sleep contently in their bed, as he had business to attend to in knowing his base inside, and out since he had only been here for little over a day. As he walked, the Sith Lord let the dark side flow through him, as he soon found himself once more in the heart of the pyramid control center, and saw some of his men looking a bit nervous about something. Not about him being the Kyubi Jinchuriki of course, but over something else, and were unsure how to bring it to his attention without risking his wrath. You have something to report. What is it? said Malgus seeing an imperial officer of captain rank approach nervously with a data pad in hand. My lord, I don't wish to bring about your wrath upon me for speaking out of turn, but we have just recently come across sensitive information pertaining to your parentage, and felt you needed to be informed, said the captain seeing the Sith Lord direct his eyes at him. And what could be so sensitive that you would fear my wrath upon learning of it, said Malgus seeing the captain plug the data pad into the central system to bring it up on the projection screen. After you mentioned your status, as the Kyubi Jinchuriki, we had the classified records in Konoha carefully searched by the spider droids in the Hokage's office, and learned that your parents were two highly skilled shinobi of the leaf. Your mother's name was Uzumaki Kashina, formerly of Whirlpool, and your father's was. Namikaze Minato. The Yandaimi Hokage of the leaf, 
said the captain showing the picture of the Sith Lord's parents they had acquired from an old bingo book taken off an Iwa Shinobi. These two are my parents, said Malgus looking at the two carefully while the captain nodded fearfully. Yes my lord, but that's not all the spider droids learned. We have also learned that it was your mother, who became the previous Jinchuriki before you, and... Dot and said the captain seeing Malgus glaring at him for his hesitation. And what captain? said Malgus seeing the Imperial officer input more information from the data pad into the projection. And we learned that your mother is still. She's still alive my lord, the captain before the Sith Lord grabbed the Imperial officer by the throat and lifting him right off the ground. Are you trying to get yourself killed captain? Did you just say my mother is alive? As is walking around, on this planet, and living her life like she never gave birth to me? said Malgus while looking the captain in the eyes for any lies and deception in his words. I only speak the truth to you my lord. I can prove your mother is alive. Please let me explain, said the captain while trying to breathe under the iron grip of his master. You have five minutes to show me proof captain or I will find your replacement from among populace of this country, said Malgus, as he dropped the captain to the ground, and saw the man scramble to show his proof of Kashina being alive. Given your unique status my lord, we used a sample of your blood on file to scan the planet for any lost relatives, and have them join us. Your genetic sample has its own energy pattern with the energy that comes from your tailed beast making your signature unique. During the scan of the planet, our systems detected a signature almost identical in similarity to yours, but the scan indicated this signature was female, and we sent spider droids to investigate this phenomenon. This is the feed we captured two days ago before putting it through the facial comparison program to confirm it was in fact your mother, said the captain showing the feed of a red-haired woman in her bedroom, crying her eyes out, and mumbling words Malgus couldn't properly pick up. Enhance the audio. Now, said Malgus, as he repeatedly clenched his fists, and soon heard what the woman was saying. Why? Why am I so stupid? How could I leave my baby? I knew he wasn't the Kyubi, but I left him anyway and to an ungrateful village. Now he's gone. Missing. He could be dead or in some prison somewhere suffering. My Naruto-kun. I'm sorry. Kami forgive me, said the voice of Uzumaki Kashina, but Malgus compared the tear-filled eyes, and compared the face to that next to it from the bingo book. It's her, but... Dot she hasn't aged a day, said Malgus, as he saw the facial program compare the faces, and indicate it was a 100% match. Our scientists have theorized that the residual energy from the Kyubi within you has involuntarily kept her from aging after it was taken out of her, said the captain while hoping this information would please his master. Where is she located now? said Malgus with his eyes burning with rage at his mother for her stupid disregard for him. She's here at this location called Fang Country, said the captain pointing to the third projection showing the planet and the location Kashina was in. Prepare a retrieval team. I want the best. Leave nothing to chance. Bring my so called mother to me, said Malgus, feeling the dark side of the force howling at him to bring the woman to Shadow Base while hinting she was another key to healing his injuries. Alive, my lord, said the captain, seeing Malgus nod. Alive and unspoiled, captain. I want her to stand her on her knees before me within two days, said Malgus, seeing the captain nod. And when she is brought before you, my lord, said the captain seeing the burning eyes of the Sith Lord dance in the dim light of the room. Let's just say it will not be my mother's god she will beg forgiveness from. It's going to be me, said Malgus, as he left the room, and went to his personal meditation chamber. He needed to have a clear head for what was to come and what he was about to do. Deep within the Sith Lord, a certain nine-tailed vulpine creature stirred, and grinned at sensing what was going on with its host. While not able to connect to its host like before after that mess with the Uchiha years ago, it had kept an eye on what the boy turned Sith Lord had done without needing its power to heal, and the Kyubi had to admit the boy had become powerful. The sheer rage, the hate, and this, force, the boy tapped into was quite an achievement in the Fox's book. Kyubi knew of what Malgus needed the Hyuga girl for in terms of healing the torso region enough to make adjustments to the seal for a strong enough connection to the fox in order for its chakra to heal the Sith Lord's body. The fox had no problem with that, as he knew of the crippling situation Malgus was in the aftermath of fighting that female Jedi Knight on Alderaan, and knew the healthier its host the better. You have earned my power young Sith Lord. It will be my gift to you for becoming a host worthy to call my vessel. 
said Kayubi knowing that not even Uchiha Madara had the power to stand in Malgus's way of ruling the planet. The Kayubi would just have to nudge the Sith Lord in that man's direction knowing true revenge on the Uchiha wouldn't be complete until all of them were wiped out. Uzumaki Kashina was walking along the streets of the town within Fang Country to her house when she sensed someone was watching her. Instincts filled with years of shinobi training from the past silently warned the redhead woman someone of the not-so-friendly nature was headed her way. Picking up the pace, Kashina drew the secret kanai from her sleeve, and readied herself for a fight knowing things were going to get ugly real soon. She also wondered, who it was that had discovered her location, and how they had done it. Kashina trained of course, in private untouched places of the country wilderness, but always made sure not to make her chakra signature go too high that other shinobi could sense it, and investigate the matter. Come on out. I know you're there, said Kashina when she made it to the abandoned section of town that was under renovation. Impressive. You sensed us. The master told us to be cautious of you in the event your skills as a shinobi had not dwindled, said a hooded figure wearing a strange metal mask and strange flexible looking armor. Who are you? What do you want? said Kashina knowing a simple kanai wouldn't help her in this fight. Me? Nothing. My master has sent us to retrieve you. He considers the matter between the two of you to be of a personal nature. One he wishes to surprise you with himself said the figure, as several more came out of the shadows looking nearly identical to him, and several of the others wearing different armor with strange weapons in their hands. Everything is considered a personal nature these days. I'm afraid I'll have to decline your master's oh so welcoming invitation to his domain, said Kashina while hearing several of the robes freaks around her laugh like she just told a joke. You speak as if you have a choice. You do not said the robed figure and with a single outstretched hand of a gesture the kanai in Kashina's possession became his own. What? How did you do that? said Kashina while seeing the man examine the weapon before breaking it easily in his hand. That is a question that will be answered on another day and in front of our master. Seize her, said the robed leader of the group with the others moving in. I'll show you what happens when you fight an Uzumaki, said Kashina, as she got into her taijutsu stance and struck out against her closest foe. The robed figure blocked her strike, then the combo Kashina unleashed following it, and ducked under a spin kick that she was hoping would take off the man's head. Kashina had sensed the other one behind her, as she leapt to her fight, and tried to fight the one robed figure farthest from her to prevent herself from being closed in. However, each figure had casually blocked her attacks like they could sense them, and also been trained to fight the same taijutsu form. At the same time, she knew of several instances where they could have easily disabled, and knocked the wind right out of her. They were clearly holding back, which she could tell was something they were not used to doing, as they came very close to hitting the redhead in the face multiple times, but stopped at the last second, and Kashina used that to get away. Now sergeant, stun her, said one of the rogue figures with Kashina turning to see the sergeant, point his weapon at her and shot a strange blue beam of energy of some kind that disabled the woman's body upon impact. When Kashina hit the ground, the rogue figures were instantly upon her, putting some facial mask on her face, and felt some kind of sedative-based gas coming out of it. As she drifted into unconsciousness, Kashina heard the roaring sound of something powerful overhead, and felt herself being carried closer to whatever the metallic thing above was. Konoha several days later, is this accurate? said Tsunade staring at Jiraiya seeing the Sani nod. Yeah, my spy in Fang country nearly pissed himself when he told me. Normally the guy never meets me in person. Always leaves discreet messages to prevent others from knowing he's one of my spies in the network. The man was pale white when we talked, I doubt he believed half of what was seen with his eyes, and I don't blame him since I did when he told me, said Jiraiya seeing the woman raise her eyebrow to indicate she was thinking the same way. A giant metallic ship, roaring engines that sounded demonic. Strange robed figures and armored figures abducted a red-haired woman before flying off in the direction to wave country. Aside from what he saw, this clearly has you spooked, and afraid for some reason. Why, said Tsunade seeing Jiraiya run a hand through his hair. Because I think the woman they took, it was Uzumaki Kashina. Minato's wife, said Jiraiya while seeing Tsunade's eyes widen before jumping out of her chair. What did you just say? said Tsunade while hoping to Kami he didn't just say what he just did. The woman fought her abductors in Taijutsu and when I asked how she fought, 
It was the same way Kashina did, said Jiraiya seeing Tsunade was getting worried now. But, dot how? Said Tsunade knowing Kashina was missing and presumed dead after the Kyubi's attack. I don't know. But I do know these guys are from Wave Country and the way that place is thriving makes even the technology from Spring look weak by comparison. Up until now, the leader of this group was unknown, and still is from what I've been able to learn, said Jiraiya knowing his toads would not go near the giant pyramid. We have to send a team to retrieve Kashina. If they plan to use her as breeding stock to produce soldiers, then they have to be stopped, and fast, said Tsunade seeing Jiraiya nod knowing he hadn't been focused on finding the woman after the Kyubi's attack and even ignored her son for the first 12 years of his natural life. It won't be easy. Villages have tried to infiltrate the place. Iwa, Suna, even Orochimaru and the Akatsuki have failed in getting their people into that place before they could learn something, said Jiraiya seeing Tsunade nod. True, but if the shinobi life were easy, then every fangirl and civilian could do it said Tsunade seeing him concede to her point. So, Dot who is going on this mission? It has to be a select group capable of blending in. I'll go with them so if things get hairy my toads can provide the necessary escape for them, said Jiraiya seeing Tsunade appear hesitant. I will have them ready within the hour. Just be careful Jiraiya, said Tsunade seeing the man's Y grin appear on his face. Hey, it's me, said Jiraiya leaping out of the window. That's what I'm afraid of you perverted Baka, said Tsunade before she reached for the necklace Kakashi had brought back while stating Naruto was nowhere to be found. Wave country days later, this place scares the hell out of me to no end, said Shikamaru seeing the giant pyramid off in the distance. Get in line. Akamaru is whimpering like he just ate the last of my mom's favorite snack before realizing it was hers, said Kiba seeing his dog look at him with eyes that pleaded with the Inazuka to go back. My bugs to not like this place either. They say it's a place where dark things dwell, said Shino, as he didn't like this place, and neither did his bugs. We have our orders. If Uzumaki Kashina is here, then we have to get Minato Sensei's wife back, and stop any plans they may have for her, said Kakashi, as he knew saw the various ships, and vehicles never before seen outside of Wave Country, and even the airships from Spring seemed like toys compared to the ones used here. Hanada. What do you see with your Bayakugan? said Tenten, as she knew Neji was out on another mission, and Hanada had been called in. So many different things. I can't even describe it. Wait, I see her. I see Kashina san. She is in some kind of room that's all metal with a strange wall of energy designed to be the entrance and exit to the room, said Hanada, as she saw the woman was out like a light, and two guards were standing with strange weapons in their hands outside her room. She's in the prison section of the pyramid. Anything about her form to suggest they've done something to Kashina? said Kakashi seeing Hinata shake her head no. No, she's unconscious, but physically unharmed from what my eyes can see of her body right now, said Hinata before looking towards what could only be the throne of the room and saw a man wearing black with a hood over his face while a dark yet powerful energy surrounded him as his eyes were closed in what seemed to be deep mediation. And then suddenly they opened with yellow eyes with a red tint around them revealing themselves to Hinata and the Hyuga girl quickly shut off the Bayakugan while a shiver ran down her spine. Hinata, what is it? said Jiraiya seeing the woman tremble like a leaf. Nothing. It's just. I think I saw the leader within the pyramid and he knows we're here, said Hinata seeing the group tense up a bit. It's that's true, then we have to be careful to not get caught and do things right said Yugo with another Anbu with her wearing a bear mask. Inside the Sith Pyramid, we have company. Quite a few more than last time. Proceed as planned, said Malgus motioning to the nearby Sith trooper, who nodded his head a fraction, and then contacted the others to go forward with the plan the Sith Lord had thought up. Back with the Leaf Rescue Team sometime later, this shouldn't be so easy, said Shikamaru, as they had gotten farther into the complex than any other shinobi and it was making the hairs in the back of his head stand on end. I agree. My insects refuse to leave my body. They say the deeper we go, the stronger the dark energies of this place become, and they fear it greatly, said Shino while Akamaru tried to stay silent. No kidding. My instincts are going crazy. Part of me wants to go rabid and the other wants to run away with my tail between my legs, said Kiba while questioning his sanity over the fact he was hearing whispers all around him. Stay calm Kiba. 
There have been rumors of this place playing some kind of mind games on Shinobi not strong enough to mentally withstand its mysterious power, said Kakashi, as he didn't want to believe such things were true, but a brief flash of Obito and Rin were making the man nervous. Minato sensei trusted you with him Kakashi. You failed the Yandaimi and his son. Soon you will pay for your neglect and hypocrisy, said Rin in Kakashi's ear in a way that the man would have sworn on every Icha Icha paradise he owned that the dead woman was behind him in order to speak those words. Playing head games indeed, you betrayed me Jiraiya. I entrusted you and Tsunade to be responsible godparents for my son. And what do you do instead? You go off peeping for your research, and Tsunade runs off to drink herself stupid while gambling away money like it grew on trees. Some sensei you turned out to be. You're a joke. Maybe I should have asked Orochimaru to be Naruto's godfather. At least he would have trained the boy to become something great, said the harsh voice of Namikaze Minato with the image of the man staring directly right at Jiraiya, but the Sanin shook his head and rejected the agonizing pain that those harsh words delivered. Come on. We're almost to the key junction needed to get to Kashina, said Jiraiya while keeping the scowling face of his student out of his mind. Easier said than done. No sooner had they reached the junction however, the group was instantly stopped when all the areas they could run were cut off my metal doors slamming down, the sound of the alarms announcing intruders, and the whispered hissing of knockout gas being pumped into the room. The group tried to cover up, using their mouths, and masks filters for those that had them for mandatory reason in the event they were needed should such a trap was used. However, the plan to hold off the effects of the gas failed and within moments of hitting the ground the doors opened with Sith troopers moving it before firing stun blasts at each person to ensure they stayed down. Throw them all into individual detention cells on different floors and then inform Darth Malgus the intruders have been caught, said the Sith trooper with the rank of sergeant on his chest to a lower ranked grunt. It was almost time to start this little drama, detention center. Ow! What the hell? Feels like I've got a headache the size of the Hokage Monument, said Kiba as he got up from strange metal bed attached to the wall, and saw himself in a square room with only one way out. And it was blocked off by a wall of energy. The feeling is the same for me too, said Shino a similar cell across from him. Shino? Where is everyone? said Kiba, as he realized Akamaru wasn't here with him, and had strange cuffs on his wrists. In different cells like ours I theorize. My bugs overheard one of them order us to be relocated on different floors. The fact we are here on this floor means the others are probably paired somewhat together on different sections of the prison area, said Shino while wishing his bugs would obey his commands to find a weakness to the room. But why like this? said Kiba wishing he could scratch his head right now. Most likely to make us talk to each other. I suspect there are recording devices listening in on our conversation to possibly use against us in our interrogations said Shino while Kiba just shivered slightly while thinking of a certain female special Junin back home and the other one with the scars on his face. So what do you think will happen next? said Kiba seeing Shino raise an eyebrow at him. Why do you assume I know? said Shino simply, because you're the logical thinker between us and you're Shino, said Kiba seeing the Aburame shake his head while clearly not amused. It doesn't matter what I think will happen next as it is obvious what will happen next, and it will not be pleasant, said Shino seeing Kiba go pale for a second. Yeah. I imagine torture never is during an interrogation, said Kiba hoping they weren't doing anything to Akamaru right now. No it is not. Still, we now have a name to the leader of this place, and if we could find a way to get the name to the outside world would be a small victory for us, said Shino, as he just needed one of his insects to make the trip to Leaf, and into the hands of one of the Aburame clan members. What's his name? said Kiba curiously. Darth Malgus, said Shino simply while the name made both of them shiver in fear for some reason. Nice name. Bet he gets a lot of ladies with that, said Kiba with a grin in hopes joking would make the situation less dismal. Now is not the time to make jokes Kiba. No doubt they will inform him of it and he will not be pleased, said Shino seeing Kiba whimper a little knowing that was most likely true. It can't get any worse, right? said Kiba seeing Shino again raise an eyebrow at him. The door down the hall opened and the sounds of footsteps were soon heard echoing around them while getting louder with each passing second. In front of each leaf shinobi there were two robed, well-armored, and helmet-covered figures with others uniformed soldiers pointing weapons at them. Get up and follow us, 
You'll be meeting Darth Malvis in his throne room. He wants all of you at this special gathering, said the robed figure to Kiba's right. And if we refuse, said Kiba trying to be defiant. If either of you refuse, then that dog of yours will die a slow and painful death with the two of you being witnesses, said the same robed figure having been informed by the Sith Lord of the Inazuka's ties to the animal. Don't fight them Kiba, said Shino knowing logically was not the best time to resist. I'm not, I just asked a simple question anyone else would ask in my position, said Kiba walking with their assigned escort taking them to the throne room of Darth Malgus. Keep your mouth shut on the way to see our master. You'll live longer, said one of the soldiers with the strange weapon in his hands. Interesting. That weapon looks like it can shoot something powerful from that end there, but what, thought Shino, as he tried to make his insects leave to inspect the weapon, but a hand from a Sith knight went to his shoulder, and squeezed it tightly. Don't bother. We know what you were thinking. Your insects won't obey you because we won't allow it and neither will our master, said the Sith knight while sensing the shock the Aburame was letting out. He's preventing my hive from responding, with some kind of mental command when using his dark power. And he's just a subordinate to Darth Malgus. What kind of person could command such people to obey him? Thought Shino, as he found himself with Kiva in the elevator system that took the group directly to the throne room, whereupon the two heavy metal doors opened did they reveal the others had already arrived, and waiting for them. Ah! I see the group is all here. At last! said Malgus in an eerie voice that would have made Orochimaru's by comparison seem like an angel. We are not here to start trouble. We just wanted to bring Uzumaki Kashina with us back to Konoha. It's her home, said Shikamaru knowing it was impossible to hide his thoughts from the man on the throne with that blue-skinned woman with two hanging tentacles on her head standing beside him. Her home? Strange that I found her living in Fang country and not in Konoha around the time my soldiers retrieved her. Why do you think that is? said Malgus seeing the group flinch under his gaze while Kashina barely hid hers. She was on a mission, said the Anbu with the bear mask, only to be hit with the butt of the blaster rifle from a Sith trooper to the side of his head, and it was clear lying was not tolerated in the Sith Lord's presence. Fool! Your thoughts betray you. All of your minds do. I can see every thought, secret, and desire that burns within your mind. I know every joy, every tragedy and humiliation you have endured up to this point in life. You can hide nothing from me, said Malgus while staring at them all and slowly rising from his throne. Tell them my love. Tell them all why they're here. Especially these two, said Alina sensually while pointing at Kashina and Hanada with both women shivering in fear. In due time my love. Patience. I have waited so many years for this moment, regardless of the fact that I believed it would never happen, and it can wait a little while longer said Malgus caressing his lover's face. Anything so deformed as her should be killed, said the Anbu bear masked shinobi of the leaf. Only to find an invisible hand squeezing his neck and lifting him right off the ground. Deformed, her, you know nothing of what she is fool, such a primitive mind from a backwater planet, to think I was born here on this mud ball with the rest of you, said Malgus while sensing the confusion, shock, and fear that came off of them all from that statement. The way you speak about us, it's clear you've gone beyond the boundaries of this world onto something far greater, and resent this world on a deeper level, said Shikamaru, as he saw Malgus turn to him, and then release the invisible hold on the leaf Anbu with the man falling down to the metal floor. And breaking his right arm in two places upon impact. As smart as ever Shikamaru. I see the lazy tendencies when we grew up didn't hamper your shinobi skills when it came to strategizing, said Malgus seeing Shikamaru look at him now with surprise that they apparently knew each other at some point. You were a leaf shinobi? said Kiba in shock. Yes I was one of you. Granted, I look much different than I did back when you knew me, said Malgus laughing slightly in amusement while they tried to remember him. What did you look like before now? said Hanada seeing Malgus direct his eyes at her. Oh, if you only knew who I was before now, and the reaction I would see because of it, said Malgus with a smile behind his breathing mask before turning to Kashina and just frowned at her. What do you want with me and the Hyuga girl? Certainly not a need to get your rocks off since you have her to do it for you and make children, said Kashina defiantly, but was backhanded by Malgus, and a bruise appeared on the woman's cheek. Speak disrespectfully about Alina again and I'll destroy you. Besides, even if I took the Hyuga girl to my bed, I'd sooner kill myself than commit incest with the likes of you, 
and create children in the process, said Malgus, as he snarled at the woman in disgust, and saw the shock from the others at his words. Incest? You mean, the woman is related to you? Are you an Uzumaki too? said Jiraiya seeing Malgus laugh now, as he turned to face him, and walked towards the bound Sanin. I am. Or rather I was an Uzumaki. I have long since left my old birth name behind for something greater, stronger, and more powerful, said Malgus staring the Sanin right in the eyes. Darth Malgus? said Jiraiya with a raised eyebrow. Sounds kind of grimy to me, said Kakashi while waiting for the right moment to spring his Sharingan on the Sith Lord. Only to be struck by force lightning with the power the attack behind it sent the Junin flying into Yugo with the woman feeling a fraction of electrical pain, but still cried out from the sudden shock, and the two whimpered in agony. Jiraiya and the others could only watch in utter horror at the pain the two Junin seemed to be in from that single attack. It looked like a lightning jutsu, but more cruel, and the color was different too, thought Jiraiya while seeing two Sith knights separate the two from each other. I wouldn't expect any of you primitive people to understand, said Malgus, as he walked back to Kashina before removing his respirator mask, and hood so they could see what his face looked like. You're not an Uzumaki, none of us would look like you do, said Kashina while she fought back the flinch from seeing Malgus's scarred face twist when he smirked. And I thought you shinobi could see underneath the underneath, see the truth behind the truth within the truth, you are shadow of your former self. When my men informed me of you being captured so easily, I was actually disappointed, and expected them to at least have one wounded among them. Then again, I did train them well, and they have served me well when in combat against my enemies, said Malgus with pride in his voice at the end and sensed his army embrace it. What are you talking about? said Kashina seeing Malgus inch a little closer to hers. You really don't recognize me? At all? said Malgus seeing Kashina scowl at him. I think I would remember someone from my family, said Kashina seeing Malgus scowl at her before smiling a cruel smile. No I imagine you wouldn't recognize me after so long. How long has it been since we were even in the same room together? It must have been 17 maybe 18 standard years ago if my memory is correct. Yes. You remember that far back, don't you? said Malgus, as he saw Kashina's eyes widen, and so did Jiraiya's since they knew the significance of the day. It can't be. You aren't him, said Kashina hearing a dark chuckle come out of Malgus's throat. It's not hard to embrace disbelief when it comes to me when I just said I'm someone you would call family. Then again, how would you know if I was him when you haven't even been there during my time growing up, and see me become this figure standing before you? I may be a Sith, but even I still have my honor, and would never abandon my child for being what you once were prior to my birth said Malgus seeing Kashina was wide-eyed in fear at the realization of it all even though she didn't want to believe it was true. It can't be. There is only one person Kashina could call say she was related to by blood, but he's been missing for years, thought Jiraiya while Malgus's smile became crueler before looking over at him. You see, Jiraiya knows it's true. Deep down, you know it is true too, and just need some proof to back it up, said Malgus as he walked away from Kashina over to Jiraiya, and stood with his hands behind his back. How can we trust anything you say? If you can read our minds like you claim, then any of the so-called proof would be something only Kashina, or even Jiraiya would know that was extracted from inside their heads, said Kashina with Malgus looking at him with the smirk lessening slightly, but was still there, and the eyes only burned with greater rage. Perhaps, but that is where the lovely Hyuga woman comes into play, and I'm sure you all want to hear how I plan to prove I was an Uzumaki. More importantly, the proof that I am in fact. Your son, and Jinchuriki of Kayubi formerly of the Leaf, said Malgus seeing everyone's eyes widen in shock and fear with Kashina tearing up at the sight of what her son had become. And Malgus loved every second of it. Naruto-kun, said Hinata, who looked upon her former crush in shock and saw how life had outside of being a shinobi had treated him, and wondered why the Kayubi had yet to heal him. It can't be him. Naruto has blonde hair, blue eyes, and is more hyperactive than an eight-year-old on a sugar rush. This guy is. Dot the exact opposite, thought Yugo, as she saw a warrior of the battlefield, who walked with years of training, and experience under his belt that Uzumaki Naruto never had. She speaks his name with affection. Only I may do that and even then it is his Sith name that should be spoken in such a way, thought Alina, as she drew one of her two blaster pistols from the hip holster, 
and pointed it at the woman to shoot a limb for speaking in such a way to the Sith Lord. Stop Alina. I need her alive and unharmed, said Malgus seeing the Twi'lek woman look at him for a moment and then at Hinata with a glare before holstering her weapon. She was going to hurt me. Not surprising I guess when you consider she is Naruto Kun's lover. This woman has everything I dreamed of having with him, thought Hinata sadly while seeing Malgus frown slightly and blushed in embarrassment at realizing he had picked up her thoughts on the matter. If you really are Naruto, then why hasn't the Kyubi healed you, and restored your body to its peak condition? said Kakashi with Malgus frowning at him with a snarl on his face that twisted the scars on the side of it. You can thank my old teammate that was your former student Uchiha Sasuke for that minor problem my so-called sensei. After I showed the fool a small amount of mercy by not killing him with the Rasengan, he tried to kill me a third time by trying to set me on fire, and burn me alive. The damage to my seal prevents my Vulpine guest from working his power on my body to restore to its truest form and I've had to survive without it ever since that day, said Malgus, who was actually proud of his achievement in knowing he could survive without the power of the fox, and still come out on top of things. And the scars on your face? said Jiraiya knowing the wounds were more recent given how fresh they still looked. A battle that didn't go exactly as planned. One defeat out of many victories. Though I suppose given my opponent then, it's no real surprise her forces could hurt mine, and take victory from the jaws of defeat, said Malgus more to himself now. What do you wish of me then? said Hinata while seeing her former crush once more look in her direction and then was soon looking up at him. Your skills as a healer. You were quite skilled, even when we were children Hinata, and I'm sure the old bad eventually saw it too. You're what they call a medic nin, correct? said Malgus seeing the girl nod slowly. I am, but you already knew that, said Hinata seeing the Sith Lord smirk and nod. True, but I wanted to confirm it all the same. I need your healing skills to fix my body to the point where the seal can be looked at and possibly fixed so the Kyubi can repair the overall damage to my physical form, said Malgus, as he saw the woman look uncertain, and glance at the others for guidance. Don't do it. If he's this strong now, then his power might increase, and then the world is forever doomed thought Kiba while Akamaru with a special shock collar on his neck just whimpered since the animal had long since tried to break free and failed with the device on it ensuring forced obedience. He could easily extract the information from Hinata and do it himself. He's giving her a choice, thought Shino while torn in his answer. Don't do it girl, said the Anbu wearing the bear mask and was forced choked by a nearby Sith knight before killing the shinobi after having heard enough from the man. Aye aye. I don't know if I should, said Hinata seeing Malgus smile at her in a more gentle fashion and even ran a gentle hand over the woman's face. Why not? Surely you can imagine how much pain I'm in. Do you know I can only take this mask off for a certain amount of time? That every day my lover suffers in knowing we cannot spend longer intimate hours together because of my condition. How you make me suffer by not helping heal my body? Said Malgus hearing the girl moan slightly from his touch and sensing Alina didn't like it. I want to help you, but the others, and my loyalty to Konoha, they won't, said Hinata while loving his touch, even though she wasn't supposed to, and almost let out a whine when he took his hand away with a sad expression on his face before putting the mask back on. I'm sorry to hear that Hinata. Prepare her team for execution and then send the bodies back to Konoha as a warning to them not to invade my home, said Malgus seeing his forces pick them up off the ground while they tried to struggle. Wait. Stop. Don't kill them, said Hinata, as she didn't want her friends and teammates to die for her mistakes. I have no choice. You refuse me and Konoha needs to know just how serious I am when it comes to uninvited guests, said Malgus walking up the steps to his throne. I'll heal you, I'll heal you in exchange for them leaving here alive and letting them return to Konoha, said Hinata hoping the offer was tempting. Hinata no. Don't do it. Think about your old sensei. Think of the village. Your family, said Tenton, only to be punched hard in the stomach to shut her up. And afterwards, said Malgus, knowing once Hinata healed him, the woman's life was up in the air, and possibly forfeit. I'll serve you, in any way you desire, said Hinata while bowing before him on the steps leading to his throne. And how can I trust you in staying in my service should I require it, said Malgus with a raised eyebrow. I swear it on my clan's bloodline to be your humble servant and do whatever you wish to me. My life will be yours to command, said Hinata with the others behind her in shock at this news. 
You stupid Hyuga guru. Don't make such a commitment like that to him, said Kashina before being silenced by a glare from Malgus. Interesting. You would pledge your life to me? As my new servant? Do whatever it is I asked of you? All for letting them go? Said Malgus with a hint of disbelief in his voice. I would. My master, said Hinata looking up at him with determination. Insolent wench, said Alina angrily pointing her blaster pistol at her, but it was yanked out of her hand by Darth Malgus using the force, and the Sith Lord just shook his head in disapproval. That is enough Alina, said Malgus with authority in his voice that told the Twi'lek woman to not do that again. Yes my lord, said Alina knowing when to not push her luck with him. Stun them, put them on a transport, and dump their bodies in Konoha from an adequate height for them to fall. Take these two women to their assigned prison cells, said Malgus seeing his troops nod before doing as commanded. Why did you do that? said Alina seeing Malgus sit back on his throne with those eyes of his burning with the intensity of the dark side of the force. Why not? Did you not see their reaction to my words? Despite not looking like my old self, they knew I was that boy all those years ago, and when they reported to the village leader. It will bring them fear. All who feared, hated, shunned, and abused me will now learn of my return. My enemies would gather the full might of their strength against me in the belief they can win. Their so-called heroes will gather, their forces marshaled to strike out at us, and yet in the end they die bravely on the battlefield. I will give my enemies the honor they never gave me when I was growing up under their rule, said Malgus letting out a chuckle while his lover stared at him with curiosity written all over her face. What honor is that? said Alina seeing him grin more behind his mask. Simple Alina. I'm going to give them the honor of dying while trying their hardest to win. I want them to attack me everything they've got so when I crush them. There will be no excuses within their minds before they die said Malgus seeing Alina walk over to him again, taking the blaster pistol still in his hand from him, and holstering before sitting down on his lap. And then? said Alina knowing there was more to the plan than just the fighting and the conquering of the planet. And then we rebuild from ashes of our enemies. The people will submit to my rule and my will. In return, I will spread technological wonders throughout the world, healing the old of their insignificant illnesses, educate the young in our ways, and bring about a new era of prosperity never before witnessed, said Malgus seeing Alina smile at him. And begin the reign of the new Sith Emperor, said Alina hearing Malgus chuckle at her choice of words. Indeed. Emperor Malgus does have a certain ring to it, said Malgus seeing Alina lean closer to him. Long live Sith Emperor Malgus, said Alina before she pulled down the breathing mask and ed him on the lips. In another section of the pyramid, in the prison section, Hayuga Hanada watched them with her eyes, and wished that was her on Naruto's lap. Maybe I still can, if I prove myself enough, maybe Naruto-kun will take an interest in me, and I can turn him away from this. I have to try, thought Hanada, as she had reached Naruto before when fighting in the Chunin exam preliminaries while fighting Neji, and knew she would have to try again some other way. As for Kashina, she was weeping now in her own cell and the realization of how stupid it was to neglect Naruto after his birth had helped make him this way, and wished to take all those years back. She had heard the stories of Naruto doing things in Konoha, part of her wanted to go back, but then the weeks turned to months, and the months turned to years. With each passing year, Kashina wondered if Naruto would even love her if she ever came back into his life, and if it was even possible to answer the question of where she had been the whole time. What could she even say to him? Oh son! I left because of the demon sealed inside of you, and wanted to be free from the past by running away like a damn coward. Out of the question, no, instead, she just stayed away from Konoha, off the radar enough for even Jiraiya's spy network to ignore her, and any kind of attention she may bring. And look how things turned out. My son has become evil. The only person he seems to love is that, woman with those two things on her head for hair. Ha. Huh. It must be one of those Uzumaki and Namikaze traits for the male to fall in love with exotic women with head structures, thought Kashina, as she now focused her mind on Alina, and how the woman's grace was indeed sensual yet very athletic in the sense that the Twi'lek was no pushover. Deep within Malgus, the Kyubi stirred again, sensing the cosmic energy that was the force swirling around its Sith Lord for a vessel, and the dark side burning within the man. This pleased Kyubi greatly as he wanted the rage of its vessel to swell, and then be unleashed upon the world soon. 
They both had scores to settle with this world, as it had grown decadent, filled with arrogant humans, who dared tame things beyond their control, and call it their own to command. Soon Uchiha Madara. Soon you will know the wrath of the Kayubi and its Sith Lord for a vessel. Very soon, said Kayubi grinning at the vision Malgus was having through the Force and new victory would soon be theirs. The Kayubi no Kitsun had waited this long, in three generations of Jinchuriki for this one chance at getting revenge against the Uchiha, and the overall world for their abuse of things, it could wait a little while longer. Tell me you are all joking. Tell me you didn't just say what you I heard you say about your mission, said Tsunade in a dangerous tone while glaring at the injured leaf shinobi in the room. Tsunade had along with the entire village had been scared to no end, as they had heard the roaring of engines from the sky, as a ship had hovered above the Hokage Tower, and then proceeded to dump almost every shinobi sent into wave country before flying off again. They all survived the fall, but were badly injured because of it, and had finally reported how their mission ended in utter failure in retrieving Kashina. Even more at the loss of an Anbu-level shinobi and Hayuga Hanada to the dark ruler responsible for the takeover of wave country. Then, when Jiraiya was told just who the leader was, and that it was Naruto of all people, well she was a second away from smashing the toad Sanin into tiny pieces. However, the others had reported the same thing Jiraiya had witnessed, even going so far as to describe Naruto's current facial features and the reason behind Hinata becoming his prisoner. While no one knew the extent of Kashina's fate while in the dark pyramid-like structure, they all knew it wouldn't be pleasant, and that Naruto was not so forgiving like he was as a child. I wish we were all lying Tsunade. Hell, I wish this was just a bad nightmare, and could wake up from it. Sadly, it's not the case, and Naruto is now our enemy, said Jiraiya, as he wasn't going to call his student's son by the Sith name Darth Malgus, and certainly not in front of Tsunade. This is becoming bad and fast. Hiyashi is going to hit the roof when he learns his eldest is now in enemy hands. Not only that, but the councils have been itching for a reason for us to go to war against the people of Wave for their technological wonders and now they're going to get it, said Tsunade, as she had countless meetings about Wave Country, and how the councils wanted shinobi teams to infiltrate the country to retrieve things from the area to study in order to advance themselves. And bring about death to us all. Naruto let us go on whim, knowing you'd tell them, and they would tell everyone else. It's going to cause a massive panic, said Jiraiya knowing they should have died in that dark place, but the young Uzumaki for a Sith Lord had once again surprised them by letting the group live and sent them to the leaf roughed up. Perhaps an alliance with the other villages could help us fight him. The temptation of the wonders Naruto's pyramid possesses could entice them to work together, said Tsunade seeing Jiraiya shake his head no. And what's to stop them from breaking the alliance should Naruto persuade them to just switch sides in exchange for a small sample of those wonders? The kid knows just how to undermine us and any allies we might gain to fight him should we have any at all. Spring Country isn't exactly happy with us for still keeping Naruto in the bingo book as an S-class missing nin with the bounty being so high every greedy bastard has tried to find the gaki, said Jiraiya seeing the woman slump in her chair. I didn't want to do it, but the fact Naruto is the Kayubi Jinchuriki was what made the bounty so high in the first place, and there was nothing I could do, said Tsunade seeing the man shake his head knowing that was sadly the case. What we going to do? If we send anyone from Konoha to Wave Country and we are going to have them return in body bags, said Jiraiya seeing Tsunade look at him with eyes that showed she clearly didn't know. We go on the defensive until we can figure out how to strike back against him, said Tsunade knowing this wasn't going to end well for anyone involved. Assuming there is a defense against him and his forces, said Jiraiya before leaving with the others. Sith Temple Medical Wing two weeks later, I still don't trust her, said Alina, as she stood with Malgus who was currently naked from the waist up, and saw the Sith Lord smile behind his mask. You don't trust any female in my presence for a minute my love, said Malgus seeing the blue-skinned woman look away with a blush tinting her cheeks. And for good reason, said Alina while getting a chuckle from Malgus. Over the past couple of weeks, Hanada had been under the supervision of medical droids doing various tests on recreating the healing cream she made for the Hokage during her apprenticeship to the Slug Princess and taken a great deal of time to make the required amount. To ensure it was the real deal, Alina had volunteered to be a test subject, as she would put herself in harm's way to protect Malgus, and to further prove her love for the Sith Lord. 
Malgus agreed before ordering the sample made be tested on the scar along Alina's throat so he could see the wound there heal with his own eyes. When the scar vanished, Alina was glad to have such a painful physical reminder of the past removed, but also displeased at Hinata being praised for making the cream, and looking forward to her using it on his own scarred body. Of course you do. Still, the Hyuga woman has the skills I need to heal my body to the point where my demonic tenant's power can do it for her, and that is what I require at the moment, said Malgus before the door opened with Hinata stepping into the room with several Sith knights and medic droids. I'm ready to begin my lord, said Hinata, as she had been told in advance by Alina to never call the Sith lord by his old name in front of anyone, and she would be punished if the order was disobeyed. Good. Leave us, said Malgus to his Sith knights before they left the room. You don't want them to stay. What if she tries to kill you? said Alina while Hanada kept her face calm despite the hurtful implication. Hanada won't do that. I can feel it. She's curious to see what I will look like fully healed once this is over, said Malgus seeing Alina was skeptical about that. If that is your will, then I won't oppose it and keep a close on her, said Alina while she glared at Hanada. Good. You may proceed with the treatment Hayuga Hanada, said Malgus, as he saw the woman nod before taking several more steps towards him, the droids doing the same, and quickly began examining the Sith Lord's scarred torso. There is so much damage. How has he not screamed out in pain up until now? thought Hanada, as she revealed the jar of medical cream the Hayuga woman always had on hand, and opened it to use some on the damaged torso. Running her hand over the scarred Sith Lord's body, Hanada saw the cream heal Malgus in that region, and carefully use her chakra to make the seal on his body appear. Using her eyes next, Hanada saw how the seal had been damaged, and what parts of his damaged flesh needed to be healed before anything Malgus wanted to do next could continue. The droid near her took the jar of cream before taking a sample to be analyzed in order for the ingredients behind its creation to be discovered and then duplicated for the future. As for Alina, the Twi'lek woman glare intensified when Hinata ran her hands further over the damaged torso with more of the cream in her hands, and saw the Sith Lord had his eyes closed with a sense of peace on his face. Alina didn't want this woman to be in Malgus's life any more than need be and would have shot the Hyuga woman if not for the Sith Lord's whim. The area where your seal is located has been healed my lord. It is done, said Hinata, as she removed her hands and took several steps back while the medical droids examined the Sith Lord's body to ensure no complications had arisen. Yes. I feel it. Did you acquire the sealing ink and paintbrush I asked for? said Malgus, as he saw Alina nod, and bring them out for him to take. Will this work my lord? I don't mean to sound disrespectful, but, dot you have never used, seals, like this before, said Alina while Malgus prepared himself to use the force to guide his actions. I have taken the understanding of seals from Jiraiya of the Sanin's mind, added with my mother's own understanding of seals, which far surpasses the Sanin's own, and using the force will enable me to do this correctly, said Malgus before dipping the brush in ink and then began use the force to make sure this went according to plan. As he did this, Hanada watched carefully knowing this was an important moment for the Sith Lord, and waited patiently for him to finish. When Maglis did finish, he handed the ink and the brush to Alina before channeling his chakra into one of his hand onto the restored part of the seal. Malgus didn't use chakra since he was a child of a different name, in a different life, but it was something you never forgot, even after all these years, and felt the seal surge with power at being reactivated with the addition to the old seal made by the Sith Lord's biological father. And in doing so found Malgus inside his mind facing the infamous Kyubi. The last time Malgus had been in his mindscape, it had been a dark, dank, and smelly sewer system you wouldn't be caught dead in for even a second. Now it had undergone a revolutionary technological redesign similar to the Sith Temple, as it had sliding doors, elevator system for accessing his memories, and special defense systems to keep others like Shinobi from the Yamanaka clan or Uchiha clan out. Welcome my jailer. It's been some time, hasn't it? Said Kayubi grinning at seeing his vessel again face to face after so many years. Indeed it has furball, said Malgus walking towards the seal and stopped seconds before the fox lashed out with its claws missing the Sith Lord by less than an inch. Your mastery of the force serves you well, as I knew it would, said Kayubi seeing the Sith Lord look at him with expressionless face. You know why I am here, said Malgus, as he wasn't going to dance around this matter and get right to the point. Of course. 
Just because we haven't communicated, doesn't mean I was unaware of your progress in life, and I must confess I am quite impressed at how well you have done without me influencing it, said Kayubi seeing Malgus nod. If you are strong you live. If you are weak then you die, said Malgus with an intensity centered around that belief. Agreed. Hence why I am going to make you stronger by healing your body. You have proved yourself worthy of it, said Kayubi seeing Malgus smirk at him. Proceed, said Malgus seeing the fox grin at him. This will not be pleasant, said Kayubi seeing the man scoff. Almost everything in my life has been unpleasant, said Malgus seeing Kayubi nod in agreement. One of the many things we have in common. Brace yourself, said Kayubi before flooding the Sith Lord's body with demonic chakra and saw Malgus struggling to hold back the scream that wanted to come out of his mouth. It felt like Aldrian and fighting the force push that Satel Shan had unleashed on him with the difference being this felt like a wall of fire. Finally, the Sith Lord couldn't hold back his screams, as he felt the injuries, and scars of his flesh healing. The blonde hair that had long been absent for roughly half a standard decade could be felt growing like a plant, but was burning like his head was on fire again like it was when Uchiha Sasuke had set him on fire, and hurt more than anything he could ever dream of. Outside of the seal, Alina, and Hanada looked on with worry at seeing Malgus become consumed in demonic chakra while the Sith Lord screamed out in pain. The medical droids backed away, unsure how to handle this new phenomenon, and everyone in the room watched Malgus's body become something godly, if the droids could understand that term before their eyes. Pale scarred skin was now tan with traces of scarring to show he was no stranger to battle, the man's face was scar-free if you didn't count the whisker marks on each cheek, and the once bald head had filled with spiky blonde hair that had a wild look to it. When it was over, Malgus fell to his knees, breathing heavily with eyes wide open, and carefully rose from the ground to test his newly restored body. Alina was instantly at his side, feeling flesh that felt was warm, and alive over the usual cold scarred body she had laid down with in their bed when making love. She didn't care if his body was scarred or not. Alina loved him no matter what he looked like and stood by that even now. Still, the Twi'lek woman couldn't deny the incredible sensation of feeling his body in this state, and she shuddered in pleasure at what awaited her when they made love again. Hanada was also at his side, her eyes now activated to their fullest potential, as she had to check to see if the man that was once her crush had his body fully healed with Kyubi's chakra, and saw it was in fact healthy again. Bones were stronger than before. Muscle mass had an increase in key parts of Malgus's body to allow additional strength, and even flexibility that the Sith Lord had denied himself on account of his injuries plus the heavy armor that limited it from the start. My lord, are you all right? said Alina, as she touched his hair, and felt a sense of pleasure running through her fingers at the sensation. Yes. I feel better. Better than I have in ages. Thank you Hayuga Hanada. Through your help, I have achieved in becoming stronger than ever before said Malgus, as he turned to Hanada, who blushed at his praise, and quickly bowed to keep it from him. I am honored my lord. May you and Alina enjoy this newfound health together, said Hanada, as to make the Twi'lek know he was hers, and would not interfere in their life as lovers. Don't be so humble my dear. You shall enjoy it too. If you wish it, said Malgus, as he made the woman stand up fully, and see the shock on her face while sensing Alina felt the same way despite knowing this was always a possibility. M me? B but Alina is your lover, I don't want to impose, said Hanada, as she looked to Alina for help in the belief the blue-skinned woman would try to persuade Malgus from this, but surprisingly the Twi'lek looked like she had made peace with the matter knowing it was what the Sith Lord wanted, and had no right to protest. She is. She always will be. That will never change. But that doesn't mean I can't have another, isn't that what you've wanted all these years? You and me, together? Alina here understands my needs and knows that things must change to stay the same. What I seek in women, is they are exotic, strong as they are beautiful, and can trust to protect my back when surrounded by enemies. Like Alina, you have all those qualities that I seek when it comes to having a lover Hinata, said Malgus, as he saw the woman look up at him with those lavender eyes, unsure of what to do, afraid to step on the other woman's toes, and yet there was a deep yearning within them the Sith Lord saw to be by his side. Yes. She had desired him for years. Yes, she did want him. To be his lover. To wake up in the morning in his bed with the man lying beside her with a smile on both their faces from remembering a night of intense lovemaking. Dare she say yes? Dare she become bold in him? 
let him her? In front of his first lover no less? I. I would be honored, said Hanada, as she ed him, and he returned it with a passion that the Hyuga woman felt on a level she never thought possible. Welcome to my life Hyuga Hanada, said Malgus before using the force to make her sleep and pick the woman up. Why did you do that? said Alina seeing Malgus put her on the nearby medical bed. So we can talk. Leave us. We're healthy now, said Malgus seeing the medical droids nod once and then leave them. What is there to talk about? I understand my place is by your side until the end, said Alina now face to face with Malgus. Even if it means another woman stands by my other side in the same manner, can you live with that? Be mindful of your thought Alina. You can't hide them from me, said Malgus seeing her frown, but it soon changed to a smile, and she wrapped both her arms around his waist. I would never hide my thoughts from you my love, if you require a second female to tend to your body when I am not able I can accept it. It is not uncommon for males of certain species to have more than one female lay in bed for procreation and from what I have researched on this specific planet the people have a specific requirement to do that. Something you fall under if I'm not mistaken when given your bloodline, said Alina while loving the feel of his warm rippling muscles that told her of the years of training and battles he fought in. I do fall under that category, but I also know how women get when they have their mate, and don't wish to share. Don't you fall under that category? said Malgus with a chuckle and saw the woman lean her head against his chest. Maybe. But so long as you are happy, then I am happy, and just want to be with you to the end. Promise me you will. That's all I ask. Promise me on your warrior's honor, said Alina seeing Malgus look into her eyes and for a moment they were the eyes of a Sith, but those of an intense blue beyond her own skin, and they held that sense of honor she had always known was there. I promise Alina. On my warrior's honor said Malgus before he ate her on the lips with an intense passion. Konoha at the moment, he must be destroyed like we told the Sandame the day of his birth, said Homura, as he didn't approve of the Kayubi Jinchuriki being alive then, and didn't approve of the boy turned Sith Lord rising to power. Power the leaf could not control. Troublesome. Don't you think such an option is kind of hard to do given how strong his soldiers are? It's clear we are dealing with a battle-hardened force here, which is far more advanced trained, and stronger than anyone in this village could even imagine. The fact one of them could command the bugs of the young Aburame of the retrieval team to stay inactive is something truly frightening. Imagine how powerful Naruto really is. It was even stated in Jiraiya's report that the power used on Kakashi was not Kyubi's chakra or even a lightning jutsu, but something else entirely, and was incredibly powerful, said Shikaku, as he had been wide awake for a while now, which was a record given his lazy Nara nature and heard every detail that happened on his son's mission. The elder Nara knew his son's team didn't have a chance from the interior description of the Sith temple alone. All the more reason we need to destroy the beast before he does anything else. He has Hayuga Hanada in his clutches and his mother too. Who knows if she's really a prisoner? Said Kaharu having never liked the woman or anyone from Whirlpool for that matter. She was a prisoner. I was in a cell across from her. No special treatment was given the entire time I was sitting mine. She was dragged out roughly like I was. Hell, Naruto even backhanded Kashina right across the face in front of all of us, and that was before anyone knew he was Naruto, said Jiraiya seeing the Hokage grimace at that. Still, the demon brat must be slain, or captured for study. The only comfort we have is the Akatsuki and Orochimaru are going to harass the monster for his wonders. We can use that time to do our own raids on his land said Danzo knowing a fraction of those technological wonders could make Konoha unbeatable. You really think Naruto is going to just sit on his throne and let those two factions not to mention us just make moves to take him down? We're talking about someone who is an Uzumaki by birthright and are known for their unpredictability. They think outside the box we make for ourselves regarding everything we know. Fighting, jutsus, sealing, and every other aspect of the shinobi way. Now take that very same kid, give him what he has now, and throw him back into our world battle hardened with years of experience under his belt. The boy is no longer a boy. That is a warrior, who has fought, killed, been injured, and most likely came close to death on a few occasion only to come out alive. This is a warrior, who doesn't know fear, and instills it on his enemies without remorse knowing in his mind that they deserve to feel before killing them. The eyes I saw in that pyramid were the eyes of a cold vengeful man, who knows what he has power, and how to use that power to its fullest potential, 
said Jiraiya seeing the clan heads shiver in fear at this information. You spoke of his seal being damaged Jiraiya. Thus his body isn't at its peak. Could he fix the seal? Said Tsunade seeing the drawn description the Sanin had made of what their godson and it broke her heart to see it. I don't know. He was never taught anything about sealing. Then again Naruto was never taught anything thanks to the teachers at the academy, and thus his education was pretty much shot in terms of being a shinobi. However, he, said Jiraiya looking away with a sense of uneasiness. What Jiraiya, said Tsunade seeing the man let out a heavy sigh. Naruto mentioned he had the ability to go through people's minds like a member of the Yamanaka clan, but with the skill and ease of a master. Like he could do it easily like it was as simple as breathing. During the entire time we were in that room, he could have easily taken information from my head about the art of sealing, and Kashina too since her own skills were more effective than Minato's ever were, said Jiraiya seeing everyone go pale at this information. If that's true, then logic dictates that young Uzumaki has already fixed his damaged seal, and using Kayubi's power to start the healing process, said Shibi knowing their enemy just got stronger. So how do we take him down, said a civilian council member nervously. I say an all-out attack from all sides. We can easily convince the other shinobi villages that he's a threat to everyone and only a uniting of all five villages will bring the demon down, said another civilian councilman, who ran the merchant guild, and knew such a strategy like his would make him exceedingly rich. And while they fight the demon, my root can infiltrate from the shadows, and take what I need underneath their noses before they realize what's going on, thought Danzo, as he would agree to such a plan, but play it off with reluctance to avoid suspicion, and set his plans in motion. No one noticed the tiny metallic spider-like creature watching the entire meeting and the facial features on everyone's face. Wave Country Throne Room of the Sith Temple Look at them all Alina, Hanada, Kashina, they're plotting my demise with such desire in the belief that the wonders of my pyramid will be theirs. Especially that one with the bandages over his eye, said Malvis while Alina and Hanada stood on either side of his throne while Kashina stayed confined to having cuffs around her limbs while watching from her position in the throne room at the projection of the meeting of Konoha's top government officials. They are foolish to try my love. Still, they do bring up a good point about those different group, and how they will be harassing you soon. We should remove them first before we begin taking over this planet, said Alina while watching the screen. I agree. What about you Hanada? Lend me your many years of experience in the shinobi world, said Malvis seeing Hanada watch the governing bodies of Konoha's top people to see beyond their faces. I agree, but we should keep a lookout for any attempt by the leaf or any other shinobi from another village seeking to take advantage of our eyes being elsewhere, said Hanada knowing that would be the case with their attention focused on Orochimaru or the ever-looming presence of the Akatsuki organization. We'll deal with Orochimaru first. I don't want that parasite to slither in here to take what doesn't belong to him while I'm dealing with the Akatsuki, said Malgus seeing the two women nod while the third avoided eye contact with him. Why are you so down Kashina? Your son is doing this world a great service in bringing its people to their knees under his rule, said Alina seeing the red-haired woman glare at her. By killing and enslaving them, said Kashina before Malgus turned his eyes to her and stared into those burning eyes. Please. They do that now. What does it matter if I do it on a grander scale? As long as the world is united under my rule, the people of this world will benefit from this in the long run, and we both know it said Malgus rising from his throne and walking down the steps to the woman that gave him life. And then left him to fight for it alone. You're wrong, said Kashina seeing her son chuckle. Really? Look at the great technological wonders of my slowly growing Sith Empire you have seen so far. Soon, when I rule this entire world, the wonders in my possession will be shared, and all the people that remain will benefit to such a degree that they will join me without question, said Malgus grinning at his mother, who looked away from him and clearly didn't want to embrace his view of the world. I don't believe you, said Kashina while hearing her son chuckle once more. No I suppose you wouldn't believe me, after all, you haven't seen what I have seen in my time beyond this world. The very galaxy itself is infinite with different planets, filled with beings, their customs, traditions, and their cruelties that make anything this one can throw seem weak by comparison. This world is in chaos, it has no order and no stability due to countless people fighting for power. In order to have stability in this world, there can be only one ruler, and that someone is me. 
said Malgus seeing Kashina looking at him with skepticism. You really think the people will follow you? Just like that? Not even you can make that happen, said Kashina seeing her son walk back up the steps to his throne before sitting back down on it. My naive mother. This isn't the first time I've conquered a world, said Malgus simply seeing Kashina's eyes widen in shock. It's true. When Darth Malgus was fighting for the old Sith Empire, he was expanding it constantly, and has left quite a mark on the galaxy, said Alina smirking at Kashina knowing it was true since she helped. Enough about the past Alina, let us focus on the future, said Malgus, as he pressed a few buttons on the chair, and the image of Orochimaru working alongside Kabuto came up. The Rancor Division was dispatched earlier this morning for this mission my lord. Two of our more heavily armed cruisers specified to handle bombardment is in the air at a safe distance with fighter ready to burn the terrain around the Snake Sonin's base to ash, said Alina seeing Malgus nod while smiling. Good. They should be well versed in handling him from the info we've been gathering since my forces first arrived here all those years ago. Come, it's time for us to train, said Malgus, as he summoned several Sith Knights to take his mother away, and then went to the training center designed specifically for him. He didn't want to become weak and soft after all. Malgus watched with amusement, as the figure bound with specialized restraints was dragged into his throne room by two Sith knights, and a squad of his troopers keeping their weapons trained on the newest guest in the Sith Lord's temple. Brought from the hell that had once been rice country, hunted down trying to flee with sound Anbu, and Orochimaru beside him. The droids had flanked them group, blasting the sound Anbu to pieces. A sniper several hundred yards away in a tree took down Orochimaru via one shot to the head, and then shot this one individual in the spine when the lone survivor tried to once again flee. Welcome to my home. I trust my men haven't been too rough in their treatment of you, but then again with your healing abilities, they could set your body on fire, and it would just regenerate to the point where no one would know it had been on fire once. Isn't that right? Kabuto? Said Malgus seeing the spy of Orochimaru glaring hatefully at him. I'll kill you. I don't know who you are, but when I am free of these restraints, and kill your men. Dot you will be next, said Kabuto before moving his head back slightly when a Sith Knight activated his red-bladed lightsaber and put it dangerously close to his neck. Darth Malgus just laughed behind the hood of his Sith robes. It's not surprising that you don't recognize me. It's been so many years since we last met. I doubt I would recognize myself from back then said Malgus rising from his throne and walked down to the restrained form of Kabuto. What are you talking about? I've never met you before today, said Kabuto frowning in confusion. It seems my men have caused you some kind of memory loss. Let me refresh it for you, said Malgus before removing his hood and saw Kabuto's shocked face of disbelief. You. Dot you look like. Like him. Like an adult version of the Kyubi brat. But. Dot you can't be him said Kabuto seeing Malgus smirk a cruel smirk. Oh, but I am him. I just took on a different name, title, and gained some interesting toys to play with that make anything this world has look like crap, said Malgus before putting the hood back on. What are you going to do to me? I have nothing to offer and I refuse to be your servant, said Kabuto while Malgus just laughed cruelly at him. You make it sound like I want to hire you. Even if I wanted to remotely consider such an the idea, I would sooner stab you with my lightsaber, and feed your remains to a few of my exotic pets I acquired from my time out in the outer rim of the known galaxy. What I do want from you Kabuto, is to have my medical droids dissect your body, and learn the secrets behind your regeneration recovering abilities so they can be duplicated, said Malgus seeing Kabuto scowl further. Why? You already have the Kyubi healing you. Such an ability is slow when compared to your own with that creature in your gut said Kabuto seeing Malgus just grin further and it scared the former sound shinobi. Me? Who said anything about such knowledge being used for my benefit? No such an ability would be more useful in the hands of my troops. Hence why you will dissect it, studied, and basically become my lab rat until the day you die, said Malgus with a cruel smile matching his hate-filled voice while staring at Kabuto. I will get free and I will have my revenge, said Kabuto before being dragged away by the Sith Lord's forces. Fool. I have every contingency planned out in the event you try to escape, said Malgus though it was more to himself than the restrained body being dragged away before one of his officers came into the room. My lord, we have just received communication from Spring Country, and they wish to discuss diplomatic relations with Wave Country. 
The country's daimyo leader wishes to meet with you face to face in one standard week and to come here using one of their own flying ships, said the officer of lieutenant rank. I guess word has already spread of our crushing attack on rice country and the death of Orochimaru with his body being brought before certain powers that handle paying my forces the bounty his head had on him, said Malgus, as he had taken a bingo book off of the dead Konoha Anbu he killed when the leaf shinobi were here, and uploaded every missing nin into the system. Yes my lord. Even now we are receiving reports from various places wishing to sign a non-aggression pact or alliance with us, said lieutenant before bringing up the different countries that wished to be spared the Sith Lord's wrath. Interesting. Contact the Springs Daimyo and please inform its country's ruler I will meet her here for talks about this world's future, said Malgus while looking at the giant globe projection of the world in front of him. Yes my lord. And what of the others wishing talks? said the lieutenant seeing Malgus now showing a scowl and clenching his fists. Ignore them for now. Spring country is a key country in this world I wish to keep it that area from being damaged and prevent unnecessary conflict unless required, said Malgus, as the man in front of him was confused, and clearly thought his hearing was off. My lord? said the lieutenant seeing Malgus smile at him. Their land is filled with resources and I won't have it destroyed simply to satisfy my own bloodlust. Something Darth Revan tried to teach to all who followed him into war those many centuries ago. I studied his teaching thoroughly while at the Sith Academy and identified with him on how to fight my battles. It actually ironic that I would lose one of my battles to his long line descendant on Alderaan, isn't it? Said Malgus seeing the man nod his head in reluctant agreement. Anyone with Revan's bloodline are sure to do great things my lord. Whether they chose to become a Jedi or Sith, said the lieutenant seeing Malgus nod in agreement. I agree, said Malgus before switching the projection in front of him from the world to the Akatsuki HQ in Aim village. With your permission my lord, I wish to return to my other duties, and check with the R&D department on their status with their experiments, said the lieutenant seeing the Sith Lord nod and wave him off. Go, I expect an update on their progress within the hour and I better be impressed said Malgus seeing his loyal officer salute and quickly hurry out of the room. Just because Malgus wasn't burning things to the ground right away didn't mean everyone within his empire could slack off. Konoha sometime later, rice country was obliterated, said Tsunade seeing Jiraiya nod grimly. Yeah and that's putting lightly. Life will return to the country, but it's going to be a slow process, and most likely long after we leave this world for the next. From what I was able to learn, Naruto sent his forces to rice country, destroyed it simply to crush Orochimaru, and sound all in one shot. It was well coordinated using tactics and technology we can't even begin to understand in the slightest, said Jiraiya seeing Tsunade sigh heavily while showing signs of having a massive headache from all this news. Well, that one problem down, but what concerns me is that it will make headway for an even bigger one, said Tsunade seeing Jiraiya nod. It already has, according to my spy. The Akatsuki is getting nervous, and so are the other villages. Some want non-aggression pacts signed while others wish an alliance to prevent any hostile intentions aimed in their direction. So far, I've determined Spring Country is the only one allowed to have such a consideration, and the daimyo there is going to meet with Naruto at his home by the end of the week, said Jiraiya seeing Tsunade's face go deathly pale. She sees Naruto as a hero to her people. There is no telling what they will discuss and what she'll agree to while in that structure, said Tsunade seeing Jiraiya grimace. Yeah, she's heading his way via airship, but is under strict orders to arrive with only two bodyguards, and none of them are allowed to be shinobi. The airship is allowed an armed protection detail with a fleet of other airships, but there is a restriction of how far they are allowed into wave country, and the one Koyuki is on must be unarmed of any weapons, said Jiraiya knowing Malgus wasn't going to let anyone try anything within the center of his domain. And she agreed to it, said Tsunade while surprised at Spring's daimyo at agreeing to the terms. She trusts Naruto, he's carved out his own realm without killing a single person to get it and has an advanced army to back it up. Not to mention his own strange powers that have nothing to do with Kyubi, said Jiraiya knowing that the boy left quite an impact on the woman. It's the strange powers that concern me. From what you mentioned in your report, the Gaki had the power to choke others from far away distances, and shoot lightning from his hand without a single hand sign, said Tsunade knowing the rumors were flying all over Konoha now about the Sith Lord. 
Some said Naruto could enter your body and make you do whatever he wanted. Others claimed he made a pact with Kyubi to become the ruler of the world and forge it into a new version of hell. Some said he could crush your body with a simple thought if the Sith Lord knew your name and what you look like. Yeah. What I don't get is who or what that blue-skinned woman really is. I mean, I know Hoshigaki Kisame is blue too, but this woman is different, and those two tentacles where hair should be is just. Unnatural, said Jiraiya though he silently admitted to himself that tentacles aside, the woman was kind of hot, and was exotic in her own right. Yes, I was wondering that too. From what Naruto stated, he went to other planets, which are what the stars themselves really are, and apparently they're more just like her. I knew that Gaki had strange taste in things, but I never saw that coming, and I'm feeling sorry for Hinata-chan. She really liked Naruto and now he's off the market, said Tsunade seeing Jiraiya get a perverted look on his face. Well, considering he's ruling Wave Country, it's possible, said Jiraiya before Tsunade smashed her fist into his face and sent him sailing out the window. Shut up you pervert, yelled Tsunade while growling angrily at the man for even thinking that right now. There was no way that was happening with Hinata, she'd bet on it. Sith Pyramid Darth Malgus's bedroom at the moment. Hinata was in bliss, as she was being ed passionately by Malgus, who had entered the room, and instantly began this makeout session like he was possessed. Not that Hinata even minded, as she was shocked at first, then ecstatic at this happening once more, and this was not some cruel dream her mind played countless nights when she thought he was lost forever. The Sith Lord had already removed most of her clothing until Hinata was only in her undergarments and it wasn't long before those fell to the floor with the two of them falling on the bed to continue this further. Hinata soon wished her lover to be without his clothing too, as she used her own skilled hands to remove what Malgus has on, and looked at the man with lust in her eyes. Indeed, the man had a body fit for a warrior, whether he was a shinobi of a village, or a Sith Lord ruling his expanding Sith Empire that would one day cover the entire world. She returned his passion with her own, calling out his Sith name, as she had accepted that his old name was no longer suited for him anymore while calling him Veridun, and even Malgus when they were like this. His hands groped her impressive bust, as he had the Hyuga woman's neck, knowing the spot there would make the woman get even hotter under the sheets they already were, and the Sith Lord loved how Hinata called out his name. Like Alina, he knew what part of her female body to touch, to caress with his hands, and where the sweet spots where that got both women to become putty under his passionate touches. He thrust his erection into Hinata's womanhood, feeling it enter her with ease from the wetness there already to help him along, and the woman below him holding onto him like he was her lifeline. He kept thrusting into Hinata again and again without stopping his rhythm while the woman called out his name with each thrust. Who am I to you Hinata? Tell me who I am to you said Malgus into her ear and felt her legs wrap around his waist. My lover, my master, and my everything, said Hinata, as she felt the pleasure within her rising, and was going to explode soon. Correct, said Malgus, as he sped up his thrusting, and finally came with Hinata doing the same with her cries echoing throughout the room. It was music to the Sith Lord's ears. I love you, said Hinata into the Sith Lord's ear. I know, I do too, said Malgus as he felt the woman's joy increase further at his words, and held on to him like she was afraid this was a dream. I don't want this to be a dream. Tell me this is real, please, said Hinata begged, as she feared even now that this was a dream, and would wake up without him. Alone, this isn't a dream, it's real, I'm real, here with you in this bed, and I can prove it too, said Malgus, as he ed her neck again, and gave a small thrust forward with Hinata letting out a gasp of pleasure. Prove it to me my love, please, begged Hinata into his ear and could almost see the ear-splitting grin on the Sith Lord's face. With pleasure, said Malgus before he was once again resuming their love-making. With Alina sometime later, did you have fun, said Alina with a hint of jealousy in her voice to Malgus when he went to see her after cleaning up from making love to the Hyuga woman. Very much so. Just like I do with you when the two of us are lying together in our bed making love, remember? Said Malgus, as he wrapped his arms around her slim waist, and sensed her relax in his arms. I remember. Though I fear one day you won't and leave me for that woman, said Alina before she gasped in pleasure at feeling a gentle hand caress one of her tails. Never, I desire both of you. Neither one will win over the other when it comes to favor with me. 
Both of you are exotic, beautiful, smart, loyal, and strong. I would be a fool to do such a thing and we both know I am anything but a fool, said Malgus into her ear and she shivered slightly once more under his touch. Make love to me, please, said Alina wanting him to prove it right now once and for all. As you wish, said Malgus, as he locked all the doors to the room using the force, and began to disrobe the woman of her clothing while she did the same to him. He loved how the women in his life brought out his passion. Akatsuki HQ days later, so the rumors are true. This new threat Darth Malgus is in fact the Kayubi Jinchuriki Uzumaki Naruto, said Pain seeing Itachi Bo slightly to indicate his answer was a yes. Yes, though from what I understand, the Kayubi vessel is much stronger than we could hope to imagine, and his forces are more advanced than anything we've ever seen, said Itachi, as he didn't like this new outcome, and it was making him nervous even if he did not show on his face. Yes. That was made perfectly clear when Rice Country was wiped out and Orochimaru along with it from what we've heard on the matter, said Conan seeing the other members of the Akatsuki becoming nervous. How do we handle this then? Said Sasori knowing they just couldn't walk into Wave and take the Sith Lord like they did with Sabaku no Gara. We must prepare for the inevitable. The Kayubi Jinchuriki was Orochimaru's enemy and the man was killed soon upon Darth Malgus's return. We are also his enemy and will no doubt have to face him soon or be destroyed, said Itachi while the others looked at him and pain narrowed his eyes slightly at Itachi. How do you know he will strike us soon? said pain while sensing Itachi twitching a bit, which was unlike him, and made the other members go on edge when he didn't answer right away. Itachi, said Kisame seeing the Uchiha sigh. I'm sorry, I have no choice said Itachi from his position before the area around them deep underground within the village shook violently from the bombardment above. What the hell is that? said Didera with concern before looking at Itachi seeing the Uchiha shake slightly. It's the Sith Empire. They've come to kill us, said Itachi simply. And you brought them here, traitor? said Hidan angrily at Itachi. As I said, I had no choice, said Itachi before the ceiling above broke open and a large metallic orb fell to the ground in the middle of the group. That can't be good, thought Kisame before the projection appeared from the top of the orb to reveal the face of Darth Malgus. Or as they knew him as Uzumaki Naruto, hello everyone. I take it you're all surprised to see me, or rather you're surprised to see me via projection from this droid. Now many of you are wondering why Itachi betrayed you and I'm sure he's told you already he had no choice. That much is true, you see, I had the Uchiha clan murderer here abducted in secret before this little meeting, and had a special tracking device attached to the back of his neck with a small explosive device implanted into his section connecting the head to the rest of the body. No matter what he does, the Uchiha is going to die, and when I told him his little brother's current medical condition was unfixable. Well he just folded to my whims, said Malgus with an amused look on his projected face. If you really think we will go down easily like Orochimaru did, then you're mistaken, and we'll take a hundred of your soldiers down for every single one of us that falls. Said Pain seeing Malgus turn his head to him. Oh really, how can you do that, when the bomb as droid is about to explode in the next five seconds? Said Malgus with the droid revealing the countdown to them. Run, said Kakuzu, but even as he spoke that single word, the countdown had reached three, and went to two before reaching one. You can't, said Malgus just before the timer reached zero and the massive explosion from the droid that followed consumed them all. Sith Pyramid Throne Room with Malgus. And now there is one. Right, Uchiha Madara? Said Malgus looking to his right and saw the Uchiha appear from the shadows with a scowl on his face no longer covered by the orange swirling mask with the one eye. You sensed me. Impressive, said Madara seeing Malgus rise from his throne before walking down it. Difficult not to, your foul Uchiha stench is not something one can ignore, said Malgus with a smirk on his face and Madara scowled further. So my pet has been talking about me. I'll have to punish him after he's extracted from your body, said Madara seeing Malgus ignite his lightsaber. You're assuming you'll succeed in extracting him. Such a crude plan I sense you have been wanting to rule this world. Is that how you feel? Knowing that the only way to make the world yours is to put it under an infinite genjutsu. How pathetic, said Malgus seeing Madara snarl in fury. You know nothing, said Madara drawing his sword. Don't I, your thoughts betray you, so do your feelings on the matter. 
You wish to pull some grand illusion where everyone is ruled by you, as if you were a god, and we both know such a way to rule is shallow at best. Hollow at the very worst, said Malgus seeing the Uchiha activate his Sharingan eyes while charging his sword with chakra. What does it matter so long as I rule over everyone in the world? An Uchiha like myself should be worshipped like a god. Why be Hokage of Konoha when you can be a god of the entire world? said Madara seeing Malgus grin and surprisingly nod his head. I agree, why be Hokage of a single village? Such a village is small compared to the rest of the world and even then you'd spend most of the day doing paperwork. Though you're aiming to be a god, that's absurd, you have no idea what's beyond this planet, of just how much of a small fry you are compared to the rest of the galaxy and the universe as a whole. But you will learn soon enough before your end here today, I promise you that, said Malgus seeing Madara chuckle. You foolish Uzumakis and your promises. When will you learn? Don't make promises you can't keep, said Madara, as he charged forward, but was stopped when the floor glowed suddenly with a seal design beneath them, and found himself getting weaker by the second. You think I'd give you the honor of fighting me in a one-on-one -on -one battle to the death? You are unworthy of such an honor. One of my many powers I command, is the ability to see the future and turn things around in my favor should the vision not be to my liking. In my most recent vision before my troops went to aim to wipe out your organization, I saw you come here, and fight me to a point where you were going to lose. However, you chose to flee from battle at the end, and killed one of my two lovers in cold blood just to spite me. So I had to prepare this room for the inevitable arrival of your uninvited form and with a little help from another seal master I was able to create this little number said Malgus seeing Madara looking around to see just how complex the seal really was. This seal, it's too advanced for Jiraiya of the Sanin to make. Only an, an Uzumaki seal master could make this and with years of experience in the sealing arts. Something you don't have, so who? Dot who helped you? Said Madara before hearing footsteps behind him and turned to see to his surprise the one Uzumaki that he never suspected was alive. That would be me said Kashina with an expressionless mask on her face. Impossible, said Madara in surprise. No, not impossible. It took some soul-searching, but my mother realized the error of her ways, and as much as she secretly hates what I have become as her son. Dot she hates you a whole lot more for setting it all in motion years ago. Besides, she finds my way of ruling this world as much better than yours, and has chosen the lesser of two evils to take it over. Isn't that right? Mother, said Malgus seeing the woman nod, but still kept her face from showing emotions, and saw Madara was aging in the shrinking seal that surrounded the second to last Uchiha alive. What does this seal do? said Madara finding himself becoming old and grey. When I told my mother of my vision of the future, she was gracious enough to tell me everything I need to know about those pathetic thieving Sharingan eyes of yours. That it they are your strength and at the same time they are your weakness. They grant you the so-called immortality, the others claim to possess with their powers and I knew that without them, dot you would die, said Malgus seeing Madara was shriveling up. You won't, won't win against me, I outlasted the Shodime when everyone thought he won in our fight for the right to be Hokage. I weakened the Shinobi villages, I unleashed the Kayubi on Konoha to kill the Yandaimi Hokage, who was your father, and I will kill you too, said Madara before falling forward while gasping for air. Unlikely. Soon you will fade away into death's cold embrace, as all of us do when we become one with the Force, said Malgus seeing Madara crying out in agony before he crumpled fully on the ground dead and his body turning into a dry husk in the process. I trust my actions in helping you with the seal proves my loyalty to you, my son, said Kashina seeing Malgus looking at her and deactivated his lightsaber. Indeed it has, I still sense conflict in you though, I sense. Dot you wish me to stop being the dark lord of the Sith that I currently am. You want me to, show mercy, and to Konoha no less, said Malgus snarling at the end while his mother flinched and took a step back. They deserve to be given a chance at redemption, said Kashina seeing Malgus sneer further at her words. Never, you want me to be humble, merciful, even Jedi-like to them. After all the crap I went through in my childhood, you really expect me to just shrug it off? and not feel the hatred that burns in my blood. How many beatings did you endure at their hands? 
How many times as a child did you have to find some cold dark place to stay when it rained while everyone else went inside to their nice warm homes? How many times did you have to eat out of the trash of others because no one would serve you food? If you can't answer me, then I'll do it for you, and say the answer is zero. Said Malgus while seeing his mother look away from him. Your father would have shown mercy, said Kashina at last before being forced pushed hard into a wall and held there by Malgus. And if they abused you like they did me, my father would have burned that village to the ground, and everyone in it. Do not presume to tell me things about my father and try to see from such a naive point of view like yours, said Malgus before he stopped using the force and let his mother fall to the ground. Not everyone in the village are monsters. Even you can sense that much, said Kashina while her Sith Lord for a son let out a cruel chuckle. Oh I know that mother. Which is why I'm going to offer those people worthy of being spared my wrath one chance to join me. If they refuse, they die. Said Malgus seeing Kashina flinch away from his gaze. You're cruel, said Kashina sadly while Malgus just scoffed at her. If anything, I'm being merciful mother. If I wanted to be cruel, I would order my troops to crush the leaf, and show no mercy altogether, said Malgus before ordering two of his guards to escort his mother out of the throne room. She'll come around Kit, give her time, said Kayubi sensing his host's emotions about his mother asking him to be nicer. I hope so Kayubi, for both our sakes, thought Malgus while Kayubi raised an eyebrow at him. Does this mean you'll actually kill your own mother if she doesn't stay loyal to you? Said Kayubi before sensing several negative emotions swarming around the Sith Lord. You know what I had planned to do with Alina on Coruscant had Haku's presence not interfered, thought Malgus seeing the Kayubi nod at seeing the memory. Indeed I do Kit, still, you are better than that and I say hold off on that option unless it's absolutely necessary, said Kayubi seeing Malgus nod. Perhaps you're right Kayubi, even a Sith Lord can't kill his own mother, right? Thought Malgus seeing the fox was silent for a moment. I don't know Kit, maybe, if the Sith Lord is cruel enough. Still, you have your warrior honor, and it doesn't suit you to kill family. That's what an Uchiha would do and you are not an Uchiha said Kayubi seeing the Sith Lord sigh while rubbing his head in thought. I'll deal with my mother later at the appropriate time Kayubi. Right now, I need to figure out my next plan, and who I should strike out against now that the Akatsuki organization is gone, thought Malgus seeing the Kayubi close its eyes in thought for a moment before they opened. I think for the moment, you should halt your conquest until after meeting with the Spring Daimyo, and make contact with Sabaku no Gara. As a former Jinchuriki and the only one still alive after losing Shukaku he will prove to be a valuable ally, said Kayubi seeing the Sith Lord consider that option. She is arriving in the next couple of days, thought Malgus seeing the fox nod. She will want to know where you've been. What happened to you all those years ago when you went missing? Tell the tale of the poor abused boy from the leaf, who was my vessel, and how you became greater than anything Konoha would let him be if he had stayed. Make yourself out to be the victim and tell how you rose above it in such a way she will agree to anything you ask of her, said Kayubi seeing Malgus grin. Thanks for the idea Kayubi. I'll remember that, thought Malgus before fading from his mindscape while the Kayubi just smirked. You wish to rule over this planet and forge your own Sith Empire beyond this one kit. Together we will create something grand that will last well beyond anything the galaxy has ever seen said Kayubi while looking forward to the following days. Darth Malgus watched from his window of the throne room, as he sat in his royal chair watching the airship with Princess Koyuki in it descending off in the distance, and the small fleet with her being redirected to another landing platform. He began to wonder what she would say to him upon their meeting. What she thought of his attack on two different places and crushing them both without mercy. Would she understand? Would she see him as some kind of monster now like others no doubt did? Maybe. Still, she had wished for this meeting, and Malgus wasn't going to deny an old friend after so many years apart. My lord, the daimyo from Spring Country has just arrived, and is walking with two of her samurai bodyguards into the pyramid, said one of his Sith officers in the calm. Towers. Good. See to it she is brought here and treat them with respect, said Malgus into the calm on his throne before turning it off. Do you want either of us here with you when she arrives? Said Hinata, as she along with Alina walked into the room, and saw Malgus turn the throne around to face them. 
Of course. Why wouldn't I? Said Malgus while smiling down at them before walking down the steps until he was just a few feet away. Her bodyguards will be frightened from seeing my appearance, said Alina seeing the Sith Lord's eyes narrow. Let them. Their opinions mean nothing to me. I love you Alina. That is all that really matters, said Malgus seeing Alina smile and looked to Hinata to see her nod. She's almost here, said Hinata having focused her eyes on the spring daimyo. Good said Malgus before his servants came in with a table, chairs, plates, and other necessities for the inevitable meal that would come during the negotiations. When Koyuki arrived in his throne room, she wore her best regal clothing, and headdress to signify her royal position. The two samurai bodyguards wore green armor with spring country's symbol on their armored shoulders, and swords at the ready at their waist. They were hesitant to be here, as they sensed the dark energies this building generated, which was a lot considering it was specifically designed to do just that, and they sometimes saw hallucinations for a few seconds on their way into the throne room. The Spring Country Daimyo did too, but unlike her samurai bodyguards, the woman had made peace with the demons of her past, and had a much stronger will than years ago before meeting the Sith Lord when he was a boy. When entering the throne room, Koyuki saw Malgus sitting at a long dinner table of rectangular shape, and rose to properly greet her. Behind Malgus, she noticed the form of Hayuga Hanada, who Koyuki recognized if only by reputation of being one of the few main family members of the Hayuga clan out in the field, and on the other side of the Sith Lord was a blue-skinned woman with two tentacle-like things instead of hair. The Spring Country Daimyo clearly sensed her two bodyguards go on edge, as they had never seen anything like the woman before, and no doubt wondered what she was. Was she even human? Still, if this woman is with Naruto, then she must be strong, and the fact Hinata isn't uncomfortable around her must mean something. Right, thought Koyuki, as she met the Sith Lord halfway, and shook his hand while seeing Malgus was smiling a genuine smile at her. Koyuki, it has been too long, said Malgus before in the back of her hand and saw the woman smile at him. Roughly five whole years, you've grown much since I last saw you Naruto. Or should I call you by your rumored name? Darth Malgus, was it? said Koyuki seeing the Sith Lord smile further. Veridun Malgus is my new name actually. Darth is more of a title to signify myself as a Dark Lord of the Sith, said Malgus seeing the samurai tense at the mentioning he was a Dark Lord. I see, I'm afraid I don't understand since I've never heard of the Sith. Perhaps you could help educate me on the matter, said Koyuki hearing the Uzumaki Sith Lord chuckle at her. Of course, perhaps over something to eat. Nothing helps diplomatic talks more than the food in one's belly, said Malgus, as he saw her nod, and knew the trip over had been a bit draining. I agree, the trip was draining, said Koyuki, as she sat down at one end of the table, and Malgus did the same on the other while servants appeared from the sides of the room to help in the dispensing of the exotic foods around them. I hope the food is to your liking. As you can see, it's not from this world, but it is good, and is not harmful in any way said Malgus, as he saw Koyuki try some of the meat from Naboo first, then fruit plucked from forests of Mandalore, and finally taste the Alderaan wine he acquired during the conquest prior to burning that one city down right before his defeat at the hands of Revan's successor. Her bodyguards wished to taste everything beforehand, but Koyuki would have nothing of it, as she trusted the Sith Lord to be honest with her, and not poison the food given. He had already sampled some before she did, which proved in the woman's mind that it was not poisoned, and that his intentions were honorable. It's delicious. I've never tasted anything like this, said Koyuki while Malgus drank some of his own wine. Indeed, I've learned that the best tasting foods are not all located on a single planet, said Malgus before he told her of other worlds, where he had gone, and the battles waged in the war with the Republic while fighting for the old Sith Empire. I had no idea that there was so much beyond this world, said Koyuki but in a way the ruler of Spring Country had suspected the ships in Malgus's fleet were advanced enough for it, and had experienced more than she could possibly imagine. There is so much more than this world could possibly imagine. I have seen such things with my own eyes. Alina here was once a slave to a cruel master before I freed her to become my lover, said Malgus while moving his hand to take Alina's and saw Koyuki blush at that statement. Well, Dot she is very beautiful and her blue skin has an exotic look that could turn the heads of almost any man, said Koyuki while seeing her guards were still eyeing Alina with a great degree of caution. 
Thank you ruler of spring country. My race of people, particularly the females of my race are known for their exotic skin colors, and beauty to match our figures, said Alina while loving the feel of Malgus's hand caressing hers. Lord Malgus, if I may be more direct in terms of these talks, I wish to know about your plans for your country, and what it could mean for mine. Said Koyuki seeing Malgus let go of Alina's hand and focus back on her. As you know, my empire is strong, but it cannot remain stagnant, and unmoving for that is how empires die. What I desire Koyuki, is to unite this world under my empire, and I need your help to do it, said Malgus seeing Koyuki frown in her bodyguards tense. How do you need my help Lord Malgus? said Koyuki seeing the Sith Lord slowly rise after finishing a portion of his meal and sipping some more wine. I need your country, I need to annex it into my Sith Empire, said Malgus seeing Koyuki gasp and her bodyguards draw their swords. Alina and Hinata remained unmoving from their positions. My country, the very country you freed from my uncle's tyranny. Why, said Koyuki before standing up and seeing Malgus slowly take a few steps towards her. Stay back dark creature, you may have been our country's hero once, but you've fallen from that grace, and we will strike you down. Said one of Koyuki's bodyguards to her right. I don't want to cause you harm Koyuki. I won't in fact, however, if your two guards don't sheathe their weapons, I will kill them, and it will be painful, said Malgus seeing the two samurai getting ready to strike. No, stop it, lower your weapons, both of you said Koyuki seeing them look at her and then at Malgus. But Koyuki-sama, said the one to her left, sheathe your blades, both of you, Lord Malgus is merely asking me for something I have yet to have a reason in giving to him. I want to hear what he has to say that would make me consider his request, said Koyuki seeing them look at her now like she was crazy. But my lady, he is a dark creature of the abyss, and cannot be trusted any more, said the bodyguard to her right. You have both been against this meeting since I appointed you as my bodyguards for this mission. Be silent, said Koyuki with authority in her voice that spoke of no more arguing. Thank you for hearing me out Koyuki. I trust by the time you hear what I have to say you will agree with the idea, said Malgus before he motioned for her to come closer and to walk with him. She accepted. My country means everything to me Lord Malgus. You taught me that years ago, said Koyuki as she walked with him out of the throne room to a glass-covered balcony, and saw it was reinforced with a strange energy field. I know I did, you've embraced my teachings well. However, times are changing once more, and the problem here lies in the divided state this world has become in my absence. Think about it Koyuki, look at this world before and after I left it for the stars. What was it like, everyone on this planet was divided, fighting amongst each other over silly old grudges regarding occurrences centuries old, killing their neighbors for more power, and showing no unity as a species. I've seen other planets with less intelligent beings on them that have more civility to each other than this one, said Malgus seeing Koyuki nodding in some form of understanding. So you wish to unite this world under your empire? Said Koyuki seeing Malgus smile further. Exactly, and it's not like the world won't benefit. Look at my empire as it is now. Can't you see what the world will be like under my rule? The elderly will live longer, the minds of the people will grow stronger, their bodies will be healthier, and the children will grow up to take what I have to the next level, said Malgus seeing Koyuki still being hesitant over the idea of giving him spring country. And you can provide those things for my people once spring country is yours, said Koyuki seeing Malgus nod. Yes, I've already done it with the people here in wave country. Didn't you see all the people from your airship? They are happier, healthy, smarter, and stronger than they've ever been. I can do the same to your people too. Everything that Spring Country has, I can make even better using my technology, and bringing about a new era of greatness, said Malgus, as he wanted her to see what the world would be like under his rule, and how he could make it great under his Sith Empire. What about me? I don't mind making movies again. In fact, I still do make them but I am the ruler of spring country, and it would wrong of me to just let you have it even if the advances you claim are made there, said Koyuki while Malgus just laughed. I never intended to take you away from your rightful position in ruling spring country Koyuki. Merely, altering the title a bit to show everyone that while you are still its ruler, I am yours, and that what is yours, is mine. Said Malgus seeing the woman not liking that part. 
And what about the other rulers of their respectful countries? I imagine not everyone is inclined to think the way you do in this matter, said Koyuki seeing Malgus sigh and look away from her. To be honest Koyuki, I'm being particularly nice when handling this world in terms of conquering it, and only because it is my home planet. With my large fleet of ships, the weapons they have, I could wipe out everyone on this planet, and start from scratch, I don't because of the people I know here, who I am hoping will help, and not turn against me like so many others have in the past. I am offering your people so much and all I ask in return is for their loyalty and trust. Already, the threat of Orochimaru, and the Akatsuki organization have been removed from this world thanks to me, said Malgus still seeing the unease Koyuki was having with the idea of the Sith Lord. People don't want to be ruled by a tyrant Lord Malgus, said Koyuki seeing Malgus sigh yet again. I may be a dark lord of the Sith, I may be something dark, but I am not without my honor, and I rule my empire with a firm yet fair hand. Wave country is proof of it, said Malgus with an intensity in his eyes that almost made Koyuki almost take a step back. I know, I have seen it, but you can't just expect me to hand over my country to you. It would be irresponsible of me as its ruler, said Koyuki seeing Malgus smile slightly. I know, I simply asking you to inform them of it. Tell them what it is I want and what they get in return for being a part of my empire because of it, said Malgus seeing the woman look away from his piercing eyes. And if they don't want to, said Koyuki while dreading this question. I really don't want to answer that question Koyuki. I don't want to take your country and your people by force. I can and I will do that should things not turn out the way I want here with these talks about spring country's future under my rule, said Malgus seeing Koyuki looking out the window, seeing the massive fleet of ships flying all around her, and the different construction projects they were working on. I need time to think about this. Can you give me that? said Koyuki seeing Malgus nod his head yes. Of course, you have three days. I have ordered rooms be prepared for you and your two guards to rest in while ordering a guide be assigned to show all three of you around wave country. I want you to see just how great my empire has become here and what it would mean if this world was under my rule, said Malgus, as he took her hand, and at the back of it with a smile on his face while using the force to give the subtle nudge to the woman's mind to think it over within his home. A tour would be nice. At least that way I can know what to expect while considering the offer and tell others what I've seen that would make them consider it too, said Koyuki seeing Malgus smile grow. You won't be disappointed my lady, said Malgus, as he walked with her back to the throne room, and saw everyone was waiting for them. We are staying here tonight and will take a tour of wave country to see what the Sith Empire has to offer us, said Koyuki to her two bodyguards while they eyed the Sith Lord with caution. Is that a wise decision Koyuki-sama? said one of her bodyguards while unsure of how to handle this new development. Yes, Malgus wishes for us to see the greatness of the Sith Empire and what he wishes to share with our people in return for Spring Country. If I am impressed during my three days here, I will return to Spring Country to address the people, and share with them what I've seen so they can understand that such a transference will be the best for everyone, said Koyuki turning to see Malgus and the Sith Lord gave an appreciative nod to her. Two of my men will show you to your rooms, said Malgus, as he motioned for two Sith knights to come forward, and escort them out. Are you sure this is wise my love? said Alina seeing Malgus shrug. Maybe, maybe not, doesn't matter, having the willing praise of a daimyo will make things easier when the time comes to make the same request of the other leaders, said Malgus simply. And if the others refuse? said Hinata seeing Malgus walk up to his throne and sit down on it while staring at her with burning Sith eyes. Simple my dear sweet Hyuga lover, we wipe out all who would oppose this change in the world. All of them, said Malgus darkly knowing there was a time to show restraint and a time to unleash one's fury. No doubt Konoha will want to hold out since the people there won't surrender you for what is sealed inside your body, said Alina walking up the steps to his throne and sat comfortably on his lap. Much to Hanada's irritation, that will be a campaign I will lead personally, said Malgus before ing her on the lips. And I will be right beside you, said Alina with Hanada sitting on the opposite side. And so will I, said Hanada seeing the Twi'lek's surprised look. Why, said Alina with narrowed eyes, to ensure those worthy of our lover's mercy receive it. There are some in Konoha, who are worthy, and should be given the chance my love, 
said Hinata before in him with an intense passion that she knew Malgus loved to experience. If you say so, I'll trust your judgment when the time comes Hinata. However, if I sense any of them would betray me, they will die, and the order will not be overturned. Do you understand? said Malgus seeing Hinata nod in understanding. Of course my love, your word is law, said Hinata before she ed him again while letting her thoughts invade his mind so he knew what she wanted next. Really, in that case, I order you both to come with me to the bedroom, and not leave my side for many hours, said Malgus lustfully at the two women. My lord, said Alina, as she felt him wrap his arm around her waist, and had done the same with Hinata. If you two are really going to bond as my lovers and sharing my bed then this is for the best, said Malgus while groping Hinata's rear and got the woman to let out an eep. For his efforts, it was going to be three long days before Malgus saw Spring Daimyo Koyuki and the Sith Lord was going to enjoy every single hour of each day with his two women. Gara, I'm not sure this is a good idea, said Konkuro, as he saw his younger brother and older sister get ready to depart to wave country or the Sith Empire, as it was now called by the Spring Daimyo upon her return to her country before making the shocking announcement that Darth Malgus was Uzumaki Naruto and their long-lost hero. The news had sent the people into a frenzy of love for the lost hero, who had helped free them from the cruel oppressor that was Dodo, and had gone so far to chant the Sith's new name. Koyuki had told of her experience in Wave, as she was given a tour of the Sith Empire, what it had to offer and wished to extend the offer of such wonders to the people of Spring Country. In exchange for being absorbed into the Sith Empire. At first, many were surprised by this, some were even unsure how to respond to this, as they loved their current ruler, and didn't want to traitor her for another. Even if this was their lost hero, as they didn't want to change things since everything for them was going smoothly, but Koyuki had stated should this event come to pass with the blessing of the people, she would still be its ruler in his stead to ensure the people of Spring were happy, and content under the rule of the Sith Empire. Three weeks after the announcement, people of Spring were still debating the matter, and could not get a solid majority to support the transition. I have not seen Naruto for quite some time Konkuro. I wish to see my long-lost friend. A friend I have not seen for over half a decade, said Gara as he walked with Tamari out the door to the awaiting transport provided by the Sith Empire given the length of time it would take to travel without such means, and the Sith Lord himself also wished to see his old friend. Darth Malgus had stated as such in a messenger droid sent to the case cage a few days ago. But what about the rumors? What if he's changed? What if he's really an enemy now? Said Konkuro seeing Gara turn to look at him. I would rather meet my end at Naruto's hands than at of any other enemy Konkuro said Gara before headed to the transport's ramp and walked into it with Tamari right beside him. I was afraid he'd say that, thought Konkuro seeing the technological transport take to the air and move faster than anything he'd ever seen before to the east towards Wave. Sith Temple Throne Room, Gara, my old friend, said Malgus walking towards the case cage and shaking the man's hand with a smile on his face. Naruto, or should I call you Darth Malgus now, said Gara as he was unsure how to address the Sith Lord, and didn't wish to offend the man. Malgus will do. How have you been Gara? I heard the Akatsuki took Shukaku out of you, said Malgus, as he motioned for his old friend to walk with him, and the trio were soon walking outside where a luscious garden was growing before them. I have been well. After my capture, I was saved surprisingly by Leaf Shinobi, and the grandmother of one of the Akatsuki members sent to kidnap me said Gara before retelling how the elderly woman saved him by sacrificing her life for him. I see. If it's any comfort, I had all the Akatsuki members recently killed, and Orochimaru too as you've no doubt heard, said Malgus seeing Gara smile at that. I heard Aim Village was destroyed. So that's where they were hiding. Thank you for that Malgus. You've avenged every Jinchuriki that fell by their hands. Do you still carry? said Gara seeing Malgus nod. Kayubi. Yes. That has not changed, said Malgus while Tamari was still eyeing him for a few more seconds before he faced her with a raised eyebrow. Not to be rude in my bluntness, but we were king of told that your facial appearance was less than, pleasant looking, and yet it's, well it's not. Said Tamari while Gara scowled at her for being somewhat rude. Malgus just laughed, you can thank Hayuga Hanada for that when you see her. 
My seal was damaged by the Uchiha when we fought and only after she healed the area around my seal was I able to repair it so the fox could work his power on me, said Malgus seeing the surprised look on both their faces. The Kayubi healed you willingly, said Gara while Malgus just smirked. He felt after roughly five years of surviving without him in life and death situation I had earned a chance to bring my body back to peak performance, said Malgus while looking over the balcony to see some of his troops doing outside training exercises. So you earned it through a tribute of warfare, said Tamari while Malgus just shrugged. Unknowingly, yes, said Malgus simply. So how strong are you now? said Gara, as he had heard the rumors of his old friend's powers, and had yet to see to believe it. You really want to know? Follow me please, said Malgus with a smile on his face, as headed towards the elevator system, and the trio went to the lower levels before they got into hover transport that took them to the Sith Academy. When they entered the building, the Sabaku siblings saw countless students wearing Sith apprentice clothes, some wearing armor plating, and were busy getting to class. However, Upon seeing their Sith Emperor standing in their presence, the students and the teachers stopped what they were doing before kneeling in his presence. Commanding all of them to continue on with their daily routine, as he had Gara and Tamari follow him to a training room where students were training in the Sith arts. All students stand at attention. We have a special guest here today. Our Sith Emperor Darth Malgus has decided to visit us with two guests of his own said the Sith Academy instructor while his students stood at attention and bowing before the three of them. Today is a very special day for everyone in this room. All of you, my young Sithlings in training, and my two visiting guests behind me are going to see me in action in this very room, said Malgus while the students whispered to themselves, as they had all heard of the Sith Emperor being extremely powerful, and were going to see him in action. We are honored my Emperor. How are you going to demonstrate your mastery over the Force? said the Sith Academy instructor seeing Malgus turn to the six large orbs that were once scrap metal, each twice the size of a hover car with a great deal of weight, and now used in strengthening the young apprentices in lifting objects with the force. Something simple, yet complex would suffice using those objects over there, said Malgus pointing to the objects knowing it would impress the students. But, we can all move one of them my lord, said one student while some took an intake of air knowing that the emperor had just been spoken to out of turn. Darsa, you do not address the Sith Emperor unless he addresses you back and you have his permission to speak, said the Sith Academy instructor towards the young boy. It's all right, I understand his confusion in showing my power in the Force since lifting one is easy for a master like myself to do. However, to move all six of them easily using the Force is not easy, and requires a great deal of concentration. Each one of these dense metal orbs weighs well over several hundred if not over a thousand pounds and even a fully trained Sith Knight would have difficulty in move at least three if not more of these orbs, said Malgus before calling upon the Force and the Dark Side to lift each orb off the ground much to the amazement of the class. Are those orbs really that heavy? said Tamari to the Sith Academy instructor while the man himself watched in his own awe at the sight of Malgus's power. Absolutely. Darth Malgus takes the training of the students here at the academy very seriously. The orbs are extremely heavy. I don't let any of them move one of these unless they are properly supervised by myself and several other teachers so they don't become overtaxed. For the Emperor to move all of them at once shows a great deal of power and control over the Force, said the Sith Academy instructor while Malgus threw one into the wall while spinning the other around in different directions before slamming them down onto the ground. The students were in awe of his power and mastery over the Force. What do you think Gara? Said Malgus seeing Gara nod to indicate it was impressive. I think I would prefer you as my ally than enemy, said Gara truthfully with Malgus laughing. Fair enough. Come my old friend, let us return to the temple and discuss some things regarding Wind Country's future with the Sith Empire, said Malgus wrapping an arm over Gara before the two were leaving the room with Tamari right behind them. Hokage Tower at the moment. So the case cage is seeing Naruto as we speak, said Tsunade while Jiraiya nodded his head. My informant in Suna told me about it. Picked up Gara and his sister Tamari on one of their ships, said Jiraiya seeing the woman groan knowing it would only be a matter of time before Gara sided with Naruto. The councils want to launch an all-out sneak attack on Wave Country. Take someone hostage that Naruto would want back in exchange for something valuable we could use to make us stronger, 
said Tsunade with Jiraiya scoffing at the idea. More like for them to use against him. We both know that won't work with him, said Jiraiya seeing Tsunade looking lost at how to handle the Uzumaki for a Sith Lord. I feel conflicted Jiraiya, I care about the Gaki and yet, he's my enemy. How can I fight against him knowing that a distant relative of mine is more likely to destroy us for our past sins against him? Said Tsunade seeing Jiraiya run a hand through his hair. Honestly, I have no idea, Naruto isn't really Naruto anymore Tsunade. He's something else entirely. Though I will say this about him, in the event we are attacked, there is one thing we can expect, and that is Naruto will lead the attack himself, said Jiraiya with the female Hokage becoming sadder by this news. I know, the fire daimyo isn't pleased with how we have done things here in the leaf and wants to negotiate with Naruto to spare as many innocent lives as possible in the event we're attacked, said Tsunade seeing Jiraiya's shocked face when she handed him the message scroll given to her less than an hour ago by one of the fire daimyo's twelve guardians. I see. We're being thrown to the wolves for being bakas and all we can do is pray Naruto decides to kill only some rather than all in the villagers, said Jiraiya sadly with Tsunade nodding. Even I'm not that stupid to make a bet against the obvious, said Tsunade seeing her former teammate smirk. Nor would I encourage you to try, said Jiraiya simply. Sith Temple Throne Room, my emperor, there is something important I felt needed to be brought to your attention, said a Sith officer running one of the sectors in security. What is it? said Malvis while eating a meal with Gara, his sister, Hanada, Kashina, and Alina with the Twi'lek woman getting the usual surprise look from Tamari. Not so much from Gara since he was. Well, Gara. We had Intruder try to sneak into the temple and raid our weapons facility along with those being developed in the R&D department, said the Sith officer with Malgus now narrowing his eyes at him. What village? said Malgus seeing the officer becoming nervous under his stare. The Leaf Village, sir. They wore Anbu masks, but with the symbol of Root placed on their foreheads, said the Sith officer seeing the anger radiating off of the Sith Lord. Are they cooperating? said Malgus seeing the Sith officer shake his head no at the Sith Lord's hidden meaning behind the term cooperating, which meant painful interrogation, and Malgus wanted these to be extremely painful. No my lord, we sedated them to further study the source of their stubbornness to our questions and found seals on their tongues that link to key parts of their brains that have a means to prevent them from answering our questions, said the Sith officer before seeing Malgus rise from his seat. Gara, I must handle this myself. My apologize for leaving during our meal. Mother, if you could come with me, as I require your assistance, and expertise in breaking such seals, said Malgus seeing his mother rise from her seat before she followed her son out of the room. Estranged family? said Tamari seeing Hanada nod. Sadly yes, said Hanada knowing it wasn't hard to miss and to lie would just make things worse. Detention center, I don't want to do this Naruto. I'm not one for hurting others, said Kashina seeing her son walk ahead of him. Really, because you did a good job with it when it came to my life. These leaf shinobi were planning to raid my armory, use my empire's weapons like a hyperactive child with a sharp object, and running around wildly with it. How many lives do you think they will kill with the weapons they tried to steal? Said Malgus with Kashina raising an eyebrow at him. Not that he would see it since he was walking in front of her. And you wouldn't kill so many people with them? said Kashina challenged before she felt a restricting feeling wrap around her throat. Oh, I would kill people with these weapons. Kill the people that deserve to be killed by them. Not those that don't. You know these root fools belong to Danzo. You know what he's like, don't you? You really trust him to use advanced technological weapons that bring instant death to people properly over that of your own son said Malgus seeing Kashina had fallen to the floor while grasping for air. No, said Kashina while gasping for air before Malgus released his hold on her. Good, now get off the ground. You are my mother, my men expect you to be strong or at least show them without so much doubt that you are my mother. I sense some of them question that given how weak you are in their eyes. Prove them all wrong or else, said Malgus before walking away. Or else what? said Kashina seeing Malgus stop and turn slightly so his one eye just stared directly at hers. Or else you'll never live to become a grandmother. I'll see to it personally, said Malgus and walked away from his shocked mother. He would do it too. I could see it in his eyes, thought Kashina, as she got off the ground, 
and followed him to the last door at the end of the hall. Hokage Tower sometime later. What were you all thinking? I specifically remember the Sandame Hokage disbanding your root program and here I'm finding out you had several squads attempt a raid on the Sith Empire. Do you want Naruto to send his forces in our direction? The case cage has already ended the alliance with us after he returned to Suna. Said Tsunade to Danzo, the shinobi, and civilian council while the clan heads were frowning in agreement with her over this stupid move. We felt it was necessary to do what you were unwillingly to do. Besides, my forces will not bend to the might of the demon's interrogations, and therefore cannot pin the raid on us, said Danzo knowing his seal would keep the demon from learning about Root or that they were from the leaf. Is that what you think? That I lack the means to break your men due to the pathetic seal on their tongues keeping them from telling me their secrets? Your seal is outdated, said the hollow projected form of Darth Malgus appeared on a droid the size of a melon crashing through the window of the meeting room and hovering not far from the center table. What the, said Homura seeing the form of Darth Malgus in his Sith Lord robes and armor with the projecting making it appear like he was standing on the table. Hello grandma, it's been a long time. Is that a wrinkle I see? A gray hair, said Malgus seeing Tsunade seething at his jab about her age. Damn brat, even now he mocks my age, thought Tsunade while her inner self smashed a training dummy to pieces that looked a lot like Malgus. What do you want demon brat? We're talking about important Konoha businesses, said Kaharu seeing Malgus turn his projected face to her for a second before turning back to Tsunade. As I was saying before the old interrupted me, my time with the case cage, and old friend Sabaku no Gara was rudely interrupted by several squads of shinobi entering my Sith Empire. They were caught trying to raid my armory along with trying to steal some weapons from my R&D department that would spell disaster for this entire world if they fell into the hands of brainless fools yourselves. How dare you? You have no proof those ninja sent were leaf shinobi, said Kaharu at seeing Malgus chuckle at them. Do you even want to know how I know those shinobi are from the leaf? Simple. They're from this one's old root program, said Malgus while pointing at Danzo. You lie said Danzo seeing the Sith Lord smirk at him. Really, your root shinobi told me everything I wanted to know once each seal on their tongues were removed, said Malgus seeing Danzo's eye widen in shock. Demon propaganda, said a civilian councilman at the projected form of the Sith Lord. I see nothing has changed. You're all still as narrow-minded as you were five years ago when I almost obliterated the Uchiha from existence. How is he by the way? Succeed in siring any children from him so you can mold them into your perfect secret weapons against me. Said Malgus having his spider droids monitor the secret meetings Danzo and the councils had without the Hokage present. How does he know that? Thought Danzo knowing he had made sure the secret meetings were in fact secret from the Hokage. How many failed attempts has there been since you tried? Well over a couple hundred I think. Not surprising since the boy is more sterile down there than the hospital he's in. You can thank me for that, said Malgus before laughing at them all. Demon filth, you will pay for that action, said Homura seeing Malgus stare at him now with those piercing Sith eyes. Not today, Tsunade, make no mistake about how much I hate this village, and all those that reside in it. When I do come for all of you, there will be no mercy, no quarter given, and you will all suffer for your transgressions. Kyubi's attack nearly two decades ago will seem like the temper tantrum of a small child compared to my wrath. You were right about one thing Jiraiya, I will become to Konoha personally and I will burn it to the ground around me before I build a monument over the remains of the defeated. Said Malgus seeing the face of the people in the room go pale with fear. Naruto, please reconsider. The fire daimyo wishes to discuss a diplomatic solution to prevent unnecessary bloodshed between us said Tsunade seeing Malgus stare at her with his rage for the leaf showing in those eyes. I know he does, I got his message asking for peace. Do you know my response was to his offer? said Malgus seeing Tsunade frown. No, said Tsunade seeing Malgus chuckle at her, I thought not. I imagine he doesn't want to talk to any of you right now after I left those broken root shinobi on his doorstep with a message explaining my reasons for leaving such garbage to stink up his home. I do hope you have a good explanation for him when he asks for one. Seeing you all squabble with each other and squirming under pressure has always been something I found to be sufficient entertainment to watch on a slow day here in the Sith Empire.
said Malgus with a smile before the projection faded and the droid flew out the window to the ship far outside the village. Damn that beast! We need to find a way to destroy him, said Kaharu angrily. How? There is nothing in our arsenal that could stay his hand or even defeat him, said the civilian councilman in charge of the merchant district. Troublesome. Why didn't you morons just honor the Yandaimi's wish like you wanted? said Shikaku seeing the councils glaring at him. Watch your mouth Nara. You weren't exactly nice to the brat yourself, said Homura while seeing Shikaku shrug. And I paid for it at the hands of my wife. She actually wanted me to adopt the kid when he was still at the orphanage. Said I was being a lazy bastard for not fighting for the kid in his time of need and hit me more times with the frying pan than I care to count or even remember. Every week I came home without official adoption papers for Naruto, she'd smash my head in with one of her frying pans, and make me sleep on the couch, said Shikaku knowing he took many years of abuse like all Nara males before him until the blonde kid was old enough to have a place of his own. Damn! No wonder you took so many aspirin when you came to see me, said Inoichi, as he saw Shikaku shrug it off like it was nothing, and saw Hiyashi squirming with worry. My daughter has always been infatuated with the boy. She's turned down suitors, refused to date anyone that's asked, and never looks at anyone like she did Naruto. Now she's in his hands, doing Kami knows what, and I can't help fear for her safety, said Hiyashi, as he didn't want Hinata's heart broken by the boy should he decide her use to him was at an end and send her to Kumo in exchange for something else. I don't think so. Hanada was the only one of the rookies remotely nice to her. Even with all his rage, Naruto won't hurt Hanada, and treat her well under his care, said Jiraiya, as he saw Danzo smirk, and no doubt come up with a plan. We take her back, said Danzo finally. What? said Tsunade while looking at the old war hawk. We take Hayuga Hanada back and get whatever information about the Sith Empire we need through her. We then send the woman back in exchange for no hostile retaliation against us and pre-programmed mind command to get close to him before she kills the demon vessel. Without their Sith Emperor in charge, we can storm the area, and take what is ours, said Danzo with a grin on his face. That is out of the question, said Tsunade, but already the councils were buzzing over the idea, and soon lost control of the situation. So we are agreed. Ambush Hayuga Hanada, bring her back here and then rewrite her mind to assassinate the Kayubi Jinchuriki, said Danzo seeing the council's nod in full agreement while the clan heads and the Hokage did not. I'm sorry Naruto. I just hope you know I had no part in this, thought Tsunade, as she had to prepare for the worst case scenario, and save what she could of the leaf. You can't be serious. You want to give Wind Country over to him? said Konkuro, as he along with Baki, and soon as council stared at Gara in surprise. Tamari was by the only door watching things play out while Gara nodded to his older siblings' questions. I am. Darth Malgus has shown me a means for us to harvest water from deep within the desert sands, to provide us with exotic animals that can survive out here, and be used for all kinds of means. He's not asking the wind daimyo give up his position, as he will be considered a ruling official, but he will take orders from the Sith Emperor should they be asked of him, and so will we if commanded said Gara seeing the council sputter in outrage while Baki kept silent while trying to analyze the case cage for any kind of signs indicating mind alteration. He's not doing this out of some kind of hypnotic suggestion. Whatever this Sith Emperor has shown him is indeed genuine and Gara has always wanted to do what is best for Suna, thought Baki while seeing Tamari was the same way in supporting her youngest sibling. How can you trust him? And only after one visit that lasted a few days said Konkuro seeing Gara look at him with cold steely eyes. Because there was no lying in him. Mists Mizukage and Water Country's daimyo have already agreed to their own assimilation into the Sith Empire, said Gara like it was the most simplest thing in the world. That's not enough, Gara. if you agree to help Naruto do this, then you are on your own, and no one in this room will support it, said Konkuro seeing the other members on the council nod. Baki, what do you have to say? said Gara turning to his former Junin sensei. You are the case cage of Suna. Despite what your late father did in putting Shukaku in you as a child, I tried to be a proper Junin sensei to you given my own limitations placed upon me by your predecessor, and wished to encourage you to trust your own judgment. After Shukaku was extracted, I saw a cage worth following because he saw the path he needed to take before him, and walked it without question towards the end with the best interest of Suna at heart. 
Do you feel Sunna and Wind country overall should be annexed into the Sith Empire as the best option before us? Because if it is, if you can look me in the eyes, and swear on the souls of your predecessors that this is for the best. I will not oppose, said Baki seeing the shock of the council, Konkuro, and even Gara since it was clear to the Junin no one expected him to possibly side with the case cage. I have seen the wonders of the Sith Empire. Darth Malvis has promised me on his warrior's honor, Suna if not all of Wind Country will benefit from this assimilation into the Sith Empire, and that is why I wish for us to join him. On the souls of the previous case cages before me, I can say without a single doubt in my mind that this path before us, and our people is for the best, said Gara seeing the council glaring at him. Well I refuse to support this foolish plan this Sith has in uniting the world, said a Suna council member standing in defiance of the case cage. As do I, said another Suna council member right next to his defiant colleague. Do you all feel this way? said Gara seeing the other members with the exception of Baki rise from their seats. Even Konkuro rose with them. I am with you Gara, said Baki knowing that when he pledged to serve the case cage, it was to do so knowing that his actions were for the benefit of Suna and Wind Country in the long run. I see, Tamari, are you with me? said Gara seeing his sister nod. Always Gara, said Tamari before eyeing the shadows of the room knowing what was about to happen. Snap hiss. The sound of a lightsaber activated, followed another, then another, and several other from the shadows of the room until the whole room has was covered in a red light. What is the meaning of this? Gara, said Konkuro seeing the case cage sigh and stand before motioning Baki to follow him. The former Junin closed his eyes briefly in sympathy for what was about to happen and then obeyed the case cage without question with the door opening. Tamari walked out first, then Gara and finally Baki before an invisible-like hand shut the door behind the man with the screams of those inside soon following. Baki followed the case cage to his office, entered a secret room, clearly made recently, which was impressive since it was done under every Suna shinobi's nose, and saw Gara go over to a strange device by the far wall. A screen appeared on the wall above the device and the image of Darth Malgus appeared on it with Baki having a sudden desire to kneel in the Sith Emperor's presence. It's done said Gara with Malgus nodding. How many? said Darth Malgus before seeing Tamari beside his friend and Baki in the background. All, but one of them, said Gara seeing Malgus nod. I don't see your brother, was he one of them? said Malgus seeing Gara nod with sadness in his eyes. I gave him and the others a chance to see things your way. They wanted to oppose you, said Gara seeing Malgus nod. And fight to the bitter end. You know that cannot happen Gara. While I did not wish for you to sacrifice your family member for me, I did warn you that he would oppose my offer of your people joining the Sith Empire and bring about an end to certain water issues we both know your area of the world suffers from. Everything I told you would happen prior to Suna's liquidation of its council happened, didn't it? Said Malgus seeing Gara nod. Gara was told in advance about who would oppose him. Did he know I would side with the Sith Emperor? Thought Baki seeing Gara sigh heavily. Yes, said Gara seeing Malgus give a gentle smile at him. This must happen Gara, I will not break my promise to you. When everything is fully finalized with Wind Country being annexed into the Sith Empire, Suna will benefit more than you could ever imagine, and those that helped make the transition possible will not be forgotten, said Malgus seeing Gara nod in understanding. With your permission Malgus, I wish to have my brother not be labeled a betrayer to this transition and keep his honor, said Gara seeing Malgus nod. Of course. Family is important to you. I know that. You have my blessing, said Malgus seeing Gara nod appreciatively at him. Thank you. My emperor, said Gara bowing slightly with Tamari doing the same and Baki being the last to bow. You're welcome my friend, said Malgus before the transmission ended and the console Gara used soon powered down. You will not speak of this room to anyone Baki. I'm trusting you with this secret way to communicate with the Sith Emperor. Betray my trust. And I will kill you, said Gara, as he looked at Baki nodding quickly, and knew the man wouldn't betray him. Because Baki knew if Gara didn't kill him then the forces of the Sith Empire would. Sith Temple several days later. So they sent you. Out of all the shinobi of the leaf, I was honestly expecting squads of root shinobi to try their hand in taking Hinata away from me, and yet here they sent you of all people. How disappointing, or, perhaps you are the distraction so while my eyes are focused on you, 
The root shinobi under Donzo's command try to sneak in, and take what doesn't belong to them, said Malgus seeing the form of the woman being held by his two Sith knights while several troopers were at key angles to fire should she decide to break free. It wasn't my choice, said the woman, I know, I have proof that doesn't contradict that statement. It's actually the only reason I ordered you'd be taken alive, said Malgus, as he hit a few buttons on his throne before recording materialized between them. You want me to kidnap Hayuga Hanada from the Sith Emperor? said the female before the Hokage and the councils. This needs to be done to give us an edge over that monster. At the same time, we will have several squads try another raid, and create enough of a disturbance for you to get into the structure. Once you have the woman, bring her to the Yamanaka clan home, and Inoichi can begin the necessary measures to bring about the Sith monster's downfall, said Kaharu while seeing the woman in front of her scratch the back of her head. Look, I know you all think I'm crazy, and to an extent I am crazy. I mean, given my late sensei, as well as the crap this village put me through for being his student, I have every right to be, but I'm not that crazy, and with all due respect Hokage-sama. I think I'll pass on this mission, said the woman while seeing the council's frown. Listen here Midarashi Anko, this mission is of the utmost importance, and therefore a mission that helps the survival of the village is not one you can turn down. If you do not take this mission, you will be considered a traitor just like Orochimaru, and put to death in a public execution, said Danzo seeing Enko scowl at him. Why not get your root shinobi to do it for you? Aren't they expendable? Or is this one of those suicidal missions I'm not expected to come back from just to get rid of me out of spite for my bastard sensei? Said Enko seeing the councils glaring harder. Not that they were anything impressive. It's a mission like any other Enko-san. You will do what the village requires of you, said Homura while Anko scoffed at him. Please. You just want to get rid of me. You've been trying to for years. Sending me on one mission after another behind the Sandames and Godayami's back in the hopes I get killed or worse, said Anko seeing Tsunade's eyes narrow at this. You are out of line special Junin, said a civilian council member. So are you civilian? The only reason you're half of the governing body being here is to give the Shinobi Council more support in matters. You have no business getting involved in Shinobi affairs at all, said Enko seeing the civilian council scoff at her. We have as much at stake in your Shinobi affairs as they do. Who supplies you Shinobi with weapons? We do. Who suffers when the village gets invaded? We do. Who are the doctors and nurses that patch Shinobi up after they get injured? We are said another civilian councilwoman with pink hair. This is a shinobi village asshole. We don't need civilians. We have med nins, we have weapon specialists, and we have brains to get the best supplies around even if we have to go into a forest for it. You're all expendable, said Enko glaring at them while the fools beat their side of the table with their fists demanding she be punished. Enough, special Junin Mitarashi Enko. This mission was assigned to you because your skills are the best we have at the moment in infiltration, and have the greatest chance of completing the mission. Do you understand? said Tsunade, as she saw Anko scowl at her, and nod in reluctant agreement. I understand Hokage-sama, but it doesn't mean I have to like it, said Anko before she stormed off. That was a very interesting meeting. Wouldn't you say Anko-san? said Malgus seeing the woman look up at him. Yeah. I actually almost wish I had completed the mission just to see their faces when I returned, said Enko seeing Malgus frown at her. Actually, you wouldn't want that, as there is more to the meeting than you realize after you left the room, and concerning your future, said Malgus before continuing what the spider droid recorded. That is a threat to the leaf. She needs to be removed moments after she comes back, said Homura with Kaharu nodding in agreement. I f she comes back. Personally. I don't think her skills are adequate enough to succeed, and at best she'll become a smear on the wall. Still, in the event the woman does come back alive, and successful. I agree that she needs to be terminated, said Kaharu while Tsunade glared at the two old fools. You will do no such thing. She is a loyal Konoha shinobi, said Tsunade seeing Danzo shake his head. She is the student of the late Orochimaru. She is tainted. If we drop our guard, Anko will strike like the filthy snake she is, and must be put down before she can coil up. After the mission is a success, correction if it is a success, one of my squads will take her out, and plant evidence to make up charges of treason before we report the woman's demise, said Danzo before Tsunade slammed her fist down. 
you will do not such thing. I forbid it, said Tsunade seeing Danzo scowl at her. This is out of your hands Hokage-sama. This special order was made by the Sandame Hokage himself in the event he was wrong about her. We have every right to use it, said Homura seeing Tsunade looking at the special order he brought out to show that in the event they thought Anko was too dangerous to be kept alive in the service of Konoha that she was to be secretly terminated effective immediately. And as the rest they say, is history my dear, said Malgus seeing Anko looking furious at the recording of those in the leaf she had sworn to serve ordering her death after successfully completing the mission to kidnap Hayuga Hanada. Bastards. I knew it. I knew deep down they would pull this, but, I never thought the Sandame Hokage himself had pre-made the order, and the current Hokage would be powerless to stop it, said Anko before she started to break down in front of Malgus and just could hold back the tears forming around her eyes. Sadly yes. You know how much the snake Sanin hurt the old man. No doubt when the Sandame Hokage saw you, the fear of what you may become crept into his mind, and knew it was better to be safe than sorry. What if I offered you a place here within my Sith Empire? What if I offered you a chance to get your revenge? Would you take it? Said Malgus seeing Enko's hands clench into fists, then open up, and close again into fists. I would. I would take it. I would unleash all my rage, fury, and wrath upon them for this act of betrayal, said Anko, as her emotions flooded the room through the force, and the Sith Lord along with his Sith Knights fed off of it. Then I will grant it. Release her, said Malgus seeing the Sith Knights look at him for a second before doing as commanded while the Sith troopers lowered their weapons. You're going to accept me into your empire? Just like that? said Anko seeing Malgus rise from his throne and walk down towards her. Of course. It wasn't your fault they betrayed you my dear. How many missions have you gone on in the hopes of proving your loyalty? How many times have the people in the village you defend spit on the ground when walking by them because of your past with the late Orochimaru? Fight for me without question. Fight for the Sith Empire and you will never be hated here, said Malgus before extending a hand to Anko, who took it, and was quickly picked up off the ground. I pledge my loyalty to the Sith Empire and to you, my emperor said Anko bowing her head in his presence. Welcome to the Sith Empire and new life Mitarashi Anko. As in accordance with your new life here, I am appointing you a special position that only an elite few know about, and only an elite few can join. You shall become a solo agent that can infiltrate target locations and kill targets assigned to you. You will become, my hand, said Malgus seeing Anko blink at the strange title. Your hand? said Enko wondering if this was some kind of galactic title given to his future concubines or something. Yes. Specifically, the complete title would be Emperor's Hand, which means you are an extension of myself, and my will when called upon to enforce the power of the Empire. You will infiltrate, assassinate, and destroy designated targets I assign to your position to handle. When you aren't on secret missions, your job will be torturing, and interrogating prisoners of the Sith Empire using all the skills in your arsenal. Few will know of your standing here in the Empire, but they will know it is high up, and you report only to the Emperor. Me, do you object to this new position of power? Said Malgus seeing Anko thinking it over in his head. It actually doesn't sound so bad. I get to do what I did in the leaf, but with bigger, and better toys. Plus, I'm not going to be glared at by every single person around me. I'm in. Said Anko with Malgus letting out a chuckle. Excellent news. And to prove yourself, I have the perfect prisoners for you to take your hate, and anger out on, said Malgus before motioning his troops to bring in the prisoners and Anko's face beamed brightly like she had just gotten a once in a lifetime coupon for all you can eat dango for exactly 24 hours. You mean I get to hurt Rude Shinobi? Donzo's Rude Shinobi? said Anko seeing Malgus nod. We removed the seals on their tongues and prepared your own special room for this with imperial trainees assigned to learn from you. Have fun my dear, said Malgus seeing the woman squeal like a high school girl and bouncing around with joy. This woman is crazy, thought all the Sith knights in the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you, said Anko before a Sith trooper handed her an imperial uniform. Something to wear while serving me. You can keep your trench coat or get a new one to go with the uniform, said Malgus, as he was glad Alina and Hanada weren't here right now since they would possibly think he was getting a harem together. Nice material, get me a trench coat of similar color and I'll look so badass, said Anko with a grin while picturing how she looked while standing on a pile of root shinobi, 
as she laughed loudly at being the queen of interrogation, and torture with countless people under her command bowing at her greatness. Kayubi. Do you think having Enko in the Sith Empire is perhaps too cruel for my future prisoners? Thought Malgus seeing the fox think about it for a second. No, said Kayubi simply. Okay. Just checking, thought Malgus before motioning two of his Sith troops in the room to come forward to show Anko to her temporary room where she could get settled in and changed into her new attire. And these rude shinobi my lord, said a Sith knight standing next to one of them. Take them to Anko's new interrogation room and watch over them until she's ready to begin extracting information out of them, said Malgus before his forces did as ordered. It's almost time, isn't it Naruto? said Kashina having witnessed the events from the shadows of the throne room. Yes. The time for holding back is over. After Konoha falls, Iwa will join them, and soon everyone in the world will embrace us for the good my empire will bring, said Malgus seeing Kashina approach him and could see she was starting to see his vision of things. No doubt thanks to the dark side energies this Sith temple generated that revealed the cold hard truth about things when entering her mind as she slept. And then it will branch out to the stars above, said Kashina simply. Yes. I already know which worlds to take since I've taken them before with the Republic and the Jedi unable to know about it due to these worlds being deep within the reaches of the Outer Rim, said Malgus before walking back to his throne. It's interesting, said Kashina, as she walked up the steps, and stood to the side of the throne her son was sitting in. What is, said Malgus with a frown. Your godfather Jiraiya was once told of an ancient prophecy of a boy he would one day train, who would decide the fate of the shinobi world with the power to revolutionize it, or possibly, destroy it, said Kashina seeing Malgus look at her with interest now. Really, revolutionize or destroy the shinobi world? Interesting. However, you make it sound like I can only choose one. I think I'll choose, both, said Malgus, as he was going to let the shinobi way live but under his rule, and in a way that would only benefit his empire. Both? said Kashina while wondering if that was even possible. Yes, why choose one when I can have both? Shinobi will exist in this world after it's mine, but they will be altered, and become a new division within the Sith Empire. It will be incredible, said Malgus while relishing the dark side of the Force, as it showed him visions of the future where his forces took world after world and his shinobi being at the forefront of it all being the key piece required to succeed in such campaigns. Naruto, said Kashina at last after what seemed a long pause. Yes, said Malgus while ignoring the fact she used his old name. I just, I just wanted to apologize for abandoning you all those years ago. It was wrong of me, I failed you as a mother, something I'm sure no Sith would ever do in my place. All I can do now is beg for your forgiveness and that you can possibly give me a chance to prove I am worthy of being called your mother, said Kashina kneeling in front of him, as she had been battling with herself for some time over how to deal with the current relationship she had with her son, and came to the conclusion that despite all that he was, dot the man sitting on this throne was still her son. With a Sith gauntlet covered hand, Malgus gently placed it on his mother's red-haired head, using the force to detect any hint of lying hidden agenda, or anything to suggest she was being untruthful to him. Finding nothing of the sort, Malgus had his mother rise to her feet, and look the woman directly in the eyes. You have your second chance my mother. However, I warn you not to waste it, as there will be no second time, and the only thing that awaits you should I be betrayed, is your slow agonizing death at my hands. Said Malgus seeing his mother nod in understanding before she had his hand. I understand. Long live the Sith Emperor of the Sith Empire Darth Malgus, my son, said Kashina before ing him on his forehead and leaving the room to think more on what she had just done. My lord? said a Sith officer with the rank of captain. Yes. What is it? said Malgus, as he saw the man beaming with pride, and had a data pad in hand. We've proceeded with your orders my lord and have begun injecting the regeneration serum into the troops. Most of the wounds that have been harassing some of the older members have begun to fix themselves and are showing signs of fighting in their prime, said the captain, as he approached the Sith Lord, and handed the data pad to the Emperor with the man examining its contents. Excellent. Keep me updated. Document everything on the project down to the last minor detail, said Malgus before handing the data pad over to the Sith officer. Yes my lord, said the captain before saluting and leaving the throne room. We are almost ready, 
said Maldus to himself before walking into his bedroom and sat down on the side of the bed before stroking the face of his blue-skinned female lover while his lavender-eyed female lover held onto her. Things had changed so much since he took them together at once. The two women soon began to explore being lovers without him, which he didn't mind in the least, as he knew being an emperor meant handling duties that came first before the pleasures of the flesh with either one, and both women had their own desires that needed to be satisfied. The Sith Lord had walked in on them several times making love before joining them in the throes of passion and could sense the distrust Alina had for Hanada dissolved during their time together. Many men would consider themselves lucky to have two women like that. Both exotic in their own way, said Haku, as Malgus was once again thrown into a limbo-like place by the Force, and met the woman that inspired him to become something more. I am indeed blessed with having such lovers. Why are you here? said Malgus seeing Haku approach him with a smile on her face. To be wary of the man called Danzo. His body is corrupted with a means to take control of demons and Jinchuriki. He plans to use them on you in order to take control of Kayubi and your empire, said Haku seeing Malgus's eyes narrow dangerously at this. I see. Thank you Haku for telling me, said Malgus, as he saw Haku smile, and him on the lips. It is a shame I died in wave country. I would have been honored to be your lover like them, said Haku before she faded from his sight and the Sith Lord soon found himself back in the real world. Malgus, said Alina awakening from her slumber and looking up at him. Go back to sleep Alina. You need your rest for the upcoming battle, said Malgus, as he saw her nod, and drift into slumber once more. That fool thinks he can tame you. Me, that human fool will know just how primitive he is compared to my vessel. Come my vessel. Let's bring them hell, said Kayubi, as he was not about to be controlled by some weak human ever again, and roared for blood to be spilled by the Sith Lord Jinchuriki. Soon Kayubi, very soon, thought Malgus before ing both women on his bed and left the room knowing he needed to plan for this new development. And he had a pretty good idea on who to ask for help. Tsunade could feel it in the air early that morning, the feeling of something dark heading towards the village, its presence massive filled with rage, and hate for those that lived in the village. Tsunade knew what was coming, as did Jiraiya long after Anko went on her suicidal mission to kidnap Hayuga Hanada, and had ordered all those that she knew were good shinobi to leave Konoha. However, those she ordered to leave had refused, as they were willing to defend their home, and nothing was going to stop them from fighting for the village they believed in could still change. Tsunade knew there was no changing their minds on this, as she had explained to them what would most likely happen should they stay, and that they had a chance to leave before facing the Sith Emperor's wrath. It was times like this that Tsunade suspected Konoha's will of fire was connected to one's own pride and the greater the fire the greater the pride. He's coming this time, said Jiraiya having entered Tsunade's office seeing the woman staring out her window at the village below. Aside from the obvious given his past with the village, is there any solid proof to that statement? said Tsunade seeing Jiraiya nod. Oh yeah, he actually summoned Gamakichi and had him come see me to deliver the message, said Jiraiya seeing Tsunade's shock at this news. He can still summon toads, said Tsunade seeing the man shrug. His name on the summoning contract Gamabunta had with him was never taken off the summoning scroll. Even after becoming this Sith Emperor, I doubt the toad boss would have the heart do it and just let it slide after all these years in waiting for Naruto to one day summon him again, said Jiraiya with Tsunade nod. Leave it to the Gaki to surprise us in such a way with it, said Tsunade knowing this was the end of things for the village. The only question we can ask is how will the Sith Emperor come at us? Land, air, or both, said Jiraiya feeling a sense of dread over this. Both, said Tsunade having already discussed this with every member of the Nara clan. Yeah. I thought so too. Though how is he going to attack us? I highly doubt he'll just go through the front door, said Jiraiya seeing Tsunade frown slightly. Knowing the Gaki, he just might, said Tsunade before Shizun came running panting heavily. He's here. He's walking towards us from the north. Alone, said Shizun in a panicked voice. Just himself, said Tsunade seeing Shizun nod. Yes. The gates are being sealed. The people are being evacuated into shelters, all shinobi of every rank are being mobilized, and preparing to defend the village, said Shizun, as she saw Jiraiya leap out the window, and Tsunade sigh before looking at her. 
It's time Shizun, said Tsunade seeing the woman nod. I'm ready Tsunade-sama, said Shizun seeing the woman smile at her. I know. Follow me. We have a Sith Emperor to fight, said Tsunade before leaving her office and Shizun following. With Malgus. The Sith Lord walked towards the massive doors blocking him from entering Konoha, as the walls had Shinobi at the ready to defend their home, and what had once been his own home years ago. But then again, it was never really his home if he was truly honest with himself, and felt no guilt in wanting to do this. What home scorns you, hates you, and abuses you for something that wasn't even your fault? What place praises a traitor, but scorns the patriot? What home dishonors the patriot's father, but punishes the son? No, this place was not his home. It was his prison he had freed himself from and now intended to destroy. The time has come Konoha. For roughly five long years, I prepared for this one day, and grew stronger for this moment. While you, in your foolish arrogance, had rested in your cradle of power, remained stagnant in the belief no power could challenge you, and that no force in the world could oppose you, thought Malgus using the dark side of the force to bend the gate to his will and tore both doors open. Attack! Attack with everything you've got! said a Junin with a variety of shinobi of different ranks launching fire, water, lightning and earth jutsus at the Sith Lord. But now, finally after all the preparations have been made, I have returned here, and all your leaf shinobi that fight, shall fall. Thought Malgus, as he blocked each jutsu with the force, but instead of cancelling them, the Sith Lord swirled them around, and then launched them at their senders. Causing a great deal of carnage and destruction. Taking a few steps forward, Malgus was attacked by a shinobi with a katana, who was sent flying back by the Sith Lord using force push into a building with the sword he had now in hands of the one being attacked. Examining the blade for a second, Malgus kept walking forward, striking down various leaf shinobi that stood in his path, and finally discarded the sword in his hand after lodging it into a junin's chest. When he went to the center of the village, Tsunade was waiting for him, and so were the others Malgus once called friends so many years ago. All of them were prepared to fight him to the bitter end, some were nervous of course from what he sensed, but that was to be expected, and considering some of them had experienced when in his Sith temple it was only natural they feel that way. Naruto I said Tsunade before a street lamp to her right suddenly became bent at the bottom causing it to fall. Crash, wrong name, said Malgus simply. Darth Malgus, as the leader of the leaf, I must ask you to cease and desist your attack on Konoha at once. Failure to comply will mean the entire military force of the village will be brought down upon you, said Tsunade seeing her godson grin behind the hood of his Sith robes and remove it so they could see his face. He looks just like like Minato Sensei, thought Kakashi looking at the Sith Lord with the image of the Yondaimi practically right behind him. You know I can't do that granny. Though if you wish to surrender the village to me, all you along with everyone else would have to do is kneel, and pledge your undying loyalty to my Sith Empire, forever. Said Malgus sensing their displeasure at the idea of serving him. Never, said a Junin defiantly. Go to hell, said a Chunin beside the Junin with others joining them. I see. No one here wants to join the Sith Empire? said Malgus seeing several of his old shinobi comrades look a bit uncertain. That's correct, said Tsunade while seeing Malgus sigh. That's a real shame to hear granny. I know many of the shinobi in this village would do well within my Sith Empire. Mitarashi Anko is already enjoying herself in being one of my interrogation officers, said Malgus while seeing the shock on Tsunade's face. Anko defected. What did you do to her? said Kurinai angrily at Malgus. Me? Nothing. Well, maybe I had a hand in her defection after showing Enko footage of the meeting that took place after she got the assignment to kidnap Hanada. You know the meeting I'm talking about, don't you granny? said Malgus while Tsunade's face paled at those words. What are you talking about? said Kurinai seeing Malgus smile at her. You don't know, you mean the Hokage didn't tell you. That the councils along with the Hokage herself have a special kill order issued for one Mitarashi Anko in the event she returns to the leaf and is successful in completing her mission. Said Malgus while Kurinai looked at Tsunade with shock and disgust. But, dot why would an order be given if Anko-san completed her mission? Said Tenten looking from Tsunade to Malgus. Because they didn't trust Anko on account of her past. Just like they did with me when I was younger. So I gave Anko the opportunity to have what she couldn't hear. 
Naturally she accepted my offer, said Malgus before his eyes narrowed and shifted position only slightly. And in a quick flash of red cut down the tree limbs that sprouted from the ground that were intent on capturing him. Tenzo. Said Tsunade seeing the man shake his head in surprise since he thought the only one capable of using wood element jutsus was himself. You really didn't think I'd be captured so easily, did you Danzo? Said Malgus with his lightsaber active and turned more to see the leader of Root standing there with the help of his cane in his natural arm while the unnaturally large one had Sharingan eyes grafted all over it. With the power I wield, you will surrender yourself, and transfer total control of your Sith Empire to me demon, said Danzo, as he also revealed his implanted Sharingan eye that was hidden behind the bandages on his face much to Tsunade's horror. Really? And why would I do that? said Malgus seeing the Sharingan eye that Danzo had where his natural one should be spin. Because I am your master. A demon like you will always be the servant of your betters and I am the superior being here, said Danzo directing the Sharingan's hypnotic power at Malgus, who narrowed his eyes at him, and used the force to choke him while lifting the surprised man up into the air. Do not attempt to use that eye's power on me fool. I am not weak-minded. The others that serve you might be, but I am far more power and I will not be controlled by the likes of a primitive fool like yourself. Said Malgus seeing Danzo choking and would have snapped the man's neck when Root Shinobi charged forward with the intent of saving their leader. Throwing Danzo to the side so he hit the ground hard while skidding, Malgus cut through the Root Shinobi with his lightsaber, and the display of skill made the other leaf Shinobi watching the slaughter look at him with awe mixed with fear. When there were no more Root Shinobi, the Sith Lord turned, and found himself pinned by Donzo's use wood jutsu with the old man smirking at seeing his prize captured while kicking the lightsaber that fell from the Sith Lord's hands away. You will submit to me demon. Maybe not right now, but given enough time after being weakened, and you'll be my loyal lapdog licking my feet while I sit on what was once your throne. Said Danzo walking up to Malgus and grabbing the Sith Lord by the neck. You think I'll just nod my head and do your bidding? You think the Hokage is going to stand by and let you take control? Said Malgus, as he grinned more, and ignored the sudden increase in pressure from the larger arm filled with the Shodem's cells. As if that drunken washed up Sanin could oppose me and your own forces won't dare strike from the air to possibly harm you. You have nothing, I am your master and you will submit to me. Now, said Danzo while squeezing harder and Malgus just laughing at him. Never, said Malgus simply while seeing frustration grow on Donzo's face. If I can't have you as my pet and weapon then no one can. Die, said Danzo intent on snapping the Sith Lord's neck then and there. That act was cut short literally by another flash of red from Malgus's lightsaber cutting through Donzo's massive arm and severing it completely from his body. The leader of Root held in pain as he stumbled back seeing Malgus shatter the wood used to pin him down on all sides, and then return gracefully to his hand. Not today, said Malgus seeing Danzo fall to his knees while holding his shoulder with the burned flesh stinking up the area. Demon abomination, why won't you accept the truth? You were born to forever be a slave to the will of your betters and that will never change. Said Danzo while Malgus just walked up to the downed man. Such primitive views. Kayubi is laughing at you right now. Don't you know why your little Sharingan I didn't work on me? Aside from the fact I wouldn't allow it, said Malgus seeing Danzo spit blood on the ground at his feet. You did something to your body, something to repel the Sharingan I, said Danzo, as he felt the heat of Malgus's red blade get dangerously close to his face, and tried to lean back to protect himself. Correct, to ensure I didn't fail no matter what happened. I commissioned my mother to place a seal on my head that repels the Sharingan's influence on me, and the cells of the Shodime you had in that arm I severed, said Malgus, as he made that arm rise from the ground, and obliterated it with Sith lightning to make the appendage completely useless to anyone. Bastard, you want to win so badly. Fine, I'll let you have your victory, but it's going to be a hollow one, and you won't live long enough to enjoy it. Said Danzo as he ripped his shirt off to reveal seals on his chest that were similar yet different to the Shinigami seal on the Sith Lord's own body. It's a complex seal designed to explode with incredible force, said Jiraiya seeing the design of the seal on Danzo. How massive, said Tsunade seeing Danzo going through several hand signs and then activate the seals on his chest. A large chunk of the village were standing in, said Jiraiya seeing Danzo grinning like a madman at Malgus. 
I win in the end demon. You should have no better to then to bet against your human superiors, for you will always lose to us, and always made to be the fool. Reverse four symbol sealing technique. Said Danzo with the seal on his chest glowing. You are the fool. Die alone and with regret, said Malgus, as he saw the old man's seals activate and quickly threw him high into the air with the force before an explosion of incredible strength occurred that shook everything around it. When it was over, only Malgus was standing, and the leaf shinobi around him were now trying to stand up on shaking legs. This doesn't change a thing Malgus. We will fight you to the bitter end, said Tsunade seeing the Sith Lord smirk slightly. I know you will, and I'm looking forward to it said Malgus before hitting a few of the buttons on his right wrist and soon the sound of engines from star fighters and massive imperial ships covered the skies of the leaf village. He's got us in checkmate, thought Shikamaru knowing from the reports that the leaf received that those ships could attack at a safe distance from the air. One last chance granny, submit to the Sith Empire, or be destroyed, said Malgus sensing the woman's hesitation. I choose option a third option, said Tsunade seeing Malgus raise an eyebrow at her. A third option, said Malgus while becoming curious and amused at the same time. Yes, the third option being we fight and we win, said Tsunade slamming her fist down onto the ground and shake tea underneath Malgus's feet. The Sith Lord leapt back before he felt Shikamaru's shadow possession jutsu kick in, but Malgus broke free from it by smacking the Nara into a nearby wall using the force, and blocking out his own subtle pain. A massive fist from Choji soon followed but was quickly blocked by Malgus using his own hand, and the strength from the force before he stabbed the massive appendage at the wrist that caused the Akamichi to cry out in pain the injury caused. Ino tried to use her own clan's jutsus on him, was repelled by an invisible wall Malgus had created using the force in terms of mental shields, and was hit with a mental attack from the Sith Lord causing the young woman fall to her knees in pain while she clutched her head. Rock Lee and made a guy move like blurs when they tried to attack Malgus. They felt their skills in taijutsu, and their speed would weaken the Sith Lord enough for him to be stopped. However, Malgus surprised them by using the force to move beyond their speed disable them with a few quick blows designed to knock them out, and sent them both through several buildings for good measure. Tenton unleashed her weapons on him, but they were repelled by the force, and sent several of them at Neji. The Hyuga branch family member had to use Kaden to repel them, but the moment he stopped spinning, the young man was sent flying back into a wall, and a large piece of the building from that wall fell on top of him. Kiba tried to attack next, but a subtle manipulation of the force by Malgus had Akamaru striking out against the Inazuka, and the others of his clan. Shino was attacked by a blast of force lightning, as he tried to bring out his insects, and landed on the ground badly injured. Kurinai tried to use Genjutsu as Kakashi readied his Sharingani to use one of his own attacks, and disable Malgus permanently. However, they were surprised when Shizun suddenly struck Kakashi in the neck with some Sanban needles, and then a roundhouse kick to Genjutsu mistress's face. Shizun sensei, what are you doing? said Sakura confused, as she saw the glazed eyes of the medic Nin, and barely had enough time to dodge the needles the woman shot from her wrist launcher. She's being controlled by him, said Kurinai as she saw Malgus smirking at them, and knew it was the truth. They come to kill your Sith Emperor my dear Shizun. Defend me with your life, said Malgus, as he further increased his mental command over the woman, and saw Shizun fight with greater desire. I will defend my Emperor with my life, said Shizun in a dazed-like voice, as she began to attack Tsunade, and didn't see the pained look on the Sanin's face when fighting. Shizun snap out of it, said Tsunade as she tried to dispel this power over the woman, but it wasn't working, and realized this was not a genjutsu like she was used to breaking. This was something else entirely. She can't. You'll have to knock Shizun out to free her mind, said Malgus knowing either way he won since it was one less shinobi to deal with. Fine, said Tsunade, as she landed a solid blow to Shizun's stomach, and knocked the woman out with a blow to the neck. However, the second that was over, Tsunade was hit by the street lamp Malgus had used the force to make fall down, and knocked the wind right out of the female Hokage. When that happened, Jiraiya went into sage mode, and attacked Malgus with everything he had. But the Sith Emperor had the dark side of the force on his side, as he easily dodged each one of the strikes made by Jiraiya, 
and with few quick consecutive strikes had removed the two toads from his shoulders. And one of Jiraiya's arms in the process. The toad Sanin cried out in pain before he was blasted away with Sith lightning while Malgus threw his lightsaber at a nearby building to slice a piece of it off to land on some Chunin trying to outflank him. Before he could recall the weapon back, Tenten moved against him with her bow staff, which struck the metal of his Sith gauntlet of his right arm, and broke easily when the wooden weapon hit. Malgus grabbed her by the throat, lifted her up, and threw her behind him before recalling his lightsaber back to his hand once again. Had enough, said Malgus while seeing more shinobi appear ready to take him down and hopefully make the forces of the Sith Empire back off. We're not beat yet Malgus, said Tsunade while she tended to Jiraiya's injury. On the contrary Granny, I've already won, you're just being a sore loser said Malgus, as his Sith knights came out of the alleyways, and his Sith troops aiming their weapons from the top of the rooftops. You were distracting us, your scuffle with the shinobi when you entered, the fight with Danzo, his root shinobi, and then ourselves was just a means to divert our attention from your troops entering the village. Wasn't it, said Tsunade seeing Malgus smirk at her. Of course it was. I can't destroy this place right away. I have things to do here that can't be left alone, said Malgus as he deactivated his lightsaber, and began walking away. What are you doing? said Tsunade seeing the Sith Lord walk away. Simple, I'm leaving your lives in the hands of my men. Unlike me, they aren't going to hold back, and give you the opportunity to let you join. They're going to strike you down and kill without mercy, said Malgus turning his head back slightly to see his army ready to kill without a single hesitation. Wait, what if, what if we do surrender? Would you spare us? said Tsunade seeing the Sith Lord pause and look at her before he gazed at the others. Some of you would be spared. Not all, said Malgus seeing Tsunade look at Jiraiya and saw the Toad Sani nod in his head knowing it was okay. We, we surrender to you and your Sith Empire, said Tsunade knowing that there was no point in fighting the Sith Lord any longer. A wise decision Tsunade, restrain them all and proceed with orders given said Malgus seeing his troops nod and begin restraining the shinobi of the leaf while transport ships descended down to load them all in. While that happened, Malgus made his way to the sector of the village where all the clan homes were located, and stopped at the one place that should have been his home within the village from the start. The Namikaze clan estates, which belonged to his father, and thus he inherited by being the man's son. Making his way in after removing the blood seal lock, Malgus felt the force flood his mind with memories of the past, as events since the Leaf's founding came into view, and ghosts from the clan's past manifested themselves before his very eyes. A sense of jealousy washed over Malgus, as he was deprived of the happiness the people of his clan had for so long, and felt his fist clenching in rage while pieces of the hard wooden floor around him splintered in different places. Reaching out with the force, the Sith Lord felt every piece of knowledge of his forgotten clan scattered all around the Namikaze estate, and opened all doors in the house to make every piece of information written down throughout the years come to him. It was quite an astounding amount given it was everything his clan had in terms of jutsus, traditions, and anything else that he may find interesting while looking things over. Using his own clan's sealing scrolls, quickly took everything not nailed down in the house, and left the Namikaze estates. Konoha Hospital sometime later, we're almost ready to begin outside my lord, said a Sith trooper walking behind his emperor, who nodded his head, and kept walking to his intended destination. Good, soon the old generation will be cast down and the new one will create stability for my expanding empire. Are all the children of the various ages separated from their parents like I ordered? Said Malgus while getting closer to the room he wanted. Yes. Those you ordered us to spare of the old generation were also placed in a separate group away from those you wish to deal with when this is over, said the Sith trooper before Malgus stopped at room number 305. Good. Already I sense their fear. I can feel it through the force. Leave me. This is a personal affair I wish to resolve. Alone. Said Malgus seeing the Sith troopers with him salute and leave without questioning him since they knew better. Opening the door before turning to the right, Darth Malgus saw the very last Uchiha in existence on his hospital bed, bandaged nearly head to toe, in a hospital gown, and was currently drugged enough to not feel pain yet stay awake. Of course, Malgus only knew this was the Uchiha's room simply because the Force told him, as Sasuke's body was now completely unrecognizable, 
and you wouldn't think he was an Uchiha since the man did not have any hair. The Uchiha had lost it just like Malgus had after being set on fire all those years ago, as the fire mixed with the intense wave of power in using the force had ripped what wasn't burned of the Uchiha's flesh clear off, and only through Tsunade's skilled medical skills was the fool even breathing. Who's there? said Sasuke at last since he couldn't see who entered on account of his lost eyesight all those years ago. I would have thought they'd give you a new pair of eyes after you lost your old ones. I guess after they found out just how damaged you were they decided to be cheap for once in terms of your care, said Malgus while Sasuke used his ears to possibly identify him. It can't be. Naruto, said Sasuke at last while the man formerly known as Uzumaki Naruto of the Leaf smirked at the last Uchiha. It's been a while hasn't it, you big dumb bastard, said Malgus seeing Sasuke scowl and was rewarded with pain getting through to his nerves in his brain for it. You dare. Talk like that. To me? An Uchiha. An elite. Said Sasuke hearing Malgus walk towards him while laughing at the Uchiha in the process. My how the so-called mighty have fallen. You should have known better than to set me on fire all those years ago Sasuke. Now look at you. Burned. Mutilated. Deformed with no way to pass on your genetic line. All thanks to me of course. Said Malgus, as he let out a cruel laugh and saw Sasuke's heart monitor indicate the crippled man's heart was beating harder now than usual. I. Will. Kill you. Naruto. Said Sasuke while Malgus stopped laughing and used the force to throw the medical equipment out the window in a quick display of his power. You will do nothing. Do you know why? Because you are nothing. Just a crippled body with a soul trapped in it. You can't see. You can't move on your own. Hell. You can't even get laid at least once with a woman and have her give you a child to continue your clan. Oh, speaking of your clan, has anyone told you the new yet? Said Malgus seeing Sasuke gritting his teeth in pain at having his morphine taken away. What news? Said Sasuke with his curiosity overriding his anger. Uchiha Itachi is dead, by my hands, said Malgus while seeing Sasuke tensing his body with what strength he had left which was a stupid move since every single nerve in the man's body was no doubt lit up like a Christmas tree. You lie. Itachi would never lose to weakling like you, said Sasuke, as he ignored the pain of his body, and wished he could see Naruto now. Oh I've made a few. Changes since the last time we fought. Not all of them pleasant, but that's nothing new, and recently my physical form has been, shall we say improved to the point where I could easily destroy a small army of Itachis. Yes I'd say that is indeed the case. While you are wasting away like the trash you are, it would be more merciful to put you out of your misery right now, said Malgus, as he ignited his lightsaber, and saw the Uchiha become frightened at the sound of the snap hiss noise it made. What was that? Get away from me, said Sasuke, as he tried to move, but the Sith Lord held him in place, and only aggravated his wounds. Shut up you arrogant fool. At least have the dignity to die bravely at my hands instead of whimpering like frightened child. Said Malgus with his voice now sounding cold and cruel in a way that the Uchiha had ever heard before in his life. Someone will stop you. There will always be people out there willing to fight against a monster like you Naruto. Said Sasuke while hearing the humming of the lightsaber while Malgus positioned himself to stab his blade through the Uchiha. I'm sure there will be people trying to fight me. Not necessarily from this planet but still the thought of fighting new enemies for the glory of my Sith Empire makes me hunger for blood, and I will get it. Of that I have no doubt. Oh, one more thing Sasuke. My name isn't Uzumaki Naruto anymore. I've left that name behind me after we parted company. It's Darth Malgus now, said Malgus before he stabbed the Uchiha through the heart and enjoyed hearing the scream Sasuke let out. Music to his ears, exiting the hospital. Malgus made his way to the village square where the people of the leaf he had ordered be kept in Konoha were all acting nervous, and they had every right to be nervous. The man they once scorned when he was just a child had returned, had come back to turn this place into a land zone for future ships to land, and wipe out the entire place from existence. All the knowledge the leaf had in being a shinobi village was removed, for his orders of course, and now all that remained was the primitive trash that made up a large majority of this place. Please, show mercy, we can be your advisors with the knowledge we know about the shinobi world. Places yet to be discovered. How to best defeat Iwa or any other shinobi force that opposes you, said Homura, 
as he saw Malvis turn to look at him, and scoff at the offer. You have nothing I want old fool. Your knowledge is outdated. Stagnant. Filled with decay from an age long since past. I have no use for you in my empire. Nor would I give you one if there was, as I have no sense of compassion to show the likes of fools, who would hate a child for the sins of another, and praise a traitor over of the village in the process. You robbed me of a childhood. You robed me of everything the village needed to stay strong all for the sake of your own so-called power. Said Malgus before walking away from the sputtering old man. You are a demon abomination. We did what was necessary at the time. Said Kaharu before she was struck by an intense blast of Sith lightning by Malgus and the Sith Lord didn't stop until the body was turned to ash. Kaharu. Said Homura in utter shock, as he just witnessed his old teammate and fellow advisor to the Hokage had just been obliterated into nothing. Don't fret old fool, you'll be joining her soon enough. As will the rest of the people in this village, said Malgus before he heard protests and his Sith forces had their weapons ready to put them down in an instant. Bastard, your father would be rolling over in his grave for this, said Homura with Malgus staring back at him fully. Considering I have never known my father in any way thanks to your attempts to control my life, I don't really care, and even if I did, I'd still hate him like I do now for saving all these ingrates. Said Malgus before he made a hand signal and his Sith troopers along with the war droids prepared to fire at the people. Wait, show mercy. Prove you are better than us by showing mercy and letting us live, said Homura while already calculating how much time it would take to reach Iowa and help coordinate an attack against Malgus. Mercy, like everyone here showed me as a child. All pass. Oh, one more thing, your plan to reach Iowa in the event I did spare you, it won't save them from me, said Malgus before making one more hand signal while looking directly at the shocked old man's face. Just before his Sith troopers and war droids opened fire on the people without mercy until Malgus gave the order to hold fire. Making another hand motion, Sith knights now moved among the massive pile of bodies lying on the ground looking for anyone that was injured, or pretending to be in order to avoid being killed before stabbing them with their lightsabers. While this happened, Malgus himself got on a shuttle that would take him up to his Sith flagship the Endless Shadow where he could make preparations from there in attacking Iowa, and put the issue of ruling this world behind him. Already, the fleet was in place to blast a portion of Iowa to pieces, and then make those that survived to surrender become his loyal subordinates. My lord, we are ready to proceed, said the captain after saluting his emperor. Good, let's get this over with captain. I want this planet to become mine now, said Malgus blaring at the Sith officer, who nodded quickly, and then began relaying the order through all necessary channels. Epilogue. Darth Malgus sat on his throne in his Sith temple, as he smiled at the sight of his empire becoming the global utopia he knew it would become under his rule, and smiled at all he had accomplished after so many years. With his home world now under the rule of the Sith, Malgus had spent the next few years expanding the minds of the people like he did in Wave Country, and sure enough the people loved him for it. The people were smarter, stronger, healthier, and capable of doing so many different things now with each person on the planet having become a loyal servant of the Sith Empire. But it wasn't enough. It could never be enough. After he had solidified his Sith Empire's position on this planet, Malgus expanded the Sith Empire from this one world to another, then another, until finally over a dozen planets were under his rule, and carried the banner of the Sith proudly for all to see. Even now, a new campaign on another world would soon be underway, and with the help of some old contacts the old Sith Empire refused to use he was able to get some key intel about the planetary resistance his forces would face there. So what visions of the future do you have my love? said Alina as she walked up the steps to the throne, and sat on the Sith Emperor's lap. No visions. Then again I'm not trying very hard. How are you Alina? said Malgus, as he put a gentle hand on her stomach, and felt the life growing inside. Their third child. Good. Though I wish this was child number four. Hanada is only ahead of me because she gave birth to twins. Twice, said Alina grumbling about not giving birth to twins the first time like she did. Don't try to compete with her over something like this Alina. I love you both equally regardless of the number of children you each give me, said Malgus knowing those two women were just unbelievable when it came to competing for his affection. I'll try, no promises, said Alina, as she ed him, 
and he returned it with a passion like always. They finally had everything they could ever want in life and couldn't be happier. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.